Meet Sue, an ordinary college student. Since he activated the mysterious system, he has gained the unique ability to acquire a new identity every week. He could become anyone, for example, the chairman of a large company, or dress up as the best killer in the world. Be a brilliant visionary, please, and if you need to cook something delicious, then he could easily become the god of cooking. He could even take on the identity of an alien rebel tasked with uniting civilizations. Of course, having to change his identity every week irritated him a little. But on the other hand, who wouldn't want to have such an exciting life, cross four oceans, go through the whole world, take control of the entire universe, or even get the title of king? It was a life that not everyone could cope with, but the main character was ready for it. But for now, it was necessary to return to real life. It was an ordinary day in college, but there was a quarrel in one of the classes. A classmate laughed at Kevin because to him, he was just a rogue from 18th Street. The school bully, Eric, sneered at him, saying that he was given more money for daily expenses than he spends in a year. He threw a wad of money at him and told him to stay away from Lucy, his girlfriend, and his friends supported him. She didn't understand how dare Sue fight for the most beautiful girl in the class, because Eric's uncle is the vice rector. The whole class hated the guy and called him a beggar. Suddenly, Mr. Lee, an employee from an international company, entered the class. Everyone recognized him because just yesterday the teacher told them about an incident that happened in their company. They didn't understand why one of the leaders of the main Ching company came to their school. At this moment, Mr. Lee and his men bowed to the boy who was being mocked by the entire class. Everyone was shocked and didn't understand what was happening, and the teacher told them that they must have made a mistake because Sue is an ordinary poor student from a small town. But Mr. Lee told him to shut up because Sue is the only heir to the corporation. Eric was horrified. He did not understand how this beggar could be the heir to an international company. At this moment, Sue hit him, saying that the goose is not a friend to the pig. He then walked up to Lucy, the most beautiful girl in the school. The guy hugged her and unexpectedly kissed her. Lucy didn't know what to say, but at this time, Sue told Mr. Lee that it was time for them to leave, and they left the office. The girl was embarrassed but at the same time happy, and Eric cried and could not come to terms with his defeat. No one knew how Sue went from a poor man to a rich heir, and all because 20 minutes ago he was a poor student. However, this morning he saw the news that the president of Ching Corporation had died in a car accident. After reading the news, Sue was upset, but caught himself thinking, why does he even care about this? Suddenly the class president, the same Lucy, threw a newspaper at him. His friend George told him that many people in class were on their phones now, but for some reason she only noticed him. Sue said that she has been interested in him since first grade, but he doesn't react to it because he doesn't care. But George replied that many people envy him, but he doesn't appreciate it. In fact, Sue couldn't start dating her because he didn't have money. At that moment, a powerful system was activated in the guy's head. It told him that he could change his personality every week. When he activates and completes a new task, he will gain a random skill for a long time. This is how he received the identity of the chairman of the Ching International Company. At first glance, he remains an ordinary student, but at the same time he is hiding a serious position, the sole heir of the Ching Company due to the death of its president, and today Su officially replaces him in this role. He acquired such personality traits as business acumen, leadership character, and calm temperament, he was tasked with finding out the true cause of the death of the company president and confronting his deputy. Suddenly, the teacher ended the lesson. Sue woke up abruptly, deciding that it was just a dream. At that moment, Lucy approached him and angrily asked why he was ignoring her. He tried to walk away from this conversation, but at that moment, Eric came up to him and said that he had already warned him before not to approach Lucy. After this, the quarrel mentioned earlier occurred, and Sue became convinced that he had indeed received a new identity. Moreover, other people's memories of him also changed. At this time, the assistant to the vice chairman of the company told him that Mr. Lee had already returned from Sue's school and added that their people were a little late. He replied that nothing could be done because Sue is just a little child who doesn't know how to do anything. Lee informed his new director that Chan was the deputy president, and after the accident, he was the first choice for the position of president of the company. But since Mr. Samuel left all the shares to Sue in his will, Chan is not eligible to serve as president. 
Sue understood why the deputy began to hate him, and then the system gave him a month to find the true cause of Samuel's death, the same guy began to suspect Chan of this. Lee told him that Chan was known for his ruthlessness and had many enemies, including high-ranking ones, but they all mysteriously disappeared, and then the man asked Sue to be careful because the boy was just a student. Sue wanted to meet Chan in person, so he told all the members of the board of trustees to go to the main entrance while they went to buy milk tea. The trustees were waiting outside and were very angry with him, but one man asked them to calm down, because this was the order of the new president of the company. But he replied that the new president had neither the ability nor the qualifications. How could he even become president? Because only Chan could take this position. Some employees agreed with him. They also wanted Chan to become president of the company. However, the old employees were against this, because President Samuel died quite recently, and the choice of the heir is his will. It must be respected. Chan overheard the conversation. He was thinking about removing them after becoming president of the company. After a while, Sue finally appeared. He was dressed in an expensive tuxedo, and in his hands was a glass of drink. Chan greeted him with feigned joy and introduced himself as his deputy. But Sue told him that he already knew all the necessary information about him. One of the employees saw a glass of milk tea in his hand and said that he should go back to college and continue playing computer games, because business is war and he does not belong here. Sue laughed and asked what kind of dog was behind Chan's back, but the man stood up for the employee. He was furious, but before he could say a word, Sue came up and slapped him. The guy said that if this dog does not belong to the deputy, but still dares to bark, it needs to be punished. Sue then made an appointment in the conference room in five minutes, and Chan was very angry because this kid was not acting the way he imagined, so he decided to behave just as rudely. At the entrance, the newly appointed director was met by Secretary Sue. Lee said that she was absolutely reliable, and if he needed anything, he could just tell her. Then the guy asked to prepare three cups of tea for him in the conference room, and the girl did not understand why he needed three cups at once. Five minutes later, all council members were in the conference room. Sue introduced himself and wanted to say that from today he is the president of this company. But at that moment, one of the managers interrupted him. He wanted to raise the topic of inheritance. Sue suddenly splashed a cup of hot tea on him and told him to shut up. The guy didn't understand. Didn't his parents teach him not to interrupt other people? Sue then continued and said that from today on he is the president. He asked the men who were against it. He was ready to listen to everyone and meet them, but everyone was scared and simply remained silent. Mr. Lee was glad that the former president chose Sue as his successor because he, although young, was very charismatic. At that moment, Chan told Sue that he was still very young, but already showing great promise. With such a leader, the company will certainly achieve success in many matters. However, the company employed tens of thousands of people, and it would be useless to convince managers alone of anything. But if he could achieve something incredible, such as closing a major deal with the Thai Corporation, no one in the company would dare to doubt his abilities. At this moment, Lee came to Sue's defense. Because Thai are their worst enemies, the man did not understand how Chan dared to send Sue to sign documents with them. Then the man threw a glass of water at Lee. How dare he talk to him like that? At this moment, Sue caught the glass of water. The guy proudly announced that he would take on this project. Chang said that Sue was very brave and asked him not to delay this project. He also asked if one month would be enough for him, to which the young man replied that a week would be enough for him and announced the end of the meeting. He told Sue to follow him, but Lee tried to stop him because one week was not enough for such a purpose. After Sue left, Chan thanked Lee for bringing him here because now he could see this idiot in person. The man and his aides mocked the new president. Lee's assistants did not understand how Samuel could choose this idiot and wanted to leave the company before it was too late. After some time, when everyone had left, Sue asked Lee to tell him how President Samuel died. He said he had been in an accident and the police had already determined that it was an accident. But Sue couldn't believe it, because if it was just an accident, the system wouldn't force him to investigate it. Lee said that this morning, on his way to the company, President Samuel collided with a truck at an intersection and was killed. The truck driver was removing garbage from the construction site every day at this time, so the accident was not intentional. Sue asked where the driver was now, and Lee replied that the driver had been detained and was currently in the police station.
The guy instructed Lee to immediately go to the police station and follow this driver. The man was shocked. He couldn't understand. Did the president really suspect something was wrong? However, he decided not to ask unnecessary questions and immediately went to carry out the assignment. In less than a few minutes, Sue brought all the information about the president of the company, Ty. His name was Anthony, and Sue immediately began to study all the information, and the man's name seemed very familiar to him. Suddenly he saw in the dossier a photo of his classmate Lucy. She was the daughter of the president of the Thai company. Meanwhile, evening came. Lucy was sitting in her room and drying her hair. Her friends were discussing Sue because he had turned from a loser to a successful person. Suddenly Lucy noticed that Sue wrote her an SMS saying that he wanted to see her. The girl was very happy about it. She quickly got dressed and told her friends that she would come soon. The girl went out into the street looking around, looking for the guy with her eyes. And then someone suddenly hugged her from behind, calling her a beauty. Lucy was very frightened, and out of surprise threw the man face first into the ground. When she realized it was Sue, she awkwardly checked to see if he was okay before asking why he attacked her from behind. Sue then asked her why she hits him if he sneaks up on her from behind, but does nothing when he comes up from the front to kiss her. Lucy timidly asked why he had been avoiding her for many years, but today he was acting completely differently. Sue replied that before he was poor and could not provide her with a happy life, but now he is no longer that poor guy. Now he is ready to give everything for her love. Lucy did not expect this and even cried with happiness, because all this time she thought that Sue did not love her. He wiped the girl's tears and asked if it was true that her father was the president of the Thai Corporation. Lucy replied that she had already told him that five years ago her father opened his own business and founded Thai, and then Sue said that now he wants to gain a strong foothold in his corporation, and for this, he needs her father's help. Suddenly, the guy got a call. The guy was informed that the driver of the truck with whom the accident occurred committed suicide. Sue was shocked, but he didn't expect it at all and said that he would come soon. He ran and told Lucy that he would call her tomorrow morning. She was upset because she never got to talk to him about her feelings. Sue was in a hurry and began to cross the road without looking both ways. He did not notice how a car was flying towards him at high speed. In an instant, it was literally a meter away from him. But at the last moment, another car crashed into her, cutting her off. The driver hit the tires, changing the trajectory of the car that had just wanted to hit Sue. The car soon fled the scene. As it turned out, Lee saved the guy, he got out of the car and asked if everything was okay. After some time, the scarred man, Yen, informed Chan that the driver could not have hit Sue because Lee suddenly appeared and saved him. Chan said that it was not that important, because he only wanted to scare him. He's not stupid enough to kill two company presidents at the same time. Meanwhile, Lee and Sue arrived at the office. The guy quickly realized that it was a warning. Someone wanted him to give up. Lee was furious because if he had not arrived on time, something terrible would have happened. And then Sue asked him to tell him what happened to the truck driver. Lee said that the driver was indeed under control for a long time, but suddenly died at the detention center. And when he arrived there, the driver was already dead. The driver also left a note saying he didn't have the money to pay for the damage and paid for it with his life. Sue asked where the driver's family lived, and Lee said that the driver got divorced several years ago and had been living alone since then. Sue asked him to check this because if someone hired a hitman, then the trump card that made the driver agree to give his life could only be his relative. Lee stood up from his seat and said that he would find out everything immediately. Meanwhile, a new day had arrived. The sun was shining brightly over the houses. Mia, Anthony's wife, scolded her husband for the fact that he only eats and does nothing else. He is not at all interested in his daughter. The man asked what happened to her, to which Mia replied that Lucy runs around with some boy every day, and yesterday Shane, her boyfriend, waited for her all evening, but she never returned. At that moment, two young men came down from the second floor. One of them, Louis, asked his mother why she had been screaming since the morning. The second guy, the same Shane, asked if Lucy was back yet. Mia replied that the girl would be back soon and told them to sit down and have breakfast. Then Shane said that if Lucy really didn't like him, then it would be better for him to leave. But Louis told him that he, as a boss, simply could not lose to some poor student, because he was just an asset, not worthy of attention. At this moment, Lucy returned home with her boyfriend Sue. 
All family members were shocked and did not understand what was happening. Sue introduced himself and said that he was now the girl's boyfriend. He came to them for the first time and did not bring any gift except fruit. Lucy's brother was very unhappy with this. He threw fruit at him and told him to get out of their house. Then Sue turned to Lucy's father, calling him uncle. He said that they had a wonderful family, but his son was behaving terribly. The man immediately ordered the guy to shut up. He said that he admired his business abilities and asked why he did such a crazy thing today, because Sue was not good for his daughter, and he should have gotten out of here. Sue was about to answer him, but he was interrupted. It was Shane. He asked to let him say a few words. He introduced himself and said that he was the young leader of the Sunshine Company, and that in the future he would become its president. This moment seemed very familiar to Sue. He assumed that Shane would now pull out his bank card, and so it happened. The guy threw a card at his feet, saying that there was one million in the account. He could take the money and leave. Sue didn't want to sink to his level, so he just stood there and looked at the guy blankly. Lucy didn't understand why Shane was so eager to reveal his identity today, because he usually doesn't care about money and doesn't introduce himself as the head of Sunshine. The guy replied that he just wanted to point out to some people their lowly position, so that they would not dream of something beautiful, being unworthy of it. Sue suddenly raised his bank card. Then Shane thought that he had decided to take his money. But at this moment, Sue put the bank card in the young man's jacket and said that he shouldn't throw away the money his father had earned through hard work. Lucy's father and mother were surprised by Sue's behavior. Shane immediately flew into a rage. He shouted that it was none of his business. After all, he was the young executive of a company with a market value of $30 billion. He felt that it was up to Lucy's parents to decide who was worthy of their daughter. Sue then calmly replied that he was the president of the Ching Company. Everyone in the family and Shane were shocked. They didn't expect this guy to be anything. Sue was a little embarrassed. Doesn't he look like a rich man? But Shane didn't believe him. He started insulting him and calling him a liar. At this time, the news was shown on TV. It said that yesterday, after the sudden death of the company's former president, a 19-year-old boy named Sue inherited the position of president. His company's market value was reported to be $130 billion. Lucy's father felt awkward because he also did not believe that Sue could be president. Sue turned to Shane and said that he would be glad if they cooperated in the future. He felt very awkward, and then he said that he had urgent business and needed to go. The door slammed behind him so quickly that no one even had time to say goodbye to him. Louis immediately hugged Sue, saying that he immediately saw him as an outstanding person. Mia invited the guy to sit at the table and promised to bring him food. When Sue sat down, he told Anthony that he was here on business, as his company hoped to cooperate with the man's corporation. Anthony only replied that he would never in his life have any common business with the Ching Company. Moreover, a representative of this company had no business doing business in his home. Lucy asked her father why he was so rude to him, but he replied that this cooperation was out of the question. Sue said that he had already sent people to find out the reasons for the conflict between the Ching and Tai. Mia asked her husband why he couldn't do something good for his business, and then asked Sue to find out about the conflict. Sue replied that according to his results, something happened when Anthony and Mr. Samuel were young. But the man didn't let him finish. He grabbed him by the hand and asked him to shut up. He quickly got up from his seat and pulled Sue along with him, saying that he was ready to sign all the documents with him. And then with a dissatisfied face, he added that he should not dare to talk about this conflict to his wife. Soon Chan learned that Anthony had signed a contract with the boy. He couldn't believe it. Ian told him that Anthony had an announcement to make to the board of directors in two days and asked Chan what he thought about it. Chan said that this was illogical because Tai had been at enmity with their company for a long time. How could he agree to some boy's demands? The assistant told him that perhaps it was all because Sue started dating Lucy. Chan was furious and asked why no one told him such important information, to which his assistant replied that he had just found out about it himself. He asked the boss if he wanted to see the matter through to completion. Chan replied that there was no need for that, because Sue was just a child. He wouldn't panic because of him, and besides, he had already figured out how to deal with him. At this time, the system informed Sue that there were four days left before the deadline, he needed to complete the task as soon as possible and the guy was surprised, 
because it turned out that finding out the truth about Samuel's death was much more important than signing the contract. At that moment, Lee ran up to him and said that he had learned something incredible. The truck driver has a daughter. Three years ago, she went abroad to study, and since then he has started working as a driver at a construction site. Sue realized that that poor man had gotten himself into something, because where did an ordinary truck driver suddenly get money to send his daughter abroad? And then the guy realized that the killer was very smart because he most likely planned everything for three years forward. Lee agreed with him because they still cannot find the source of this money. And since the enemy is very cunning and ruthless, the man hired Sue bodyguards who will constantly follow him. He said that now he had nothing to worry about since all the bodyguards were elite and former military from the special forces. Sue was pleasantly shocked and thanked him for such a favor. He asked all the bodyguards to leave as Sue still had one question for Lee. The guy took out a photograph in which all the leaders of the company stood. He asked who this tall man was and why he was not at the last meeting. Lee said that this man's name is Yen. He is not a member of the board of directors, but a person very close to Chan. They say that Chan entrusts most of the dirty work to him. Lee asked him if he wanted to start the investigation with him but Sue replied that he was simply inquiring about the man's identity. At this time, Sue was walking down the corridor. Suddenly she saw Ian. He was standing near the wall. He asked her why she didn't say hello when she met him. The girl asked him to stop following her around the whole company, to which he replied that he had urgent business with her. He wanted to contact her outside the company, but she did not answer his call, and then Sue objected, because it was not her job to help him. Suddenly the man grabbed her and said that she shouldn't talk to him like that, because if it weren't for him, she wouldn't be able to become the secretary of the company's president, and if he wanted to, he would make sure that tomorrow she would be kicked out of here. Ian told her to listen carefully because if she didn't want him to die, she had to help him. After a while, Sue left the office. He said goodbye to the guards, saying that they were free for today. He was going home and didn't need any extra company. However, the men energetically exclaimed that they were going to accompany the president to his home. At this moment, Sue was just passing by Sue. The secretary stopped him. She asked him to give her a ride home. The girl explained that her car had broken down, and if the president suddenly couldn't give her a ride, she would call a taxi. But Sue said that she didn't need to call anyone. He was ready to help the girl and take her home himself. Soon the guy, along with the security and the secretary herself, drove up to her home. Then Sue wanted to go to her house. Sue didn't understand at first why he decided to pay her a visit. But Sue only wanted the girl to offer him a glass of water as a sign of gratitude. The guards also wanted to go into her house, but the main bodyguard, Grant, stopped them, saying that apparently Sue and the girl would drink water all night and there was no point in distracting them. When they entered her house, Sue felt uneasy. The inside was a mess, but the guy told her that when he lived in the hostel, Everything looked much worse. He saw her bra on the back of the sofa and said that she must be spending all her energy on work. The girl grabbed the bra from his hands and asked him not to touch her things. Soon she went to the kitchen, picked up the medicine and remembered what Ian told her. He asked her to find a way to be alone with Sue and give him some medicine, after which the guy would pass out and she would have to take a photo of him without clothes. She added the medicine to the water and walked over to Sue, at this time, the young man was looking at the photographs hanging on her wall. He asked her where her mother was now. The girl only replied that her mother was now in her homeland. Sue picked up the glass and suddenly asked Sue how she was related to Ian. At that moment, she was very scared because she and he had the same last name. However, she told Sue that she was not related to him in any way, that they were just namesakes. The guy didn't have any extra questions. Apparently, he believed the girl. Without much hesitation, he drank the water. After that, without thinking twice, he got ready to leave. However, the medicine had not yet worked and Sue had to stop it. She said that she had a question on which she would like to consult him. Sue stopped and said that apparently she did not intend to let him go today. The guy sat down on the sofa and asked what was the matter. At this time, the bodyguards were standing outside waiting for their boss. Sue sent them an SMS asking them to turn off the internet in the house. Grant immediately ordered his three partners to pull out all incoming internet cables and eliminate the signal from all towers. The men reacted instantly, immediately setting off to follow the instructions. 
Sue asked the secretary what she wanted to ask her, but the girl remained silent. The young man immediately realized that she had given him a drug, but he wondered if she knew it was an aphrodisiac. Sue asked if the guy was feeling sleepy, and then Sue became convinced that she herself didn't know what kind of pill it was. He suggested that someone had tricked her and given her an aphrodisiac, and she thought it was a sleeping pill, and if she herself did not know what kind of pill it was, then they were being followed by those who knew the truth. Sue wondered why Sue wasn't falling asleep because his face had changed so much, she thought she might have added too much sleeping pills. At that moment, a hidden camera turned on in one of the outlets in the house. Ian and his assistants watched with interest. They wanted to know what their new president was capable of. Sue approached the young man and felt that he had a fever. She urgently needed to take him to the hospital. But when Sue saw the girl up close, he almost lost control of himself. He took his phone and realized that there was no connection or internet in the house. Everyone who watched this was very angry because the fun was about to begin. Then Sue knocked the girl onto her back. He shouted at her because she was very stupid for not understanding how exactly they were going to use her. After that, the guy quickly got up, went into another room and told her to bring him ice. Sue asked him how exactly they wanted to use her. After a while, the bodyguard returned home and asked where Sue was now, and the girl replied that he was taking a shower. Grant grinned. Apparently, Sue was the type of person who does everything very quickly. At that moment, the guy came out of the shower, covering himself with a towel. The bodyguard told him that he was still young and did not know all the intricacies and nuances of how to do all this correctly, but Sue told him to shut up and get to work. The young man said that there was a hidden camera in the room, and then Grant approached Sue and asked threateningly if she was really going to secretly record everything on video, but she replied that she knew nothing about it. Sue told Grant to find a video camera. He then asked Sue if she knew what the drug was, to which the girl replied that she had been given sleeping pills. He asked her if she really thought that if she took a photo of him without clothes, it would be enough, and then he said that in fact she was given an aphrodisiac in order to eventually plant the girl under her boss. Sue was shocked. She couldn't believe it. At that moment, the bodyguard discovered a hidden camera in the socket. Sue was stunned. She did not understand why they wanted to set her up so vilely. Sue told her that her own father was willing to sacrifice his daughter's honor for his own selfish purposes, and the girl was surprised. How could the boss know this? He replied that he simply expressed his assumption out loud, and apparently it was confirmed. Sue told him that Ian is actually her father. Fifteen years ago, he left her with her sick mother and went to another woman, and three years ago, she came here to work, but she had no one. Because of this, she was in despair, but suddenly she met him. By that time, Ian already held one of the lower management positions in the company. He helped her find a job, and thus she was able to avoid starvation. And even though the girl hated her father, she still couldn't refuse him so easily. Grant told his boss that he had discovered three more hidden cameras in the bedroom and one in the bathroom. Apparently, someone was going to drag the president's good name through the mud. Sue wondered if Sue now doubted her father after seeing all this. She burst into tears and said that she did not believe it because perhaps he too had been misled. The bodyguard called her stupid, but Sue stopped him. He said that he was going to eliminate Chan, but to do this, he first needed to find a way to get to Ian. And for this, he needed Sue's help. But if she didn't want it, then he wouldn't have her force. After a while, Sue and his bodyguards left. Sue cried from hopelessness. She did not understand what to do in such a situation. Meanwhile, it was late evening. The girl, looking at the video cameras that were hidden in her house, began to remember what happened to her before. She was fired from various jobs, constantly called unnecessary and shamed for even applying for her position. But the only one who came to her aid was Ian. Therefore, she decided to give him another chance. She was about to enter her father's office when she heard him talking to his friends. The men told him that they had met many ruthless people, but Ian was on a completely different level because he turned his own daughter into a pawn and led her along for three whole years. Sue realized that her father specifically asked the company bosses not to hire her, and when the girl was completely desperate, he gave her a helping hand. Sue overheard the entire conversation. These words drove her into hysterics. Ian's friends asked him if he could show them the hidden camera footage, to which he replied that he would send people to get memory cards and then send them the video. At this time, Sue was already driving home, 
Grant asked him why he didn't get rid of Sue, because she betrayed him in the most brazen way. He replied that the hardest thing for people is to leave their family, and he is just her boss, so why should she betray her father for the sake of the boss? But he was even more surprised by the fact that even his secretary turned out to be Chan's man. The bodyguard said that he needn't worry about them because he and his boys were firmly loyal to him. Sue replied that he was happy with the way they were doing their job. He trusted them 100%, Grant thought, because Sue at such a young age runs a multi-billion dollar company and at the same time unconditionally trusts his subordinates. At the same time, he is surrounded by strong enemies, but he does not show a drop of fear, constantly maintaining a working attitude. He noticed that the boss's eyebrows were slightly tense and thought that Sue was dealing with serious business problems but Sue just watched some girl dancing on the screen of his phone. He thought that nowadays anyone can start streaming and attract short-sighted viewers. And time passed, and soon the guy found himself at his house. He asked his bodyguard to pick him up tomorrow morning. He only had two days to complete the task, but he found it strange that he didn't panic at all about it. He had to face serious problems, but he solved them with a calm head. Perhaps the whole point is that the system endowed him with such a character. He was about to enter his house, but at that moment... Sue ran up to him and said that she wanted to have a serious talk with him. Sue told her to go into the house. The girl obediently went inside and sat down in the living room. She told him that Ian had been using her all these years, and she was just his pawn. He was ready to destroy her, and now she wants to pay him back. Sue said that she was ready to do whatever Sue said if it would help him get revenge, even if she had to sacrifice herself. But the guy was not going to demand self-sacrifice from her, he would help her achieve what she wanted, and she could take revenge on her father. Sue was moved to tears by his words and selfless desire to help her. The next morning, Yen left the house and called someone. He told the people on the phone to wait for Sue to leave and then entered his house and took all the cameras. But at that moment, Sue came up to him and extended her hand. There were those same cameras in it. And then she asked if this was what he was looking for. Ian was completely confused. How did this girl end up with his instruments? She asked him what this meant, because not only did he deceive her with drugs, but he also installed hidden cameras in her home. Her father apologized to her and said that it was all because of Director Chan. He wanted everything to go perfectly, but he gave him the wrong pill and installed hidden cameras secretly from him, and when Ian found out about it, it was already too late. The man asked her if Sue really discovered the cameras, but she said that they should talk inside since she was tired. They went to his house, and Ian asked Sue what happened to Sue and if their plan worked. Suddenly, Ian's wife met them. She asked her husband who the girl was next to him. The man only replied that it was his work colleague. Sue told him it would be better if they talked in his office because she didn't want to see the woman. They went inside, and then the girl remembered Sue's words. He said that for the turning point in this whole situation to happen, she needs to get to Ian's computer. Sue gave her father the video camera, and he asked where the memory cards were. But the girl did not want to give them away just like that and demanded eight million from him in return. Otherwise, he would not receive anything. Ian found himself at a complete dead end. The girl had everything he needed, and without it, he would not be able to destroy Sue. But he didn't want to pay eight million and said he had to consult with his boss. The man went outside and called Chan. At this time, Sue inserted a flash drive into his computer and launched a virus script. Meanwhile, Sue and the programmer his bodyguard found were trying to find anything valuable in Ian's computer. Sue stood near the computer all this time. She understood that the guys needed to hurry. The hacker managed to find one hidden folder, but it was locked with a password. But this was not a problem. And Ian was already returning to the room. Chan was ready to transfer money to him but Ian had to first check the video camera recordings and then pay Sue. Entering the room, he saw his daughter standing at his computer. Then he asked what she was doing. The girl said that her father has no conscience because he didn't even put a photo of him and his mother on his table. Ian told her to stop talking nonsense and demanded to see the CCTV footage because he had money. But she refused and demanded that he transfer the money to her. And after that, she would show him the records. The man warned her not to try to deceive him, otherwise she would become his enemy. He transferred money to her in order to show her the tapes immediately. Sue told him that since he was her father, she would not allow him to see something like this with her participation, because she understood that he just wanted to destroy the relationship between Sue and his girlfriend Lucy, 
and then said that she had already sent her this video. Ian was furious. He grabbed the girl by the hand and told her to give him the tapes, otherwise she would not leave his house. At this time, Lucy's family and their daughter arrived at the company's headquarters. Chan told his assistant to notify everyone that the interim meeting of the board of directors would begin soon. Sue was already waiting for the meeting to begin, sitting on the sofa, and then the girl approached him. She informed him that the meeting would start in a few minutes. Sue stood up proudly. It was time for the decisive battle. At this time, a real fight broke out between Sue and Ian. The man threw his daughter, and she fell. He said he didn't have time for her tricks and gave her one last chance to give him the memory cards. At that moment, Chan called him. He said that Anthony had just arrived at the company with his daughter. Sue grinned because she had already sent the notes to Lucy. Meanwhile, the meeting began. Louis spoke to those present. He was angry. Does the Ching Company really disrespect Tai so much that its president Sue dared to cheat on his sister? He said that if he thought he could continue dating Lucy, he was a complete idiot. Chan was very happy about this turn of events, noting that Louis's words were more than ever useful. Sue asked him to calm down, because if the young man had something to say, they could talk about it privately in his office. Chang chuckled and said that Sue, as a member of the board of directors, was wrongfully accused, which means they should all demand justice together. With these words, he ordered all reporters to enter the office so that everyone could see a fair solution to the problem. The guards tried to stop the barrage of journalists. They tried with all their might to break through. Chan told them to let them in because the presence of the media would serve as proof that the good name of their company was not afraid of any slander. Sue asked him if they really needed all this, but the man replied that he just wanted to give him a chance to clear his reputation. At that moment, Lucy showed the screen of her laptop and told everyone that the true picture of what had happened could be seen on this screen. At this time, Yen ran into the office, and Chan said that all this would be a lesson for those who were waging war against him. Lucy played a recording on her laptop where Chan was talking to Ian about how Samuel was too much of a nuisance and needed to be killed in the next couple of days, to which Ian said that the truck driver was already ready and could do it tomorrow at lunch. The men stood in stupor. Chan ordered the recording to be turned off immediately and asked everyone to turn off their cameras. Journalists realized that the assassination of the president was not accidental. Everything was planned. Chan ordered the guards to immediately stop all correspondence and break their phones and cameras. Sue told his bodyguards that it was time to act. Grant and his guys were ready to work. He ordered them to remove all the guards so that they would not interfere with the journalists. After a few minutes, the bodyguards dealt with all the guards without any problems. Chan was incredibly outraged. He didn't understand how Ian dared to install a hidden camera in his office, but the man only replied that he specifically recorded their conversation for his own safety, but his daughter Sue set him up. A few minutes later, the police arrived at the building. They said that Chan and Yen were suspected of organizing the murder of Samuel. The men were forced to go along with the employees. After a while, it was over, and Lucy was happy to note that Sue and her brother Louis played their roles well. Soon the system notified Sue that the mission had been successfully completed, and to obtain a new identity he needed to give a command, and a moment later the guy received a new identity as the best assassin. In addition to the position of president of the Ching Company, he now has another identity, a secret assassin nicknamed Lord. No matter who he starts hunting, the victim will never be able to elude him, but later he decided to retire to live a quiet life. However, the enemy was on his trail, and soon his quiet life would come to an end. Sue received personality skills such as stealth, insight, basic healing skills, excellent shooting and hand-to-hand -hand combat skills, and his mission was that he must solve all the problems of the new personality and survive. The time to complete the mission is not limited, and also the system warned him that once extracted, his personality skills would remain with him forever. After some time, Lee informed him that the police had confirmed the authenticity of the video. This means that the perpetrators cannot escape charges of premeditated murder and face at least life imprisonment. But suddenly Sue said that he wanted Chan and Yen to be sentenced to death so that there would be no more uncertainty in his life and asked Lee to organize it. Lee could not refuse him, because for Sue he was a sworn enemy in business and taking advantage of the opportunity, he destroyed the problem. Although Sue is young, his determination was enviable. 
When Lee came out, the guy threw five business cards at the wall and threw a pen at them. In one movement, he managed to pierce all the sheets of paper at once. This was the skill of a first-class killer. Soon Sue approached his bodyguard and said that he wanted to challenge him, and he was shocked by such an offer. He asked to hit him with all his might, and Grant could not refuse him. The man swung and hit him in the shoulder. However, Sue didn't even feel the blow, but Grant pointedly fell to the floor in pain, saying that Sue seemed to be wearing armor and lied that the boss seemed to have broken his arm. Sue realized that he wouldn't be able to train here and decided to find a sparring partner elsewhere. For this purpose, he went to a boxing competition. He came as an ordinary spectator, but when he saw people fighting in the ring, he was very disappointed in their fight. He said out loud that it would not be difficult for him to defeat them. One pumped-up boxer heard his words and told Sue that he personally raised these fighters. But Sue told him that he was serious. With these words, he only angered the boxer more, and he invited him to enter the ring with him. The guy happily agreed. Once in the ring, the man was still surprised how such a weakling as Sue had the nerve to say such nonsense, and then added that if he lost to him today, he would immediately close this boxing club. Then Sue advised him not to overdo it because that's all just sparring. Suddenly, Shane entered the building. As it turned out, he had invested a lot of money in opening this boxing club. He saw Sue standing in the ring, and at first he didn't understand what the hell he was doing there. Before the fight, a man from Shane's company approached the boxer. He told him that if he beat Sue, the president would pay him $1 million. The man was incredibly happy about this condition. After all, with this money, he will be provided for the rest of his life. Shane asked the coach what he thought about this fighter, and the man replied that he brought him from abroad for a lot of money. His nickname is Wild Monster, and he used to fight illegally. He said that ten seconds would be enough for him to break Sue's nose. At this moment, the Wild Monster swung, intending to hit his opponent with all his might. However, Sue easily dodged his attack. The coach became nervous. He assured Shane that it was nothing more than an accident. He then began to threaten the fighter, promising to throw him out of the club if he made a similar mistake again. Sue said he wanted to test his strength and fighting skills and told the boxer to punch with all his might. The boxer was furious and said that Sue had made the worst mistake in his life, and since he was asking with all his heart, he would not refuse him. The fighter was very angry, now he definitely cannot be stopped. Shane grinned. This is what happens to those who steal the girl he loves. The wild monster began to throw a series of blows, but Sue dodged each of his attacks, grinning at him. Is this really all he can do? The boxer replied that Sue was acting like a rat and was running away from him all over the ring and couldn't even hit him. Sue didn't want to hit him in the face, so he decided to hit his opponent's hand. At that moment, when the boxer was about to attack him again, the guy caught the right moment and hit him right in the hand. A moment later, the sound of cracking bones was heard. It was the boxer's arm breaking. Everyone was shocked. No one could have thought that this could happen. Sue himself did not expect that he had become so strong. Shane wanted to leave this place as quickly as possible, but suddenly Sue turned to him. Shane stopped, and then the guy walked up to him. The young man was very scared. He pretended to be very surprised by such a coincidence and asked what Sue was doing here. The guards told the guy to keep his distance from their boss. But Sue grabbed them slammed their heads together with all his might, and then turned to Shane. Sue said he heard the trainer tell his fighter that Shane was willing to pay him $1 million if he beat him, and then the guy fearfully replied that it was just a coincidence. Sue warned him that this would be the first and last time, and if he continued to scheme against him, he would meet an unenviable end. Then he released the guy and left. Shane and his men bowed to Sue and wished him well. The audience, seeing this, started talking about the fact that Shane's image of a tough guy had collapsed. He turned out to be an ordinary coward. Meanwhile, Sue was walking down the street and decided to call his girlfriend. He invited her to have lunch together, but she said that she was now in college, and if he continued to skip classes, sooner or later he would definitely be expelled. Sue only replied that he had already talked to the rector, Next week, the guy would donate three million to the university to create an educational fund, and the rector, in turn, would help him with the session. At this time, Sue was being watched from the roof of the building. The girl could not even think that the Lord could be so young, but her partner told her that he did not care, because soon he would become a corpse after all. He spent a lot of time to find him. 
Suddenly, Sue turned in their direction. He noticed them. The girl became nervous, wondering if their plan had failed, and the guy didn't understand how he could notice them from such a distance. When the strangers again took aim at the place where the young man had just been, there was no one there. Sue hid around the corner of the building. He thought that it was Shane who sent the killers after him, but then he realized that he would not have had time to organize everything so quickly. Perhaps these are his old enemies of his new identity. Soon, Sue called his bodyguard and told him to strengthen the security. After a while, he reported to him that he had added 30 people to the security and also installed infrared sensors around the villa to protect the perimeter. And now, if anyone comes here, they will immediately report it will become known. Sue thanked them for their good work and allowed them to rest. At this time, his enemies saw that the young man had strengthened his security, and thus they realized that he had found out about everything. Then the girl said that it was not surprising that he resigned, since he resorted to such primitive ways to protect himself. Sue thought that using such methods of defense should increase their vigilance and should convince them, and after that he would defeat them with one move, but the main question was how to choose the best moment to lure the snakes out of their hole. Suddenly someone called him on a hidden number. Sue picked up the phone, and then the stranger asked how the Lord was doing with him. Sue recognized his voice. It was Tony. He was an agent of the Lord. But he did not understand why he suddenly contacted him after the killer decided to live a quiet life. The guy asked him how he had the courage to call directly to his number, because in business they don't do that. Did he really forget the rules? Tony answered with joy in his voice that it was not in vain that he went against these rules, because he had a large but easy order. Sue became interested in the proposal and asked to tell him more about it. Then Tony said that the object was located in China, very close to him, and most importantly, the customer was very generous and was ready to pay $3.5 million. Sue was shocked and asked how serious the goal must be for the customer to be willing to give such a huge amount, to which Tony replied that his goal is just the president of one corporation, and for him it will be very simple. All the information about the goal will come to him by email. Soon the guy opened the letter and was horrified to see his photo on the screen. He was horrified to see his photograph on the screen. At this time, Tony was relaxing on the beach with beautiful girls. After a while, Sue called him and the man asked him if he was interested in the offer. But the guy didn't call about this issue. Sue told him to immediately give the name of the customer. Tony didn't understand why he demanded such data. And besides, he couldn't talk about it. But Sue said that one way or another, he would still get what he wanted. Then Tony was afraid for his life and said that he would definitely will tell you everything he knows about the customer. He said the customer's name was Shane, the son of the owner of a group of companies. Sue laughed evilly. This guy has been in trouble for a long time. Suddenly, his girlfriend Lucy came up to him and asked what he was doing here and why they couldn't get through to him. But Sue himself was surprised to see her here. She was very angry with him, so he offered her dinner as an apology. Lucy grabbed his hand and said that it was very difficult to book a table at this restaurant, and if they missed their chance, Sue would have to pay her compensation, to which the guy just grinned. They went outside, Sue told the bodyguard to take assistance with him and asked them to follow him. His enemies saw the guy leave the house, and the man decided that they should follow him. But the girl said that there is no point in this. Today it is too early to make a move, because judging by his actions, he has already noticed them, and now they need to wait for reinforcements. Sue and Lucy, meanwhile, arrived at the restaurant and discovered that they were half an hour late, and the next table would not be available until a month later. At this moment, Sue was talking to someone on the phone, and the girl asked him who it was. He told her that he was buying this restaurant and tomorrow they could have dinner here. Ten minutes later, they arrived at the girl's house. She asked him to wait because she wanted to cook noodles for him, and then Sue asked her if there was anyone else at home besides the two of them. She replied that her brother was abroad, and her mother and father were at a meeting, and then Sue suddenly hugged her. Lucy became embarrassed, not understanding what the guy was doing. Then he looked into her eyes and kissed her. She didn't know how to react to this. Lucy asked him to stop, but Sue's hands were already reaching for the zipper on her dress. Soon the girl was already lying on the bed, but she still understood that she was not ready for this. 
However, Sue assured her that she had nothing to fear and promised to be extremely gentle with her. A moment later he kissed her again, and Lucy apparently decided to give herself to him. But suddenly the light in the room turned on. It was the girl's mother and father apparently they had returned from a meeting. Sue and Lucy immediately jumped up from the sofa, and she asked her parents if they should be at the meeting right now. Her father told her that the meeting had been postponed, his eye twitching nervously. Sue said that they had misunderstood everything. They were just looking for the switch in the dark, but suddenly they tripped and fell on the sofa. The guy was very embarrassed, and then said that it was time for him to go about his business, wished Anthony and Mia good night, and quickly left the house. When the bodyguard saw the boss, he was surprised. Apparently, he had finished his love affairs so quickly again. Sue angrily told the bodyguards that they were free for the day and told them to get out of here. He got into the car and pressed the gas. He was thinking about why the killer had not appeared yet, because he had already released the guards. Apparently, he won't be able to meet with them today to clear his head. But then he remembered that he still had another option to unload, Shane. Soon he arrived at the hotel. Two guards stood at the entrance to the room. Sue asked them if he understood correctly that Shane was inside. The guys angrily replied that it was none of his business and told him to get out of here. But at that moment, Sue hit one of them, and he flew several meters away. The second guard did not understand what had happened, and Sue decided that he should learn to control his power. The guard took out a gun and was about to shoot, but at the last moment, Sue stopped him. Thanks to his gun skills, he blocked the gun and the guard couldn't fire, then he hit him and the guy lost consciousness. At this time, Shane heard strange sounds outside the door and did not understand what was happening. He looked out of the room and exclaimed that if they didn't shut up right now, he would break their legs. But only Sue stood at the door and greeted the young man joyfully. Shane stood there in a daze, he asked in surprise what he was doing here. Sue replied that it was a private matter and ordered the girls in the room with Shane to leave the room. Shane must have been full of energy as one girl was not enough for him, to which the guy replied to Sue that he could call him a couple of girls, and also apologized for the incident that happened this afternoon at the boxing club. But Sue told him that he did not come because of what happened during the day. At that moment, reinforcements came into the room. These were Shane's people. He hid behind them, mocking Sue, because how stupid you had to be to come to him alone. But the guy only laughed in response and said that he seemed to be waiting for his visit. Shane exclaimed that he publicly disgraced him and thought that he would get away with it, since then he dreamed of getting rid of Sue and he himself came here. Sue was only glad of this, because if he had only killed Shane, he would not have experienced the feeling of victory. The guy ordered his men to beat this upstart so that he would never be able to smile again. Then the men ran towards him sharply, but no one could harm him. Sue easily dealt with all of them alone. Shane was afraid they were sure to overpower him in a crowd, and then he ordered his men to grab him. But just a few seconds later, all his people were already unconscious. Shane was terrified. He did not understand how an ordinary person could single-handedly cope with so many armed people in just a few moments. When Sue dealt with the last bandit, he asked the guy if he had any other options. Shane replied that if he had the courage, then let him kill him. Otherwise, his people will not leave him and his girlfriend Lucy. Sue looked at him murderously and said that if he touched Lucy, he would find a hundred ways to make his life worse than death. Shane said he's not afraid of him because he's just the president of the company who just thinks he's a god. Sue said it was a terrible idea to spend $3.5 million to kill him. The guy was in a stupor. He didn't understand how this bastard knew about this because he turned to an elite agent and only Agent Tony and the killer nicknamed the Lord could know about it. Then Sue leaned towards him and whispered that he was the Lord. Suddenly, someone shot at them, but Sue managed to dodge, grabbing Shane by the back. Sue asked him in surprise if he really had time to call more of his people for protection, but Shane himself was also terrified. His people would not shoot at him. He immediately grabbed the phone, intending to call the police, but Sue decided to check if these were really not his people. He grabbed the guy by the hair and lifted his head above the sofa behind which they were hiding. At this moment, the sound of gunfire was heard again, and then Sue became convinced that it was strangers. Perhaps these were the same killers who had pursued him this afternoon. He saw them on the roof of the building opposite the hotel, and the killer saw Sue running out of the room. Before this, the guy threw a red cloth on the sofa, signaling the start of the duel. 
The killer headed towards the exit of the hotel waiting for Sue there. But after some time, he was wounded in the left shoulder. When he looked down at his wound, he saw that a chopstick had been thrown at him. As it turned out, Sue went out onto the roof of the hotel, threw a chopstick at him like a rifle, and managed to hit the target from 250 meters. The killer understood why he was called the Lord, and then, without thinking twice, threw a smoke grenade. Sue chuckled. Did he really decide to run away at the slightest difficulty? The killer lowered the rope and began to climb down it, since the Lord turned out to be too strong for him. If he could deal with it with ordinary chopsticks, then what can he do with real weapons? But Sue was already waiting for him on another floor of the building and he kicked him in the stomach. The man was forcefully slammed into the wall of the building and he knew that he had to come up with something. Suddenly, the killer grabbed a gun and shot Sue. But the guy managed to dodge his shots and suddenly disappeared from sight. After another moment, Sue slapped him in the face and said that compared to him, he moved like a turtle. The guy grabbed the killer by the throat and asked who sent him. The man answered with a satisfied grin that it was not for nothing that he was considered the king of killers, and he had just convinced himself of this. Sue gave him ten seconds to say who ordered it, otherwise he would release his hand and the killer would fall down. The killer apparently already wanted to name his employer, but at this moment, he suddenly pulled out a knife and tried to stab Sue. The guy reacted instantly and immediately lowered the killer, who began to rapidly fall down straight onto the roadway. For the most part, Sue didn't care. He could find his employer without his help. But at this time, help arrived to the falling killers. Several cars passed directly underneath him, and the man fell onto the roof of the truck, miraculously surviving. His assistants, men in black suits, immediately opened fire on the roof of the building. But it was too late. Sue moved away from the edge of the building, hiding from their sight. The white-haired girl immediately gave her subordinates an order. They couldn't let the guy leave. She helped her partner lean on her shoulder, and he said that he would be fine. He had only broken a few vertebrae. Deputies went to the roof but reported that no one was there anymore. The girl was furious because they had just missed the legendary lord. The guy told her that they needed to get out of this place as soon as possible because the police would be coming here very soon. He told her that the lord is a very scary person, and they need to be extremely careful. But the girl said that after they return, he himself will have to justify himself to the boss. Then they got into their cars and went straight to their boss. But they didn't know that Sue had already hidden himself in the bottom of the car, planning to go with them. After some time, they arrived at the boss and told him about the situation. The man was very angry with them. He pays them a lot of money, and not a single hair has fallen from the Lord's head yet. The hitman guy apologized to him for being too confident. He thought he could handle him alone. He asked to be given one more chance... He will definitely fulfill his order and destroy this lord. The boss threatened them that he would sail on his ship in three days, and if by then they did not resolve the issue with the lord, they would not be happy. The killers understood that they could not disappoint their boss again. The guy said that they needed to work out the whole plan as best as possible, and they no longer had the right to make mistakes, and the girl offered to settle the issue with the lord's friend. At this time, Sue watched their conversation and recognized his customer. His name is Kalen Wilson. Seven years ago at the races in New York, he lost a large sum of money to the Lord, which is why he lost three fingers. Many years have passed, and he is still trying to take revenge on him. After a while, Sue called his girlfriend. She did not expect this and asked why he was calling her so late. Then the guy asked if she wanted to go on a cruise. After a while, Sue and Lucy were already at the five-star hotel. Going out onto the balcony, she was incredibly surprised at how beautiful the view was from the hotel window. She was pleasantly surprised that Sue had found such a wonderful place. The girl laughed carefreely, every now and then photographing herself against the backdrop of local landscapes. Sue only replied that there was nothing special about this place, because there were many places in the world that were much more beautiful than this. He hugged her and told her they could go wherever she wanted and then kissed her. She was very happy to be with him, and then said that she was going to take a shower and then go straight to the beach. Sue was hungry and asked her if she wanted to eat first, but the girl still decided to stay the course. The guy admired the beautiful silhouette of his girlfriend for some time and then went about his business. First of all, he needed to eat, so he headed to the hotel restaurant where a table of food was already waiting for him. While he was eating, he decided to call his bodyguard and ask how he was doing. 
Grant told him that they managed to fool the boss's enemies by the nose. Until now, they still hadn't noticed him leaving and thought he was still in the office. The man said he had nothing to worry about. Sue grinned while the killer is watching his double. Kalen Wilson doesn't even suspect that he has already turned from hunter to prey, and if his information is correct, Wilson's liner will arrive here by evening. Suddenly a girl came up to him. Her name was Rose. She asked Sue if she could sit with him. Apparently there were no more free tables in the establishment. The guy didn't mind and allowed the girl to sit down. All the boys and men around were surprised by her beauty. They kept gawking at the girl. Rose thought that since she was sitting next to him, and he never even looked at her, it meant that he was just shy, or maybe he was playing with her in order to interest her. But suddenly Sue got up and left. She didn't understand why he didn't even look at her. Was she really completely unattractive in his eyes? And Sue, meanwhile, walked past a huge window, near which people were crowded. They were actively discussing something. At this time, a luxury liner arrived at Sue's location. All the people were surprised because they had never seen such luxurious yachts before. The guy was glad about this because he had been waiting for this liner for a long time with Kalen Wilson on board. Soon the ship stopped, boarding was announced, and all guests were invited to the pier to check their tickets. Lucy looked at the yacht with admiration. She had never seen such a beautiful ship. And Sue, meanwhile, changed his clothes so that no one would recognize him and told his girlfriend that they were about to board this luxurious liner. Lucy asked him if they could really go up there because the queue was huge. People bought tickets a year in advance to get here. Sue opened his mouth to answer something when a man walked past him, hitting him with his shoulder. He turned around and with a dissatisfied look told him to watch where he was going, and then Sue raised his hand, asking for his forgiveness, smiling maliciously. He then winked at the girl and took out two tickets with a smile on his face. The girl stared at him in surprise because he had just stolen tickets from another person. But Sue quickly covered her mouth with his hand so that she wouldn't give them away, and then added that he checked this guy in advance. It turned out that he deals in illegal gambling and earns dirty money. The girl listened to him carefully, her eyes wide open. She thought about his words, deciding that the man really got what he deserved and then dragged the guy to the ticket office, saying that if they were late, the liner would sail away without them. And Sue at that time was scouting out the situation. There were wealthy people around, and the guy decided to look at them out of the corner of his eye, noting to himself that the passengers were not ordinary people. And after the arrival of the liner, almost no one came out. It all looked like some kind of, then a private party. Sue smiled wickedly. No matter what this Wilson has in mind, he will still beat him. Meanwhile, another quarrel was taking place in Kalen's office. A glass of red liquid was thrown into the blonde guy's face. Wilson looked angry as he still had not received news of the overlord's death. The guy calmly looked at the man and replied that his people had prepared an ambush on the way to work, and if Sue did not die, then at least his limbs would turn into mush. But Wilson only threatened him that if he screwed up again, then tomorrow would be for him, will not come again. Meanwhile, a girl and a guy came into the office and reported that all the guests had boarded. Wilson stood up. His face became calm, and with a wry smile, he said that he would go to meet the guests. The hall was huge. There were a lot of people. Everyone was crowded, waiting for Wilson to come out. Lucy didn't understand why everyone was crowding around and buying tickets just to chat in the lobby, and Sue calmly replied that the people here were going to play for big money. As soon as the liner started moving, the fun would begin. The girl was frightened by this answer. She decided that they urgently needed to leave. But Sue looked at her, hugged her, and assured her that everything would be fine because he was nearby. While people were excitedly talking about something, Rose looked out from around the corner, looking somewhere to the side with interest. The guy immediately noticed her, looked tiredly in her direction, not understanding why she came here alone. People hearing the address from the balcony turned around and raised their heads, Wilson stood at the top, surrounded by guards, holding a glass of drink in his hand, kindly saying that the next three days on his ship would be the best for his guests. Sue looked at him confidently. A smile appeared on his face, and he thought to himself that these days would be Wilson's last. The croupier girl, who was watching the men play, kindly asked them if they were going to raise the bets. Two of them folded, but one man, looking at them with a smile on his face, upped the ante. 
Sue sat and played something on the machine, trying to find Wilson with his eyes, but he understood that he was well prepared and it would not be easy to catch him. The guy turned around. Rose was standing behind him. She was playing with the man, and judging by the smile on her face, everything was going well for her. The man with a smile on his face told the girl that luck was smiling on her, and at this rate she could get rich. Sue continued to look attentively in her direction, smiling slightly, and noting to himself that she was just a girl from a rich family. Meanwhile, the man turned to Wilson and, pointing at the monitors, said that in an hour they would be in international waters, Wilson looked towards the monitors. He pointed his finger at one of the screens where Rose was and asked the man who she was. He immediately began to look for her in the lists, carefully turning the pages, and then Wilson said that there was no need to check, because it didn't matter who she was, since she was on his liner, then she belonged to him. At that moment, men in black approached the girl from behind. One of them kindly said that their boss was inviting him to have coffee with him. The girl turned in his direction, eyes wide, expressing her surprise. Then she changed her face, saying that she did not know their boss and was not going to drink coffee with him. Unnoticed by her, they put a knife to her back, realizing that she did not want to go with them in an amicable way. The man continued to smile affectionately at the girl, saying that she needed to go because the boss's patience was not unlimited. Soon Rose was walking with the men. They were directing her to the right place. Sue watched Rose closely, completely ignoring his girlfriend. One of Wilson's men, meanwhile, was looking at Rose through the monitors, noting to himself that the girl had the courage to come on board alone. Suddenly he saw something interesting. Sue, holding his hat with his hands, was leaving the hall. The guy asked his partner to show the young man's face. But he couldn't do this. He said that his face was not visible on any of the cameras. From such an answer, the guy flinched. Apparently, it was Rose's bodyguard, who knew very well how to hide. Meanwhile, the girl was forcibly dragged towards Wilson, the men holding her hands tightly. One of them entered Wilson's room, informing him of Rose's arrival. Sue carefully leaned out from around the corner, carefully examined the whole picture of what was happening, discovering Wilson's location, and then hurried to leave his hiding place before he was spotted. Suddenly, there was a fishing line in front of his face, and the guy barely had time to stop. Someone wanted to grab him from behind. The guy grabbed the wire with two fingers, and the attacker, Johan, pursed his lips from such an unexpected action when suddenly Sue kicked him in the lower back with his knee, causing him to lose his balance. The man's eyes widened, Sue brought his elbow to his thigh and pushed him back, still holding the wire in his hands. He sharply grabbed him by the arm and pulled him forward, throwing the man over himself, and soon Johan was already lying on the floor, gritting his teeth in pain. He did not understand where the bodyguard got such dexterity. Sue clenched his hands into fists. Looking at the blonde with contempt, he realized that he had not yet dealt with him. But soon other people began to approach the scene of the fight, and Sue had already disappeared around the corner. Johan rose slightly and put his hand on his knee, noting to himself that he had already seen the face of that bodyguard somewhere. He turned to two men who had come in response to the noise, saying that Wilson was being hunted, security needed to be strengthened, and no one should be allowed out. Meanwhile, in Wilson's cabin, Rose pressed herself against the wall, trembling with fear as the man gradually approached her. Wilson looked at her with a wide smile, telling her not to be nervous, assuring her that nothing bad would happen to her. The girl looked around worriedly, trembling with fear and practically crying. She begged him to let her go, but Wilson only held out his hands to her, laughing and ordering her to stop resisting. Rose quickly moved to the other side and slightly raising and bending her hand, hit the support on which the vase stood, causing it to sway and fall, breaking into many large and small fragments. The girl screamed in fear, asking for help, hoping that she will be heard. The two men who had brought her to Wilson entered the room with the doors wide open and weapons in hand, one of them asking worriedly if everything was okay. Wilson yelled at them and threatened to throw them overboard to the sharks if they bothered him again. The men left. One of them smiled broadly and told the other that the boss should have fun as he pleased, and their task was simply to watch the door. The man approached the girl even closer. She turned away from him and moved in the other direction, screaming for help. But Wilson was only amused by this reaction. Meanwhile, Sue held the rope and headed towards Wilson's room, 
it was time to teach him a lesson. The next moment he flew into his room, breaking the window with his foot. Wilson opened his eyes wide, not understanding what was happening. But before he could say a word, Sue's fist flew straight into his face. Meanwhile, the guard stood calmly at the door, not reacting to the cries of their boss, as he had ordered them to do. Wilson himself was already lying on the floor, and Sue was even surprised that someone like him was knocked out with just one blow. Rose was still standing, pressed against the wall. She asked the guy who he was. Sue first flinched at her voice, but then took off his mustache and glasses, reminding her that a few hours ago they ate at the same table. The girl, hearing his words, walked towards him, her face red from tears. She said that he had no idea how grateful she was to him, and Sue looked at her with wide eyes, not knowing what to say. At that moment, one of the announcers in the hall turned to Sue, saying that he knew about his intentions, and if he wanted Lucy to remain alive, then he should come to them. The guards stood waiting with the men holding Lucy hostage behind them. A light came on in the elevator, attracting everyone's attention. People took out weapons and pointed them towards the elevator. The doors opened and everyone saw Wilson. Sue stood behind him, using him as a human shield. Wilson ordered everyone to lower their weapons. Sue looked towards the man holding Lucy and grinned, saying that he was not completely useless. Johan put a gun to the girl's head, saying that it was very stupid of him to leave her alone. Sue just winked at Lucy, saying that he had everything under control. Johan pointed the gun at Wilson and Sue, but the guy just silently held the man in front of him and looked at them without reacting. Sue put a knife to Wilson's neck, saying that his subordinates were completely out of hand, and then Wilson once again ordered them to put down their weapons. He turned to Rizzo and George, who were still holding their weapons. Rizzo glanced at Wilson out of the corner of her eye and told him that Johan was more generous than him. After his death, the three of them could equally divide his estate. The man's eyes bulged with horror and anger. He began to shout at them, remembering how many years they had been feeding from his hand. Johan shot in the direction of the man and Sue without hesitation. Lucy screamed in excitement. Sue instantly hid around the corner, shielding himself from the bullet, but Wilson received a bullet right in the forehead, causing him to fall to the floor. Johan continued to egg on the Lord, asking him not to be a coward and accept his death. Sue pressed himself as close to the wall as possible, thinking to himself that Wilson was already dead, but the system did not send him a notification about the completed task. Then Johan, losing patience, ordered his men to catch the guy, and they immediately rushed after him with weapons. Sue, without hesitation, came out of hiding and threw several knives directly at Johan's subordinates. Three men were shot directly in the heart and a moment later they fell dead. But there was still one bodyguard left. He randomly shot at the guy. Sue had no choice but to cover himself with the dead bodies of the men, using them as a human shield. Johan could not believe what was happening. And at that moment, Sue, still hiding behind the dead bodies, threw knives at the remaining fighters. He broke the lanterns, and the next moment the lights on the liner went out. No one could see where the guy was hiding, but his blows hit the target, killing Johan's subordinates. Johan screamed out of panic. Sue managed to knock the gun out of his hands, and the man did not understand how he could do it. Suddenly, Sue appeared behind one of the killers who had previously tried to kill him and put a knife to his throat. The surviving guards immediately pointed their weapons in the direction where the sound came from and opened fire. But before they realized that they weren't shooting at Sue at all, the bullets had already riddled George's body. His partner Rizzo was furious and opened fire on Sue, intent on avenging her friend's death. The guy grinned, dodging her bullets, because at any other time he would have been sorry to kill such a pretty girl. The next moment he attacked Rizzo, cutting her throat with a knife and saying that she was definitely no match for his girlfriend. Johan, meanwhile, continued to hold Lucy, threatening to shoot her if Sue moved. But a moment later, another knife flew in his direction. With one precise hit, he knocked the pistol out of the man's hands. Sue just grinned that he didn't hear him and decided to take advantage of the fact that Johan hesitated. The next moment, he was already behind him, saying that it would be strange to lose to them because he is the Lord. He also decided to explain why he decided to put his girlfriend in danger and took her overboard. The guy covered her eyes so she wouldn't see what he was about to do, and then in one deft movement he cut Johan's throat, saying that they had no chance of hurting Lucy. 
Sue closed his eyes, sighed in relief, and raised his head. The task was finally completed, and then many mechanisms appeared before his eyes. A voice congratulated him on completing the task, preparing to give the guy a new identity. Soon it was received, in addition to the president of the Ching Corporation and the best killer, he now knows how to communicate with spirits, predict the future, establish a connection between the afterlife and people, and calculate events in the human world 300 years in advance. He needed to spread his fame throughout the entire province in seven days, and as a reward, he will receive something mysterious. Sue, after listening to all this information, he did not understand what this mysterious reward was, but his girlfriend was still standing in a daze. The guy still kept her eyes closed. Lucy was crying. She didn't understand what was happening and why he closed her eyes. Sue looked at her carefully, holding his face with both hands and replied that she was no longer in danger, but he didn't want her to see a lot of blood. The guy smiled calmly at her, trying to calm the girl down, and told her that everything was fine now. It was just a bunch of bad people. Soon the liner stopped near a hotel. There were quite a few police cars parked on the pier. One of the police officers shouted into the loudspeaker, warning everyone to stay put. They arrived here on a call, having received information that illegal gambling was taking place on board. The people on the ship were incredibly angry and dissatisfied. They asked where the police came from here, because Wilson had promised them complete confidentiality. Sue got off the plane and turned to the policeman, saying that he was the president of Ching Corporation, and he was the one who called the police. A girl stood next to him, and the policeman kindly thanked him for his cooperation. While Sue and Lucy stood on the pier and chatted about something with the police, Rose looked at them, still on the liner. The policeman offered to take Sue to the hotel, and the guy thanked him, saying that if they had any questions, he would be happy to help the investigation. Rose pouted, remembering the moment when Sue knocked out Wilson and thereby saved her. Then she asked what she should do. The guy turned his back to her, answering that he saved her simply because he was passing by, and since she was not afraid to climb on board alone, she should take care of her own safety. The girl looked into the distance upset, telling herself that even when she was right in front of Sue, he still didn't look at her. When it was over and the couple arrived at the hotel, Sue stood at the entrance to the room, leaning against the wall, and told Lucy that it was time for her to go to bed and that he would be in the next room. She turned in his direction and said that she was scared to be alone, but the guy only said that now no one would dare touch her. The girl opened her mouth slightly, and noticeable embarrassment appeared on her face. She tried to convince Sue that she could not sleep alone, but the guy did not understand what she was driving at. Sue turned his back to her, already preparing to leave, and finally suggested that he could watch her door so that no one would come to her. The girl shuddered at such a question, her face turned red with anger, because Sue could not understand her hint. Then she decided to say it straight, because tomorrow they were leaving, and now was the last chance for intimacy to happen between them. Sue was both happy and surprised at this proposal, not knowing how to answer him, but still decided not to delay the decision. But what did he ultimately choose? Morning soon came. Lucy woke up. The sun was already shining outside the window. The girl tiredly rubbed her eyes, not fully understanding where she was and what happened last night. Sue suddenly appeared above her, wishing her good morning and gently touching her cheek with his hand. The girl was slightly perplexed. She didn't understand when Sue managed to wake up, but the guy said that he got up 20 minutes ago and was waiting for the girl. At first, the girl did not understand why he was waiting for her to wake up, but the guy quickly replied that yesterday he did not have enough intimacy with the girl and he would like to continue today. When everything was finished, Sue took the girl to the university and said goodbye to her. He told her to call him if anything happened and he was going to meet her after school in the evening. The girl said that in the evening she would not let him go until she was definitely satisfied. The guy's jaw even dropped at these words. He didn't expect that his girlfriend would like their closeness so much. Soon the guy arrived at an underground passage, where seers often gathered to tell fortunes about the fate of passers-by. There were already those who worked here every day, and they clearly did not expect to see a young man dressed in a seer costume here. The old man saw the inscription on the sign that the guy came with and grinned, 
saying that the current generation really doesn't know how to do anything, even deceive people. Sue only said that the old man was wrong, because he had the gift of predictions, he was not going to deceive anyone. The man got angry, he said that only the last idiot would believe the guy, and even if they were business colleagues, his words did not inspire confidence in him, since he himself had already deceived people here for thirty years. The old man was offended, turned away, and cursed about where the world was heading, and walked away from the guy, and Sue realized that he definitely couldn't convince his grandfather with words. Meanwhile, a young couple, a guy and a girl, were coming down the stairs. They were discussing the movie they were going to see. Suddenly, the girl noticed the young seer, and he noticed her and immediately offered grace to them for the future. The girl's eyes immediately lit up with joy. She couldn't help but notice how handsome the young seer was. She asked him if he really knew how to tell fortunes. However, her boyfriend hastened to take her aside. He was sure that only scammers lived here, and he would not allow his girlfriend to become one of those naive ones who believed them. But Sue was not going to give up so easily. He offered to tell them fortunes first, and then they could decide whether he was a scammer or not. The girl readily agreed. She really wanted to try. She extended her hand to him and asked if he read palms, to which Sue replied in the affirmative. However, the girl's boyfriend was in a negative mood. He pushed her away and said that first this scammer should tell his fortune. He looked angrily at the seer and said that if his prophecy did not come true, he would smash his shops to pieces. Sue just grinned, and this made the guy very angry. He thought that he was scared and advised him to quickly leave here if he could not answer for his words. The old man sitting next to him grinned. In his eyes, Sue was just a young and stupid boy, and now life would teach him a lesson. The guy just continued to smile carefree. He said that if his prediction did not come true, then his client could do as he saw fit. The guy only grinned in response, surprised at the seer's courage, but his girlfriend urgently asked him not to measure his strength with him. Then Sue asked what the guy wanted to know, and he told him to predict any event that would happen to him today, because he wanted their dispute to be resolved as soon as possible. Then Sue replied that looking at his hand, he saw bloodshed. Today he would be beaten, but the guy just grinned at this, because he had a black belt in taekwondo, and he could not believe that someone would attack him today dare to attack. He realized that all this was a deception. Then he rose to his feet and looked reproachfully at Sue, saying that tomorrow he would come here and they would get even with him. He pulled his girlfriend along with him by the hand, and she told the seer that it was better for him to lie down for a while and not come here again. But Sue just grinned. He understood that he wouldn't have to wait until tomorrow. Everything would happen much faster. Meanwhile, the couple moved quite a distance away from the seer, and then the guy reproachfully asked her why she was staring at him like that. Did she really like the seer that much? But deciding not to develop a quarrel, he invited her to go to the cinema. As they agreed, however, the girl no longer wanted this. Then they went forward. The guy suddenly flew into someone's back and immediately cursed at the person standing in front of him. But when the stranger turned around, the guy saw that it was a huge two-meter man who was looking at him with anger he was clearly unhappy that the guy scolded him. This man turned out to be Grant, Sue's main bodyguard. He decided to tell the guy everything he thought about him because he ran into their leader, and now he even dared to argue with him. Sue just watched everything that was happening through the screen of his phone. He had already calculated this whole situation long ago. The seer sitting next to him only looked askance in his direction. He suggested that he quickly pack his things and get out of here while he was still in one piece. Suddenly, the same guy who promised to beat the seer appeared next to them. He shouted and asked him for help. A moment later, he walked straight up to the guy, fell to his knees and apologized for not recognizing his brilliant insight and asked him to tell his fortune again, his face covered with bruises. The guy admitted he was wrong, and Sue just grinned. He told the couple that he has a rule— he makes no more than one prediction per person per day, and therefore this time he can only show the girl. He took her hand, put his fingers to her palm, and asked what she wanted to know, and the girl timidly answered, she wanted the guy to tell fortunes for her financial well-being. To do this, Sue needed to find out her name and date of birth, 
and then the girl answered all his questions and also said that she was a second-year student at a pedagogical university. Sue, without even letting her finish, said that today she would receive the good news of money, and her boyfriend was surprised. Did his girlfriend really manage to buy a lottery ticket? Suddenly the girl received a call from the director of her university. He said that her application for a scholarship had been approved. Then the girl turned to the seer, calling him God, because he accurately predicted what would happen to her in just a minute, to which Sue just grinned, saying that all this could easily be read from her hand. Soon a crowd of girls and young boys already ran up to the young man. They asked him to tell fortunes for them, too. They were ready to pay any money to find out their fate. However, Sue hurried to answer them that he didn't want everyone to know about his gift, so he told fortunes to two people a day, and today's limit had already been reached, so he asked them to change and left. A crowd of people wanted to shout after him. They asked the guy to leave them his contacts, but he just ignored all their requests. When he found himself alone, he thought about the fact that he had managed to warm up interest in his personality. Then people would do everything themselves, and the fame of his name would soon spread throughout the province. After some time he came to his office stretching tiredly, he thought about the fact that it remains unclear to him what the essence of his new skill called medium is. Suddenly, a system appeared in front of him. She explained to him that everything that exists has a soul, and by touching an object, his memories will be revealed to the guy, so he will be able to look at the memories of absolutely anything, even a plant. The next moment he touched the plant standing next to him and saw what it saw, pictures of his secretary Sue going about her business, sitting on the phone, eating and watering flowers opened before his eyes. He was quite surprised by this. It was not at all what he expected to see here. Soon Sue herself appeared in front of him. She asked her boss if he needed help. However, Sue hurried to get up from his seat and move away from her, saying that he did not need help. The young man walked into his office and closed the door behind him, knowing that by touching the object, he would be able to see what was happening in his field of vision. Thus he could see absolutely all the secrets of those who passed by the objects he touched. He quickly dismissed these thoughts, because he had no intention of doing something like that, at least not yet. Meanwhile, an alert came to his phone, it was his girlfriend, Lucy. She asked him if he had any plans for lunch because her uncle had arrived from abroad and her parents wanted him to have lunch with everyone at Family Circle. After a while, everyone was already gathered. The whole Lucy and Sue family were sitting at the table and talking. Uncle and Aunt Lucy grinned, saying that in the couple of years while they were gone, the girl managed to grow up and turn into such a beauty. Her aunt smiled sweetly. She didn't know that during this time she had found such a cute guy and asked Sue not to hurt her niece and take care of her. Also sitting at the table were Lucy's cousin, Layla, and her boyfriend, Robert. He said that they would soon be part of the same family, and they should exchange contacts, since he also plans to develop his business here. Sue replied with a grin that it was not his place to give instructions here, because he was not the most experienced businessman. Then Robert asked where he worked, and Sue replied that he had a small business here. Robert chuckled, saying that in time he would definitely succeed, he was ready to provide him with assistance that would help him climb up the career ladder, and also said that he was working with the Ching International Company. Everyone sitting at the table understood perfectly well who was the leader of this company, but Su did not show it. He just smiled and said that he would count on his support. Robert smiled back at him. They shook hands, and then Su realized that thanks to this touch, he would be able to see everything that was happening in the young man's life. Suddenly a picture appeared before his eyes of a man holding a huge stack of money in his hands and saying that he could play it very believably. Then in the next vision, the man was holding the hands of Robert's wife, Layla, who was crying and asking him to leave her alone. The next picture showed how Layla, surrounded by her parents, looked at Robert, and they said what a decent young man he was and that she would not be afraid to leave her own daughter in his hands. A moment later, a picture of Layla walking with Robert appeared in front of the young man, and they promised not to do anything until the wedding. Another vision showed Robert sitting at a doctor's appointment, who tells him that he should not continue taking pills because male impotence is not so easily cured. However, the next vision shocked him. In front of him were two pumped-up men. They had practically no clothes on. After that, Sue hurriedly pulled his hand back, 
He was shaking a little from surprise, and he plopped back on his chair. Lucy didn't understand what was happening. Did her boyfriend really not sleep well yesterday? Then she invited him to eat some meat. But the young man said that he had lost his appetite. Sitting at the table, he thought about what a busy life Robert had. Because he was a gigolo, and an impotent, and a pervert. And if he was exposed on at least one of these points, he would face public death. And Sue did not care at all if he were a stranger to him. However, he got into his head and ruined one of his freshest fantasies, so now he could expect no mercy from him. His fantasy was that Lucy and her cousin Layla were lying on the bed in front of him, ready for anything. Sue suddenly said that he forgot to take his phone with him and asked Robert to lend him his. Without any further thought, the pink-haired guy handed over his phone, saying that the password was six ones. Lucy realized that the phone had been in his pocket all this time, and then she asked what he was up to. Then the guy entered the password for the secret folder on Robert's phone, which he learned through his visions, and an obscene video with those same half-naked men opened before his eyes. Lucy hastened to turn away from what she saw, not wanting to look at this nightmare, and Sue grinned, saying that Robert likes to have fun. The young man himself did not understand what he meant. Sue then turned the screen towards everyone else sitting at the table and showed them what he saw. Robert's girlfriend and her parents were in complete shock. Layla immediately jumped up from the table asking how long Robert was going to deceive her. Robert still didn't understand what was going on, but when he picked up his phone, he realized that everyone had just seen his dirtiest secrets. And then he screamed. He didn't understand how Sue knew the password for this folder. The guy only replied that it all happened by accident, but Robert was furious. He overturned the table and said that he did it all on purpose. The young man managed to shield his girlfriend Lucy with his body from the table, which was flying straight towards them, and moreover, he threw it back towards the attacker. The blow landed squarely on Robert's stomach, and he soon fell to his knees, clutching his body in pain. Then Sue decided to tell the whole truth about Robert. He said that he faked the attack on Layla to make himself look like a hero, and then hoped to inherit her family's property. Layla's parents and the girl herself could not believe that all this time Robert had been hiding such a secret from them, and the young man himself could not understand who this Sue really was and how he knew everything. Then the guy hastened to introduce himself. He said that he was the president of an international corporation, as well as a seer. Not intending to be in the presence of the deceiver any longer, Layla kicked her boyfriend out of the house and told him never to be seen again. When Robert left, tears flowed down her cheeks. She had been deceived all this time, but Lucy hastened to reassure her cousin and said that she was lucky because in the end, she learned the true face of her husband before it was too late. Meanwhile, Sue apologized for the scandal he caused, but Layla's parents said that, on the contrary, he did them a huge favor. However, they did not understand, because Robert had just returned from abroad. When did Sue manage to find out everything for him? Because he even knew his password. Sue just grinned and said that he was a seer and knew everything. However, Lucy believed that all these were some kind of tricks. She turned to the side displeasedly and told him to calm down and finally sit down to eat. When the meeting was over, Sue was walking down the alley heading towards his home, but suddenly he felt that someone was following him, and said out loud that he noticed this person. It turned out that this person was Layla. Sue was very surprised. He did not expect to see her here and asked what she was doing here. The girl asked if he really was a seer, and if so, could he help drive out evil? Soon they arrived at an unfamiliar house. Layla said that she and Robert lived here after returning from abroad, and Sue was quick to point out that this place was very beautiful, but he needed to know what exactly the help was needed with. Then Layla said that ten days ago, on the second night of their stay here, something strange happened. When she was sleeping outside, she heard some strange sounds. It sounded like crying. At first, she chalked it all up to the roar of the wind and was going to just close the window. But suddenly, something seemed to appear in the curtains. It seemed as if a person had wrapped himself in them and was standing right in front of her. According to her, after a second, the curtains returned to their previous state but she was absolutely sure that someone was standing there. Without further ado, Sue went towards the house. He asked the girl to take him to her room so that he could look around. When they arrived at the place, Layla pointed her finger at the window, saying that that was where everything happened. 
Sue went to the window and opened the curtains looking out, but there was nothing special on the street. Then he decided to use his medium skill, and suddenly the spirit of a young girl appeared before his eyes, standing right in the middle of the courtyard. Sue was seriously surprised, because this was his first meeting with a ghost. Soon he went outside to inspect the place where the girl had just been, but there was no one there anymore. Meanwhile, Layla received a call, as it turned out. It was her mother. She did not understand why the girl returned to that ominous house, but Layla replied that this time Sue would handle everything. Meanwhile, the young man was thinking he thought maybe he shouldn't go into all this alone because he was unprepared and the ghost could easily take him with him. And just as he thought that he was a seer and therefore would be able to outplay the spirit, something strange appeared in front of him. It was a dark silhouette, the same girl when he saw him. The young man was so frightened that he felt a cold piercing him to the bones. Suddenly the silhouette disappeared, and while the guy was peering into the distance, trying to figure out where he had disappeared, a girl in a short white skirt appeared behind him. Feeling the presence, the guy turned around sharply, intending to expel the spirit. But as soon as he touched the ghost, the girl gasped in pain. Sue was incredibly surprised by what he saw in front of him. It was a young girl. Was she really the ghost that scared Layla? At that moment, the ghost walked around him on the other side, and then he simply fell. He did not expect such an action on her part and did not understand what was happening. He saw the ghost, but it was tangible. It was a rather strange situation. The girl herself was no less surprised than he was. She could not believe that the young man could see her. When she realized that this was the case, she smiled and grabbed his hand, and the guy realized that now he could even touch her. Meanwhile, Layla watched everything that was happening from behind the window, noting that now the evil spirits had moved into Sue. The next moment she went to her car and hurried to leave here, silently apologizing to Lucy for dooming her boyfriend to such an unenviable fate. Seeing all this, Sue cursed, he should have realized that something was wrong here. However, one question still remained unresolved. He pulled the girl towards him and asked what her name was and why she was hiding here and scaring people. Then the ghost girl replied that her name was Emma. Three years ago, she died after falling from a cliff. And since no one could see or hear her, she decided that she could stay here. She still had nowhere to go, and she didn't want to scare anyone. She just wanted to chat a little. Then a brilliant idea flashed into Sue's mind, since the ghost could see her. Why shouldn't she go with him? Emma couldn't believe what was happening. Sue headed towards the exit, saying that she could go with him because she had nothing to do here anyway. However, the girl was overcome by doubts. She did not want to go anywhere with him. She lived here as she wanted, and if she followed him, it would seem that she would become his pet. But Sue only replied that if the girl went with him, he would help her take revenge on her killer, and now she would continue to enjoy a carefree life. Emma couldn't believe what he was saying, because he somehow found out about the girl who pushed her off that cliff. Soon Sue brought the girl to his house. He said that from now on she will live here, and she does not need to fly around the house at night and scare people. Emma was surprised. She couldn't believe that she could go to sleep right here on this huge bed. Sue only quietly replied that she should rest, because tomorrow morning they would go to take revenge on her killer. After some time, the young man was already sleeping peacefully, lying in his bed. However, something made him suddenly wake up. When he opened his eyes, he saw Emma lying right on top of him, hugging his chest. Out of surprise, he screamed, asking what she was doing in his room, to which the girl replied that the guy woke her up. She sat down opposite him and explained that this place was new to her, and she was afraid to sleep here alone. Sue was perplexed because she was a ghost. She had nothing to fear, but the girl sleepily leaned on him, saying that it was he who brought her here, and that he was responsible for her comfort. Soon Emma fell asleep and Sue just looked ahead in surprise, not understanding why he got all this. The next morning the guy, as promised, went with the girl in search of her killer. He asked if she remembered the way to her house, and Emma replied that at the next intersection they should turn left, and her house would be there. Sue found out that Emma and her killer were best friends, and she killed the girl because of some guy. Then he asked her why she didn't go to settle the score with her, why she lived next to the place of her death all this time. But the girl only answered that she went to her. 
but she had some kind of strong amulet that didn't allow her to get close enough to her. Sue chuckled. This was a rather interesting detail. It turns out that her killer had a working talisman to repel spirits. They soon arrived at their destination, right at the girl's house, and called the intercom. Emma asked if he was really going to kill them all, but the guy replied that he was a law-abiding citizen and did not kill people left and right, and soon the girl would find out everything. But for now, she just needed to help him achieve his goal. Soon the door opened and a middle-aged woman came out, asking who the young man had come to. Sue just walked past her, saying that he had come to see her husband. The woman was surprised because she did not allow the young man to go inside and chased after him, intending to stop him. However, the owner of the house, the husband of that same woman, came outside, asking what was happening here. Meanwhile, the man had already sat down on the sofa, and the woman who was trying to take him outside told her husband that he had come for him. The man also shouted at the intruder because he didn't know him, so he ordered him to get out of here immediately, otherwise he would call the police. However, Sue chuckled and asked if he was going to at least offer water to his savior. The man did not understand what he meant, and at that moment the bottle of water standing on the table in front of him seemed to fly into the air and fly straight into the hands of the guest. As it turned out, it was Emma's tricks. Since her spouses could not see her, she could scare them by moving things around their house and pretending that they were moving on their own. The man and woman were seriously surprised, and Sue was happy because he was counting on just such a reaction. He calmly said that the couple could sit down because they needed to talk. Frightened, the owner of the house immediately sat down opposite him, asked to forgive them for their ignorance because they did not immediately recognize him. He hoped that the young man would forgive them for their behavior. He also asked why the young man called himself a savior. Was trouble really threatening their family? Then he answered that while passing by their house, he accidentally noticed a bloody mark left by the spirit of a deceased person, which usually means that within three days the family will lose their home and relatives. The couple were shocked. They couldn't believe his words. Would they really be ruined? Then both fell to their knees in front of him, begging him for help. They promised that they would honor him until the end of their days. Sue asked if there were any other people at home, and the man replied that their daughter was also there. The young man asked to call her here, and the father immediately shouted, calling the girl. Her name was Lily. Soon a young girl with short black hair came downstairs. She did not understand why her parents were screaming so loudly and what they needed from her. Then she saw her parents kneeling and asked what they were doing. Lily obediently approached them, and then Emma saw her killer up close. The picture of the girl throwing her down the cliff again appeared in front of her. She was incredibly angry. Then Emma suddenly rushed at her, screaming for her to give her back her life. Sue was scared. He didn't expect Emma to be so unrestrained and didn't know what to do. The girl reached out her hands, intending to grab Lily by the neck, but something stopped her. Apparently, this was the same amulet that Emma had spoken about earlier. Suddenly, a certain sphere appeared between them, protecting Lilia from the attack. The power of this sphere was so strong that it tore Emma's clothes to shreds, leaving her practically naked. The girl sobbed, said that she was distraught as soon as she saw Lilia, and forgot about the protective amulet she was wearing. Seeing the confusion on the face of the couple, wondering if he had already begun to fight the evil spirit, and Lily asked what was going on here. Having calmed down, he replied that he tried to pin the evil spirit against the wall, but he did not give up so easily, apparently he could not get rid of the bloody mark, so the family would have to answer for what they had done. The man screamed and began to beg to show up to help, otherwise their whole family would suffer. Sue replied that this mark was caused by their daughter. Then he asked what she could have done that the spirit of the deceased still cannot calm down and still wants to take revenge on her. Lily's eyes widened in surprise. She couldn't believe it was Emma. Then she screamed. The girl was sure that it was her. And now the dead girl wants to take revenge on her. But her mother wondered why she should take revenge, because she had been dead for a long time. Then Sue asked who Emma was, noting to himself that his guess turned out to be true. Lily's parents had long known that Emma had died. When the man realized that he could no longer hide this situation, he tried to soften it. He said that one day their daughter committed a very undignified act. She carelessly pushed her friend off a cliff. Emma immediately intervened, saying that it was an accident and then Sue asked them to tell what exactly happened then. 
The man said that the reason for their discord was a guy who their daughter liked, and he liked Emma. And one day, while climbing the mountain, they had a quarrel, and their daughter, in a fit of anger, attacked her friend. However, Lily hastened to intervene. She was angry because she did not want everyone to know the truth, and then said that her father was lying and Emma was just a homewrecker. But her mother hastened to put her down, saying that the girl would not admit her mistake, even after all these years, and now the whole family is in trouble because of it. Lily started screaming at her mother, and then her father slapped her. He said that there is no time for this now because their family is in danger. Sue agreed with him because now they needed to resolve several common problems and sort things out. Emma was upset to learn that her friend killed her out of simple jealousy, but her father continued to stand his ground. He wanted Sue to protect them from the evil ghost. Sue explained that the girl died three years ago, and it is unlikely that during this time she did not find an opportunity to come here, however, she still did not harm anyone from the family, and apparently... The reason for this was the amulet. Then the man said that he got it for his daughter. Then the girl handed the amulet to the seer, and he asked where exactly the man got it, to which he replied that a monk from the monastery gave it to him. Sue thought that since this amulet works, it means that besides him there are people who know a lot about otherworldly affairs, and this thing was quite good, so he was going to put it on himself, but he told his parents that the amulet was really effective, but over the years he gradually lost spiritual energy, so his protective properties decreased, but he promised that he would help them cope with the impending disaster completely free of charge, and he would take the amulet for himself for a while to study. And his parents were not at all against this development of events. They promised well pay him for his help. He also added that three years had already passed since the murder, during which time the girl's soul had finally turned into an evil spirit, so there could not be a simple solution but he had something to offer the family, but they might not like it, and he understood this. He said that the evil spirit is alive as long as he has a thirst for revenge, and if this thirst is quenched, he will lose the meaning of his existence. He added that Lily should surrender to the police, then Emma's spirit will calm down, and Sue can easily get rid of her forever. He said that this was the only option to save their family. The couple were shocked. They could not believe that their daughter would have to surrender to the police. Then the man asked if there was another way and was ready to pay any amount for it. However, after looking at him, Sue asked how they could not believe him after everything they had seen for themselves. He was about to leave when the man stopped him, saying that he had misunderstood them. Then he turned to his daughter and said that she would have to surrender to the police. Lily screamed that Sue was not capable of anything if he was forcing her to take such a step. The father turned to her and ordered her to shut up, because everything that was happening to them now was because of her. It was she who set up the whole family, but the girl did not intend to give up. Then her mother turned to her, asked her to think about her younger brother, but Lily only pushed the woman away. The girl ran to the door to escape from the house before she was caught. However, the father managed to intercept his daughter, he did not intend to let her go when the fate of his family depended only on her. Sue and Emma watched calmly. Soon the police arrived. The employees asked what happened here. The father of the family replied that it was he who called them, and he said that he wanted to say that three years ago, his daughter pushed a girl named Emma off a cliff and killed her. The mother was still trying to calm Lily down, asking not to blame them, because they had no other choice, and by sacrificing herself, the girl would ensure the safety of both them and her brother, and in return they promised to visit her more often. However, the girl did not intend to give up so easily, she screamed, wanting to declare that for three whole years her parents covered up this crime. Her father turned to her and shouted at her, trying to justify himself by saying that they knew nothing about her shameful act. Lily understood that she had nothing to lose and decided to drag down with her everyone who forced her to surrender to the police. The police themselves were at a loss to understand what was happening. Then Sue entered the conversation. He confirmed that everything really happened three years ago. When Lily pushed a girl named Emma off a cliff and killed her, their parents helped them escape from justice. And now, when contradictions arose, the family tried to shift the blame onto each other. Then the young man handed the policeman a voice recorder, saying that he had evidence, a recording where they confessed to the crime. The man became furious, realizing that Sue was not the savior, 
Then he asked the guy who he was. The young man replied that his name was Sue, and he was helping Emma take revenge. The family was in shock. They could not believe that they had been so deceived. Soon all three of them were taken out of the house and put into a police car. The policeman thanked him for the evidence and assistance to the investigation, and the guy smiled, saying that this was the duty of a decent citizen. When everyone left, Sue just stood there and watched the cars disappear over the horizon. He asked how Emma was feeling now after everything that had happened. The girl replied that she was no longer angry, but she still felt some confusion. She has lost her main goal, and now she doesn't know what to do. Then Sue lightly grabbed her hand, saying that now her main goal is to help him. He stated that she owed him for the help she provided. Lilia, without hesitation, agreed to become his assistant and said that she would fulfill all his wishes. However, Sue realized that with this girl everything was not so simple, and he created another headache for himself. Soon he received a call from a journalist who was spreading slander on the internet, claiming that everything Sue did was an act, and he was going to broadcast it to expose the seer. Sue grinned as he realized that the show had begun and ordered the bodyguards not to interfere, as he intended to meet the journalist in person. He called Emma with him, saying that they now have a new business. Meanwhile, the journalist was already on the spot, telling others that the seer was an ordinary charlatan. He introduced himself as an investigator from a city newspaper and invited everyone to subscribe to his channel. People noticed a silhouette approaching the crowd, it turned out that it was Sue. Everyone was surprised because he was so young. Then Sue installed a sign and asked if everyone had really come for him to tell fortunes for them. The journalist was the first to try out the guy's talents. The young man asked if he wanted to know about his personal life or material wealth. But the journalist was not going to ask about the future, since this could not be verified on the spot, so he asked to talk about his past. The young man himself was glad about this, because if he had asked to show him the future... He would have had to organize a whole concert, but since he asked to know about his past, it was enough for him to simply touch it. Suddenly, a picture from the journalist's childhood appeared before Sue's eyes, his mother scolding him for the puddles in his bed, as well as the moment when he cheated on an exam. In the next memory, the girl rejects him and asks him not to pester her anymore. The journalist did not understand why Sue was silent and asked him to admit that he was a fraudster. Then Sue said that the journalist's name was Harry. He was 34 years old. He mentioned the village where he was born and also talked about his father's cafe and his mother's work at the hospital. Harry did not believe it, believing that the information about him was known in advance. He turned to the people standing behind him, saying that the seer was actually a charlatan and could not predict anything. Sue continued to say that Harry slept in diapers until he was 13 years old, until he was cured with folk remedies. In the ninth grade, he cheated on an exam, but was not expelled. At university, he unsuccessfully tried to court 12 girls. Everyone refused him, and now Harry is interested in espionage and stores secret video files on the F-Drive. The man was seriously surprised. He could not believe that an ordinary person was able to find out such personal information in him. Everyone present was shocked. They did not believe that such personal information about Harry could be known. Sue added that for finding fault with a decent person, karmic retribution awaits him. Harry thought it was just a series of ridiculous coincidences, but suddenly Emma flew up to him and tripped him up. Harry fell, and everyone was surprised that the seer's prediction came true. When people realized that all the rumors about the guy's abilities were true, they headed to Sue to find out about their future. Meanwhile, Rose lay in bed thinking about the guy from the ship. She saw his photograph on the news and learned that the seer provides unerring predictions, and then Rose decided to try to meet him again. When the business in the seer's guise was over, Sue returned to the office. He sat leaning on his chair, sighing languidly. The bodyguards did not understand why their boss was making strange sounds. As it turned out, it was Emma who massaged his head after a hard day. However, Emma herself was surprised why Sue wastes time punishing other people and arranging everything so that the predictions come true. Sue agreed, but admitted that this task is indeed tedious, so he tells fortunes to only three people a day. But he thought about it after all. It is being discussed on the internet, but the system still has not counted him completing the task. Sue suddenly appeared in the office. Concern was visible on her face, and she said that they had problems. 
Then Sue moved away from Emma and asked what happened. Sue handed him a tablet on which the news was revealed that Master Jack was personally taking charge of exposing the charlatan Sue. He stated that tomorrow at 9 a.m. in the transition, he would tear off the mask of the liar and show his true face. Sue said that Jack is famous as a metaphysician and specialist in physiognomy. Many rich people turn to him for advice, and if he decides to take on Sue, this could lead to serious consequences. However, Sue just grinned and said that if Jack is the best in his business, then he must meet him. He saw this as an excellent opportunity to make his name even more recognizable, and it would be foolish to refuse it. In parting, he advised him to carefully disguise himself so as not to jeopardize his identity, but assured him that he would do everything properly. Emma then called him and asked him to look ahead. When the young man looked up, he saw Emma lift Sue's skirt, showing him her underwear. The girl immediately thought that these were the tricks of her boss, but he said that he had nothing to do with it. The bodyguard standing outside his door wondered what was going on in their boss's office. The next day, Sue arrived at the meeting place with Jack, where many people had already gathered. Suddenly, Emma appeared behind him. She asked if he was angry with her for yesterday, but he asked her to shut up. Their conversation was interrupted by the screams of the crowd who saw Jack approaching the meeting place. A rich car drove up to the crowd, and a middle-aged man got out of it. It was Jack himself. He looked at the crowd with disdain, noting that this place was a real village, and now he understood why Sue had become so popular. The man walked straight towards him, preparing to meet his opponent. However, Emma suddenly appeared behind him. With her ghostly hand, she hit him right on the neck, causing the man to flinch in surprise. At that moment, Sue appeared in front of him, grinning at Jack's inattention, the hat from his head flew straight to the ground. Jack, brushing himself off and leaning on his guards, looked angrily towards the young man. He shouted, saying that he had only stumbled, but now he intended to expose him in front of everyone. Sue chuckled and asked what exactly Jack was going to expose. The man's guard tried to stop him, saying that he was just a fraud, and Master Jack would expose him today. Then Sue asked how this would happen and the man told him that they would tell fortunes to each other and find out who the real fortune teller was. The young man asked what exactly he wanted to know, and the man replied that he wanted to hear from him how he got the scar on his arm. The crowd was shocked because it was not easy to find out the origin of the scar, especially since it was received decades ago. They were sure that this time the master would not be able to cope. However, the young man calmly took Jack's hand in his, and the man noted that he was very confident for a simple swindler. Within a few seconds, the father answered that when the man was three years old, he went into the forest to get firewood, his hand became sweaty, and the axe accidentally slipped, injuring his hand, and this is how this scar appeared. Jack was shocked. He couldn't believe that Sue answered his question correctly. However, he said that this was a lie. He claimed that he injured his hand three years ago while cutting vegetables. Sue, in response, gave him a threatening look and said that such jokes would end badly for him. Then Jack got really scared, admitted that what was said was true, and offered to tell his fortune. Then Sue asked him at what age he would get married. The man grinned, thinking that he had chosen this topic in vain, because weddings are his specialty. Many have found their soulmate thanks to his advice, so it will not be difficult for him to guess the date of his marriage. However, as soon as he touched Sue's hand, he immediately pulled it back and stepped back. Then he asked the young man his date of birth, and the seer himself did not understand why Jack suddenly began to talk to him respectfully. Suddenly, the man bowed and asked to be forgiven for his insolence, because he did not immediately recognize his greatness, but hoped that he would not hold a grudge against him for this offense. Sue didn't understand what the man saw when he touched his entire hand. He hoped that Jack, as a specialist, would tell him something useful, however, he saw something that scared him very much. Then Jack admitted defeat, and the whole crowd was shocked, had the master of his craft really lost. But Sue was not going to let him go so quickly. He said that first he needed to speak out, because until he tells what he saw on his hand, the question remains open. Then Jack fell to his knees, said that he would not dare reveal the secret of the great seer. He swore to keep his mouth shut for the rest of his days, and said that from now on he would never make predictions again. The crowd looked at Sue with incredible surprise, and even though the young man asked them to calm down and called it all a misunderstanding, people immediately rushed to him, begging him to tell their fortunes and show them the way. 
They were interested in questions about when they would finally get rich. They asked Sue to make them rich, or to find them a bride. Some even asked the master to marry them, but the young man was quite tired of all this, and he hastened to hide from the crowd while they were distracted. Looking at Emma, he said that apparently this is the ceiling of popularity, and there is no point in him coming here anymore. The girl was delighted with her owner and said that he was incredible. Grinning, he said that for the best killer in the world, this was just nothing. However, suddenly someone appeared behind him and put a hand on his shoulder. When he turned around, he saw Rose in front of him, and she asked if he was the one who never made mistakes. Sue recognized the girl, but tried to pretend that he was seeing her for the first time and asked what question she had come to him about. Then the girl asked him to find one person for her, and Sue replied that for this he needed to know his date and time of birth. The girl only answered that she only has a portrait of this man. When she unfolded the photograph, everything became clear it was himself. Flushed, Rose asked if he could help her, and Emma grinned that her owner apparently had a lot of fans. Then Sue decided to give up. There was no longer any point in pretending that he didn't know Rose. He took off his glasses and asked how she found him, to which the girl replied that she saw a video of him on social networks and immediately recognized him. She would never have thought that she would find him in this way and asked if he really worked as a fortune teller. Sue replied that it was just a hobby, and yet he was still interested in what issue she came for. Then the girl replied that there was nothing urgent here. The last time she snuck out of the house and ended up at that camp, she survived and returned home unharmed, only thanks to Sue, and just wanted to say thank you to him. However, she still had one question. She approached the young man closely and asked if he had a girlfriend. Sue replied that he was dating the girl he was with on the ship that day and also gave the role his business card, saying that if she needed help, she could contact him. The girl was very upset, but she understood that such a prominent guy could not help but have a girlfriend. Sue wanted to answer that he was not amazing, but Emma said that he shouldn't be too humble. Rose then asked what the status of their relationship was, if they were even engaged, but Sue felt that this was not that important information. However, Rose had a different opinion. She said that if they were not engaged, then she still had a chance to get his attention. Soon she ran away about her business, finally saying that she would not give up her plan and would try. Emma said that now Sue is tied to her with a sense of duty, but the guy said that there is no need to pay attention to her, and now it's time for lunch. As they walked down the street, the guy thought that he had already killed Jack but this was still not enough for the system to complete the task. Apparently, there were bigger fish ahead of him. Meanwhile, the action moves to an elite house. The young man was sitting on the sofa with a teapot and invited his master to drink tea. The man sitting next to him asked if the guy had called him here for tea, and he was wondering what his real purpose for the meeting was. Then the guy fell to his knees in front of the man and asked the great monk to restore justice because Sue put his parents and sister in prison and must be punished for this. The man asked him why. When talking on the phone, the guy mentioned that Sue came to their house with a ghost. The guy screamed that his parents said so. He came to their house with the ghost of the deceased Emma. Then the man thought, apparently, Sue knows how to interact with the dead. And the guy added that he used to study with him and he was a complete loser. But one day he was strangely lucky. And in an instant, he turned into the president of a large company. But he, I've never heard of Sue being involved in the occult. Finally, the man got up from the sofa and asked how the guy knew about the accident three years ago and suggested that if the guy's parents were not moved by their minds, then the ghost of the dead girl asked Sue to help her take revenge. He also asked the guy what he knew about the noisy demigod, to which the young man replied that he had seen a video of him on social networks, nothing more. The man assumed that the owner of the company, Sue and Sue the Seer, were the same person. However, this is not the main thing, because if the ghost of a deceased person harms the living, then it must be destroyed, and if this Sue serves an evil spirit, then he himself is a bad person who can harm others, and this should not be allowed. Then he asked the guy to take him to Sue, and he quickly agreed. And Sue himself, along with his girlfriend Lucy, were relaxing on the riverbank, fishing. Lucy asked if he even knew how to fish, not understanding why they were wasting time on this useless activity. Then Sue replied that fishing takes time and patience, and moreover, the fish had already taken the hook. The monk had already arrived at their resting place along with that young man, 
he was surprised how the old man determined the location with such accuracy. When they approached the vacationing couple, Lucy learned about her ex-boyfriend's boyfriend. He shouted that Sue stole his girlfriend and then imprisoned his family members, and now he had to answer for it. The monk just grinned, noting that it was not in vain that he took on this matter and then used the spirit recognition technique. Suddenly, Emma appeared in front of him. She had been hiding all this time. But since the monk used a method that allowed him to see spirits, she now became visible to him. Sue couldn't believe whether Lily was the sister of this young man. His intuition told him that today he would meet a key character, thanks to whom he would complete his task. But he never believed that this particular person would become this person. Then Eric pointed to his companion, a real monk from the monastery. He grinned, because unlike his father, he was a real master of his craft. Emma approached Sue, saying that this monk can now see her, and Sue was a little surprised. It turns out that this man really knows how to do something. Then he handed the amulet to the man and asked if it was his doing. Emma immediately screamed. She didn't want Sue to take out that thing because it hurt her. Then the monk began to use his spell, saying that it was just an old trinket, but now he was capable of more. Suddenly something pulled the girl straight into the monk's arms, as if by a whirlwind, and she screamed, asking him to save her. Then the young man grabbed her hand, pulling her away from the monk's spell. Lucy looked at all this in surprise, not understanding what was happening because she did not see any spirits. The old monk screamed. He didn't care what school Sue was from, because for helping the spirits in their sinister deeds, he should be punished in any case. Lucy then asked what the man was talking about, whether there were spirits here, but Sue told her that she shouldn't pry into other people's affairs because it would end badly. Then she continued to use her spell. He couldn't believe that this boy was threatening him. Suddenly, a crowd of men arrived on the scene. As it turned out, they were Sue's bodyguards. Grant put a gun to the monk's head, forcing him to calm down. Sue calmly sat down on the bench, saying that times have changed, and the monk should not test what will be stronger, his techniques or bullets. The man screamed. He couldn't believe that this young man was so impudent because it was against all fighting ethics. In response, he advised the man to choose his words when addressing his boss. Then the monk was seriously scared and stopped shouting at Sue, fearing for his life. Eric didn't understand what was happening. Had the great monk really chickened out? How could he be afraid of bullets? Then the man shouted that he was not going to die for this. After all, he was not immortal. Everything intervened in the conversation, saying that it was Eric who came to him to settle scores, and from today they will have to sum up a new balance of grievances and claims. When Eric realized that he had lost, he fell to his knees and cried, saying that he understood his mistake, and this would not happen again. He begged not to kill him. Sue decided to consult with his girlfriend, and she said that the main thing for her was that she never saw him again in her life. Then Sue ordered Grant to take the boy to the police and tell the officers that he also knew about Emma's murder and covered up his sister for three whole years. Eric begged Sue to change his mind, but to no avail. Meanwhile, the guy turned to the monk. He asked him not to worry because he was a law-abiding citizen and was not going to kill anyone just like that. On the contrary, he only wanted to consult with him. The monk sat down obediently. He asked if Sue was really that great fortune teller and then added that he was not worthy of giving him any advice because his abilities were far superior to him. Then Sue replied that, to tell the truth, he had not previously believed in the existence of spirits and anything supernatural, but the experience of the last two weeks had opened his eyes to many things and turned his mind around. The monk couldn't believe his ears how this man could achieve such results in two weeks, but Sue told him that none of this mattered. He asked him to tell in detail about the world to which he himself belonged, namely about the immortal cultivators. He wanted to know if they really existed. The man was surprised. He did not understand why the seer was asking him about such things. Sue replied that he had just started his journey in this matter, and he was very interested in this topic. To this, she replied that he had little in common with heroes from fiction, and especially with immortal cultivators. Otherwise, he was unlikely to be afraid of pistols. He said that with the help of practices you can make forecasts, fight evil spirits, there are also techniques with which you can entertain a crowd of onlookers. But people like him do not pose a real threat. Sue then asked why the monk wanted to capture Emma. 
The man replied that it was all just out of curiosity. He wanted to take it with him for further study. Hearing this, Emma stuck her tongue out at him, but the man himself didn't see it, so he continued. He said that in the modern world, the souls of the dead rarely take the clear form of ghosts. They are more like clots of spirit. Moreover, all evil spirits should be afraid of sunlight, but she looks practically surviving, and this is very strange. Hearing this, Emma began to cry. She turned to Sue. She needed to make sure that he would not give her up for experiments. Then the guy patted her on the head and said that she need not be afraid, because he was not going to give his domestic offspring for experiments. Hearing this conversation, Lucy became furious. She did not understand what kind of relationship her boyfriend had with this spirit. Then Sue hurried to end the conversation with the monk, saying that if he had any questions, he would find him. The man could not believe his ears, had the seer finally decided to let him go. Sue just grinned, saying that, unfortunately, he couldn't invite him to dinner. It was time for them to say goodbye. The man replied that in fact he was simply preparing himself for much worse consequences, and now he admired the young man's generosity. Sue said that the monk has already proven that he really can do something, unlike the other charlatans, so now they can be considered colleagues and should help each other and not trip each other up. From such kind words, the monk even burst into tears. He could not believe how kind Sue's heart was. He hurried to shake his hand, said that in modern times no one puts monks in anything, and charlatans are to blame for this, because of them the real the seers now cannot earn their bread. Sue wanted to help him, but did not know how. He offered to give the monk a million, and he himself would distribute the money to his needy colleagues, and from now on he could turn to Sue for help if he needed it. The man was amazed by such a proposal. He promised that he would erect a statue of the seer in his temple. And Sue, looking after him, thought that it was a shame when people with real abilities drag out such a miserable life. When the man left, the guy approached his girlfriend. He asked if she wanted to eat, to which Lucy said that she was not hungry. Then Sue hugged her, asking her not to be jealous because Emma was just a ghost. Nothing could happen between them. Then, Lucy decided that there was no point in sulking at her boyfriend and handed him the phone, saying that she wanted to try it. In the girl's phone, Sue saw an offer to become the personal student of the king of the kitchen, Louis. The girl noted that she had previously seen on the news how he won awards at international competitions, one after another, and recently opened a restaurant that was very difficult to get into, and Sue noted that his credentials were impressive, so they should try. Soon they arrived at the restaurant, where a huge crowd had already gathered to get inside. Leaving Emma in the car, Sue and Lucy walked towards the line. The girl was surprised, because the line was so huge, and she doubted that they would be able to get inside. Sue assured her that they didn't even try, so why jump to such hasty conclusions? A young man approached a couple standing in line and asked if they could give them space. He was willing to pay for this place. The guy just grinned at him. He got up at six in the morning and was not going to give up his place for any money. However, when Sue handed them a check with a huge amount, they thought that it would be a great idea to exchange a trip to a restaurant for such a huge amount of money. Soon Sue and Lucy were already inside. The girl was a little worried about whether this act was too provocative, but Sue said that he wanted to be more modest, but he couldn't. At that moment, a program appeared to him. She congratulated the young man on completing the task ahead of schedule. She also said that he had received a permanent mediumship skill, as well as a secret gift. The program announced that the gift was a permanent increase in charm of 300%. Then Sue looked at himself in the mirror, noting that his appearance had not changed at all. However, Lucy, sitting opposite him, blushed. She said that when she looked at him, she felt an inexplicable attraction. Her foot touched his ankle under the table, moving higher and higher. Apparently, the increase in charm acted on the girls like an aphrodisiac. Soon the waiter approached them, asking the couple what they would order. Then Sue asked what dishes are considered their signature dishes now, because he will be doing physical activity, so he needs to eat well. Then the waiter recommended him a set dinner from the chef himself, and Sue happily agreed. But Lucy was not happy that her boyfriend was talking about some kind of physical activity in public because it was indecent. He joked that there was nothing to worry about because he hadn't mentioned her at all, so no one would think anything bad. Meanwhile, the program asked if Sue would like to extract a new identity. 
and when he agreed, the voice said that the young man was now the king of the kitchen. He was a gifted cook. Five years ago, he came out of nowhere to shake up the restaurant industry. He captivated with his skill the best cooks in the country, set standards unattainable for others. No one knew his name or information about his background, and so he was simply called the king of the kitchen. But then he disappeared as suddenly as he appeared. The task that he had to complete was that he needed to open a restaurant that would become famous throughout the world. The time to complete it was one month. Then Sue even opened his mouth in surprise, because right now he had to evaluate someone else's cooking. After some time, the dishes were served, including a set of dishes from the chef. Lucy noted that the food was incredibly delicious. All the people sitting at other tables were literally screaming about how delicious the food they were served was and that it was definitely worth the money and the wait. Sue looked at all the plates with contempt because the color, taste, and smell of these dishes did not meet his standards. Meanwhile, the cook himself noted from the balcony that there are even more clients today than yesterday. His assistant praised him, saying that his skill was simply out of this world and soon the entire province would be queuing up at the restaurant, he had certainly surpassed the legendary king of the kitchen. But Lewis replied that although he had never seen and did not know the strong appearance of his teacher, he would not allow people to speak about him like that. He still did not dare to consider himself equal to him. He agreed that the chef was still young, but believed that one day the time would come when he would be called the king of the kitchen. Lewis suddenly looked at the table where Sue was sitting with his girlfriend Lucy, he didn't understand why the young man wasn't eating. As soon as Sue tried a piece of the dish, he immediately vomited into the nearest trash can. He cursed, saying that the food was simply disgusting, attracting the attention of all the guests sitting next to him. Looking up, he saw the cook himself, who just grinned. People began to film what was happening on their phone cameras. They hoped that now the boss would put this show off in his place. Sue hastened to laugh it off. He said that the chef had misunderstood him, he was only unwell, and his food had nothing to do with it, however. He thought to himself that most likely the chef had already heard his words. The cook went with his assistant to talk to the security at the entrance, because they had a decent establishment, and they don't need to let people in who have no taste come from out of nowhere. Some people are more suited to eating pork food. They shouldn't transfer good food to such people. Lewis wanted to go back to his kitchen, but Sue stopped him. He said that initially he didn't want to publicly shame him and put it too mildly, but to put it bluntly, his food is real slop. The guests were shocked. They couldn't believe that this young man called Chef Lewis's dishes slop. He shocked the man so much with his words that he asked him to repeat them if he was not a coward. Sue pointed his finger at the plate of food, saying that everything in a wonderful dish should be perfect. The color, the taste, and the smell— because the first thing the client pays attention to is the color. The dish should make him hungry, and the color. He only has disgust for Lewis's dishes. The guests were perplexed. They could not believe that such terrible things were being said to the great chef. Sue continued, he said that he made a couple of pieces and noted that the combination of seasonings was not good. The chef's mistake could be explained by the large flow of customers, but at the same time he charges so much money from them so he has no right to make such mistakes. When his assistant stood up for the chef, he said that everyone who comes to their restaurant is delighted, and only Sue criticizes his culinary skills, so maybe he was the problem. To such an accusation, Sue replied that the restaurant owed its success to the strategy of hungry marketing. They created the illusion of exclusivity due to inflated prices. The crowd blindly fell for this, because if a person stands in line all day, then after that, even a piece of bread will seem like food to him, gods. The guests opened their mouths in surprise. They noted that Sue was right, because if you listen to him, it now seems that all the food in this establishment was absolutely ordinary. Lewis shouted that this was all nonsense. There was no hungry marketing and illusion of exclusivity in his restaurant after all. He was the personal disciple of the king of the kitchen, and he did not need to resort to such cheap tricks. Then Sue began to think, he needed to answer something, but not all of his memories had time to load. However, when the download was completed, the young man was ready to give an answer. He said that Lewis lied about his qualifications. He only said hello to the king of the kitchen in the hotel corridor, and after that, he began to trumpet everywhere that he was the personal student of the grand chef. 
The cook and his assistant were perplexed. They could not understand where this guy got such information from, and began shouting that all this was just slander. Sue continued, he said that Lewis assumed that, being very secretive, the king of the kitchen would not expose him. He hired PR people to publicize him, but it would be better if he put his efforts into upgrading his culinary skills. The assistant chef shouted, how could this guy know everything about his chef? Because the king of the kitchen has always hidden his identity, and no one knows his name or what he looks like. The chef supported him, because Sue had no way of knowing about his relationship with the king of the kitchen. He said that he was going to call the police, and he would be arrested for spreading rumors. Then Sue replied that everything is simple, because he is the king of the kitchen. Lucy was completely confused. She did not understand when her boyfriend managed to become a famous chef. Crowds of guests immediately ran to the guy. They asked him if he really was the king of the kitchen. Then the assistant ran up to him and said that he was lying. He asked him never to come here again and not to stage such performances. Sue pointed his finger at Lewis and kept saying that if he didn't believe him, he could ask him. After all, if Chief Lewis is truly the disciple of the great master, then he has met him personally and will be able to answer this question. Then the cook wondered if he really was so unlucky that the king of the kitchen himself showed up at his restaurant because his hidden clothing did not allow him to see his face, and he does not even know where exactly they met. Then the assistant asked his boss if this guy was telling the truth. Lewis shouted that he was lying. There was no way he could be his teacher. He didn't intend to reveal his mentor's appearance, but this charlatan was definitely not him. The cook decided that in such a situation, the main thing was to stand his ground to the end, because admitting he was right would be the ruin of his entire career, and Sue just grinned at the fact that the cook decided to deny it to the end. The guests also didn't fully believe that Sue was telling the truth. They said that if he really was the king of the kitchen, then he should prove it in practice, they should have a battle. Out of fear, a drop of sweat rolled down Lewis's temple. He knew that if Sue was truly the king of the kitchen, then he would definitely lose this battle. Then he said that this guy was just a rogue. He would never let him into his kitchen. Suddenly, he steals his culinary secrets. Then Sue replied that tomorrow he would open a restaurant in the city. The address of the establishment would be published on the internet. He invited everyone to try his dishes. Moreover, he invited Chef Lewis to come there and compete with him. Meanwhile, things in the company were going on as usual. Sue sat at the computer and thought that President Sue didn't give a damn about their corporation. He hadn't come to work for days. Suddenly, Lee walked past her computer. The girl stopped the man, calling him to her. She asked how long it has been since he contacted President Sue, since he hasn't come to work for days now. Isn't this having a detrimental effect on the company? Then Lee answered her that a few days ago he went to talk to his boss, and his words completely changed his view of him. Sue said that if he could not create a company that could run like clockwork without his participation, it would be a real failure, so he believed that President Sue was looking much further into the future than any of them. Suddenly Sue's phone rang. It was President Sue. He said that they had an urgent matter, and the girl needed to come urgently. Lee was worried if something had happened to the president, but Sue replied that nothing was known yet. She needed to go to him. Having said goodbye to the man, the girl walked out the door. She quickly ran down the corridor, thinking that President Sue, although sometimes he looks like a slacker, but he works harder than any of them, he is probably launching another giant project now, and her duty was to help him in everyone, sparing no effort. Soon she reached the president, and the guy noted how quickly she was able to get here. He pointed his finger straight up at the name of his new restaurant, King of the Kitchen's Haven, and asked if she liked it. Sue didn't understand whether the president hadn't shown up in the office for several days because he was working in a cafe. But the guy looked at her in bewilderment, because it was clear that the restaurant was just getting ready to open. The girl apologized for her hasty conclusions, then the guy said that all this time he was just telling fortunes to people in the passage, and these words put her into a stupor. However, they had an important matter. Sue told the girl not to stand rooted to the spot, because he called her here for help, and then she asked what she could do for him. The next moment, she, along with Lucy, were already dressed in waitress uniforms. Sue said that their restaurant is opening today, and he will work in the kitchen, and the girls will work in the hall. Lucy was indignant. 
because her boyfriend is the president of a company that is in the top 500 worldwide, but at the same time, he could not hire waitresses and pushed the work onto them. He replied that the job advertisement had already been published. He just needed to hire someone for the first time. Suddenly, their conversation was interrupted by men. They asked who was in charge in this establishment because they opened and did not even bother to say hello to them. Lucy was scared. Apparently, these bandits had come to extort money from them. She was about to call the head of the security service. However, Sue stopped her because these men were their clients. How could they be kicked out so easily? The guy approached the guests and asked them to sit at a free table, and also asked what they would order, to which the man replied that they came here for money, because when opening an establishment in their area, it is necessary to pay a fee for protection from themselves, otherwise they just won't let them open. Then Sue replied that even a racketeer needs to eat, and first he offered to evaluate the kitchen for them and if they didn't like their food, he would pay them as much as 20000 The men were shocked. They couldn't believe that this guy was offering them this. It was the first time they had encountered such an offer. However, they did not argue, and soon sat down at the table, however. They still did not fully believe that this guy was not deceiving them. While the food was being prepared, the man looked at the waitresses, noting that they were incredibly beautiful in this establishment. Sue asked Lucy if the president really knew how to cook, but Lucy replied that even if he took out their trash on a platter, they still wouldn't do anything. However, Sue was worried. She was wondering whether she should still call the security service, because if these men attack, the president is unlikely to be able to oppose anything to them alone. She was already heading to the kitchen, but as soon as she opened the doors, she saw her president masterfully preparing dishes. Emma helped him with this, serving him food so that he did not have to leave his table once again. The guy skillfully cut the fish right on the fly without even letting it touch the table surface. Literally a moment later, all the fish were neatly cut into thin pieces and boned, and Sue could not believe her eyes. Was her president's true calling really cooking? The men sitting at the table began to be indignant. They still could not wait for their food and were ready to destroy everything here. However, soon the waitresses, together with the cook, brought out whole trays of ready-made food for them and also apologized for the wait, since the master did not yet have his hands full. The bandit was dissatisfied. He did not expect that the cook would be a newcomer. He did not at all want this ration to test his cooking on them. However, as soon as they tried the dish, they were ready to take back their words. The whole food was simply gorgeous. Sue said that he is waiting for their feedback on his dishes. All comments are also welcome. However, the bandit decided that if he now admitted that the food was really good, he would lose the argument, so he said that the dish looked so-so and suggested that the cook immediately cook 20,000. However, his partners were too hungry, so they decided to try the dishes first, thereby ruining all their boss's plans. Sue, along with his waitresses, stood in shock, silently watching as the men cleared all the plates clean. When they finished, Lucy noted that the plates were cleaner than after the dishwasher because the men had polished them valiantly. Here he also noted that, judging by the expression on their faces, they were delighted. Only after the men had eaten all the dishes did they realize that in this way they would now lose the argument, so they hastened to justify themselves, saying that the food was at an average level. However, the cook only looked at them in bewilderment. The men did not know what to do. They were not ready to go against their hearts because the food was simply divine. They could not lie that it was terrible. Then they paid honestly for all the dishes, and Sue said goodbye to them, inviting them to come to him again. He was about to close the restaurant when suddenly a girl came inside and asked if they were hiring more waitresses. When Sue looked up, he recognized the girl who had come, Rose. A day later, the headlines of all the newspapers were full of the fact that the king of the kitchen had returned, and Lewis, seeing all this, was very angry because this guy managed to mess with him. Suddenly he received a call. It was his director. He was perplexed how the cook could not recognize his teacher, because he believed in him and invested a lot of money in this project. And now no one visits their restaurant, so he told the cook to get ready to return money invested in it. The man tried to calm him down, saying that this boy could not be the king of the kitchen, because the real king of the kitchen had been causing a stir all over the city many years ago, and this swindler looked too young. But the director said that he didn't care whether he was a fraudster or not, because his business was collapsing. 
Then Lewis promised him that tomorrow he would bring him to light, and the director's business would flourish again. The man thought about it. Now he no longer cares whether he is the real king of the kitchen or not, because he is preventing him from making money. And since it prevents him from making money, then he must die. Meanwhile, a huge crowd of people wanting to try the dishes of the king of cuisine had already lined up at Sue's restaurant. People occupied seats from the very morning, even before the restaurant opened, and soon the establishment opened. Three waitresses were already waiting for them inside. Lucy, Rose, and Sue, and everyone who came was absolutely delighted with how beautiful these girls were. Lucy greeted everyone who came and asked them to go inside and take the free tables. The crowd immediately rushed forward. Everyone wanted to quickly take their table. Rose also said that all the menus are already on the tables, but food can also be ordered through the terminal. At this time, Sue was preparing dishes. He skillfully wielded a knife and seemed to be doing several things at the same time since there were an incredibly large number of guests, and everyone had to be served. But Emma was in shock. She was not ready for the fact that the restaurant would not be such a blockage. Then Sue thought that Rose was obviously from a rich family, and he didn't expect her to agree to work as a simple waitress in his restaurant. When all the dishes were served and the day was drawing to a close, he sat down at one of the empty tables, drinking water, and behind him sat a strange man who still had not touched his dishes. Rose noted that this was their last client, and as soon as he finished, their workday would be over. After a few moments, the man stood up from the table. He approached the girl and asked where he could wash his hands, and Rose showed him the way. Then the girls realized that the working day was finally over, and they could change clothes and go home. But Sue at this time was closely watching the guest. He suspected something was wrong with this man. The next day, a crowd of people again crowded around the entrance to the restaurant to try the dish and look at the beautiful waitresses. However, before people could enter the establishment, the police arrived and the employee ordered his partners to seal the doors of the restaurant. Sue immediately ran to her boss. She said that the police had arrived and was not allowing them to open. Then Sue said that he was waiting for them last night, and the girl was surprised. Did he really know that they would come? However, the guy was calm. He only said that they should go and meet the guests. Journalists had already gathered at the entrance to the restaurant. They were also interested in what was happening in the sensational establishment. The policeman asked who was in charge in this establishment, and Lucy, confused, decided to answer all the questions herself. However, at that moment, Sue came out of the kitchen and said that he was the main thing here, and he would be the one to talk to the police. The man said that he would give him a chance to confess everything himself and count it as a guilty plea, but the guy did not understand what he should confess to, because he was just a cook. Was he really suspected of something illegal? Then he suggested that perhaps they were simply given a false tip. At that moment, the same man who was the last to dine in their restaurant yesterday entered the restaurant. When he understood the head, everyone recognized him as the same cook, Lewis. Sue, seeing his opponent only grinned after all, he had opened the restaurant for several days. Did this chef really decide to congratulate him just now? However, Lewis did not intend to give up. He accused Sue of being a fraud because his teacher had never revealed his identity, so he knew for sure that he was not the king of the kitchen. The guy grinned back at him, because if he didn't know how to cook, such a huge line of people would immediately line up for him every day. The bones left behind the kitchen doors advised the police to quickly get out of here and let people eat. Then the policeman asked where the thing they came for was located, and Lewis pointed them to a room that served as a utility room. He said that inside was a bag of seasonings, what they were looking for. Then the police officer ordered his partners to search everything there. Lucy still didn't understand what was going on, but Sue said they should sit down and talk. Together with the police officer and Lewis, they sat down at the same table, he asked what the police were doing in the restaurant, and then Lewis replied that he should not pretend, because he could see that the guy was already in a panic. The police came out soon and said they only found one bag of condiments, but there was nothing unusual there. Then Lewis jumped up from the table. He did not understand how this was possible, and then snatched the bag from the hands of the police. He opened the package, but did not see anything illegal there, only bags of seasonings. Then Sue grinned. He asked what exactly he was looking for. Perhaps he could help him. Then the chief of the police said that they had received information that Sue manages his food, Poppy Straw, which is why such huge queues line up for him. 
Sue only replied that poppy straw is a raw material for the production of illegal drugs, and there was no way he could do this. But Lewis was shocked. He said that he himself had placed a bag of straw here yesterday. He pointed his finger at Sue, saying that the guy just hid it somewhere. It should be somewhere in the kitchen. Sue then suggested inviting reporters inside and searching the restaurant in front of them, because he wanted his reputation to be completely cleared and Lewis's reputation to be destroyed. The man did not intend to give up so easily. He looked at the guy angrily and left. Soon the doors opened. Sue let the journalists in to prevent the scoundrels from framing his honest businessman. The journalists began to search the kitchen along with Lewis. The man was perplexed, because the bag clearly had to be here somewhere. Rose also wondered why Sue was so calm, because the man gave them poppy straws, and even if the guy found one of them, he could have made several bookmarks. Sue told the girl not to worry. He had everything under control since the man only planted one bag, and he had already found it. Then Rose asked how he knew this, and the guy replied that he had a very high-quality hidden camera. Lewis was already desperate. He didn't understand where the bag of poppy seeds was. It was absolutely nowhere. Soon Sue came into the kitchen with a policeman. He asked if the cook had found the so-called evidence. Then the man screamed. He didn't understand how Sue could find the bag before him. And after hearing this, the police officer told him that he should ride with them to the station for giving false testimony. Soon the man was taken out of the restaurant. The crowd was dissatisfied with how he dared plant drugs on the king of the kitchen. The police were about to leave when Sue suddenly stopped them. He said that since they believed that the reason for the long cues could be hidden in the use of poppy straw, then he makes the same accusation against Lewis. The man looked at him angrily and shouted that he would never do such a thing. The policeman said that such accusations require evidence. Sue then replied that they should check Lewis's restaurant, and if nothing was found as a result of the search, then he would be willing to be punished for making a false report. The policeman was wondering what this guy was up to but he was already heading towards the car to go with them to the search. Soon they all arrived at Lewis's restaurant. The man was sure that the guy managed to get rid of the poppy straws in his kitchen in time, but his kitchen was absolutely clean. He had nothing to hide. Then the policeman told them to check everything here themselves, and if they find something, they should let them know. When Sue entered Lewis's kitchen, he said that maybe there was nothing forbidden here, but since he came here, he should take a look around. Lewis claimed that this idiot was just fooling everyone and taking revenge on him for checking his restaurant. However, Sue decided to open one of the shelves directly under the sink. Soon he pulled out some strange plant from there, saying that he had never seen anything like it in his life. The policeman said there was no doubt it was a dried poppy flower, and Lewis was shocked when he saw it. He shouted that there couldn't be such things in his kitchen. Apparently, it was Sue who brought the poppy with him to set him up. However, Sue just shrugged his shoulders, because the police themselves suggested that he look. He did not volunteer to do it himself, but then they should look for everything themselves. The police decided there was likely to be something else in the kitchen, so they continued their search. Lewis tried to justify himself by saying that he didn't do anything like that, and it was just a setup, because he was an experienced swindler, and this was probably not the first time he had performed such tricks. However, one of the men said that he found a safe on one of the shelves. Then Lewis said that this was his safe, because every high-class chef has his own culinary secrets that are best hidden from prying eyes, and for this he needed a personal safe. Then he said that there might also be a poppy inside the safe, and people shouted that this was just nonsense. The police could open it and make sure that there was nothing illegal there. Then the man entered the password for the safe and said that many people passed through his kitchen and anyone could have left that flower, but the password for this safe was known only to him, so there certainly couldn't be any poppy there. However, when he opened the safe, everyone saw that inside there was a whole bag of poppy straws. The police immediately grabbed the man, intending to arrest him. The police chief said that for such a large amount of poppy Lewis faces a realistic sentence possibly even life imprisonment. The man tried to justify himself, saying that he was not the one who put the package there, but the policeman said that all the evidence was found in his personal safe, so he could stop making excuses. Sue asked who, besides Lewis himself, could have put something inside his personal safe because it could not be the work of evil spirits. 
When the problem with Lewis was resolved, Sue returned to his restaurant, where a crowd of journalists was already waiting for him. They were all wondering why, after so many years of hiding his identity, the king of the kitchen suddenly decided to reveal that, according to their information, he was also the president of the company, and they were wondering how he managed to combine it. Sue replied that cooking was just his hobby, not in any way related to his main activity, and he decided to leave the rest of the questions without comment. The girls who gathered near the foundation in the restaurant were quick to note how handsome and charismatic the cook was. Suddenly, a black limousine drove up to the restaurant and an unfamiliar man got out. He walked directly to Sue and said that he came from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and would like Sue to prepare lunch for the meeting with foreign diplomats, asking him to come with him. Sue replied that he only cooks in his restaurant and he is not interested in the man's offer. He is not going to go anywhere. Moreover, the entrance was already crowded with a line of hungry visitors, and if the man wanted to feed his diplomats, then first he had to take his turn. Turning his back to him, he finally added that everyone was welcome in his establishment, but he would serve everyone only on a first-come, first-served basis. The man wondered how this guy could just refuse them. However, Sue was already heading towards the entrance of his restaurant, where Lucy and Rose were already waiting for him. The crowd of guests chanted Sue's name, shouting that the king of the kitchen was the best chef in the world. The young man himself at that moment thought that his task was to glorify his restaurant throughout the world, and these men wanted him to simply work for them at closed banquets. Soon, Sue's name spread across all TV channels. The presenters said that the new restaurants of the king of cuisine attracted the attention of the general public. People from all over the country came here to try the best dishes, and according to their information, the queues reached 10 days of waiting. All this was carefully observed by the chairman of the National Culinary Association. Their leader, Jerry, asked his partners what they were going to do about it all. Then, one of the men replied that more than 10 foreign ambassadors had already expressed their desire to visit this restaurant. Apparently, it was too late to do anything. However, Jerry angrily slammed the table because the Culinary Association is one of the pearls of the country's national treasure. And are they really ready to look pathetic against the backdrop of some provincial eatery? However, his other partner said that Sue is widely known as the king of the kitchen, and this gives him a huge advantage. They should take it into account. Then Jerry grinned, saying that the man had just given him a good idea. After all, the king of the kitchen is just a nickname, not an official title they should give Sue a chance to confirm his qualifications officially. The men were shocked. This could not be done, because as soon as they officially recognized his status, he would instantly destroy them all, and his word in the restaurant industry would become akin to law. Then Jerry said that he only offered to give him a chance, because it was not a fact that he would be able to pass the test. His partners were pleasantly shocked. It was an excellent offer. This way they could show themselves as open and transparent, and the king of the kitchen himself would be disgraced at this moment. If after this he continued to call himself a king, people would simply consider him an imposter, but some had doubts. They believed that Sue would easily pass the test. Jerry replied that a diplomatic mission would arrive from Japan in a few days, and he was going to suggest that they bring their best chef and invite Sue to compete. One of the chairmen was perplexed because if Sue loses to a chef from Japan, it will greatly damage the pride of their citizens. Then Jerry replied that there was nothing wrong with this, since the citizens would be able to survive it, but Sue himself would be nailed to the board of shame forever. Meanwhile, work in Sue's kitchen did not stop, but the chef himself had been coughing frequently lately. Emma asked if her master had a cold, to which Sue replied in the negative. However, he had a strange feeling that someone was plotting against him, but he could not understand who his deceitful student Lewis had long been put behind bars. Meanwhile, a crowd had gathered near the entrance to the restaurant again. Rose asked the guests to wait a little longer and respect the line, and the guests themselves were unhappy because they had already waited a lot. Suddenly, a bus pulled up to the restaurant. Two middle-aged men got out of it. They were glad that they were finally driving to the right place. They walked past the line, saying that they had already reserved all the seats for today, and asked those waiting to go home, but they were clearly unhappy with this. Rose ran into the kitchen, saying that she urgently needed to call Sue because something serious was happening outside. 
Meanwhile, a real quarrel broke out between the men and the guests, and they did not understand on what basis these people were trying to get ahead of them in the queue. One of the male guards was about to swing at the guest when Sue suddenly appeared behind him and grabbed the man by the shoulders, stopping him. Then he also asked the question that interested all the guests. Who was he? Then the man shouted how dare this guy raise his hand against a civil servant while on duty. Sue replied that he just put his hand on his shoulder and he already squealed like an offended girl. The guests standing next to them immediately laughed, looking at the man. Sue said that he does not see a civil servant in front of him. He is just an arrogant brawler who is trying to get ahead of the queue. The man didn't know what to do, he cursed to himself, frantically looking around. At that moment, three more men approached him and told him to calm down. It was the same Chairman Jerry, and the man pointed out to him that he was trying to drive away the customers, but this cook prevented him. Then Jerry slapped him, saying that he should not talk to people like that and put himself above others. His behavior dishonors them all. He added that all these people had come here to eat, and they should not leave here simply because this scoundrel ordered them. And then he told the man to get out and not come into his sight again. Rose noted that the man was a very decent boss who held his subordinates with an iron grip. However, Sue for some reason doubted his integrity. Soon Jerry approached Sue. He greeted him and introduced himself as a representative of the National Culinary Association. The guests filmed their meeting on their phone cameras because the representative of the Culinary Association himself decided to personally evaluate the cooking of the king of the kitchen. Jerry shook the man's hand again, apologizing for the inconvenience caused by his subordinates, but Sue said that it was no big deal. The main thing is that at the helm of the association there is a man of honest rules, and he admired him. Then Jerry introduced the men standing behind him. He said that these foreign guests would like to appreciate the culinary art of the king of the kitchen and asked if it was possible to let them in without waiting in line. However, Sue replied that in his establishment the rules are the same for everyone, Regardless of citizenship, whoever comes first is the first to enter the establishment. But if there are extra funds in the association's budget, they could try to negotiate with the people in line and buy them places. Some people immediately contacted the chairman, saying that they were ready to sell their place in line. Lucy wondered if the chairman of the association had sent himself to the back of the line when he could have simply reserved seats for them for another day. However, Sue said that she shouldn't worry about them because the chairman didn't come here to eat, but to tarnish his reputation. When the foreign guests' turn finally came, they were able to taste the dishes of the king of cuisine, and judging by their appearance, they really liked it. Rose even doubted that they were foreigners in principle because they spoke Chinese very well. Then Jerry told her that these were employees of foreign embassies. They had been in the country for a long time, and knowing their language was part of their profession. The man noted that Sue is a real lucky man, because he has never met such beautiful waitresses even at banquets of the highest level. However, something told Sue that Jerry didn't come here to look at his waitresses, so he asked directly what he wanted from him. The man even clapped his hands. He said that it was not for nothing that the people called Sue the king of the kitchen, because he was very smart and insightful, and immediately realized that the man had come to him on business. Sue did not understand his words a little. Apparently, they had a hint that he was considered the king of the kitchen only among the people, but not at the professional level. Jerry tried to justify himself, saying that the guy misunderstood him, and he did not detract from his culinary skills. However, he added that he is after all a representative of the National Culinary Association, and Sue's qualifications have never been officially confirmed, so he cannot call him the king of the kitchen, it would be unfair to other distinguished chefs. Then Lucy asked how the title of King of the Kitchen could be confirmed. Jerry was glad that the fish had finally taken the hook and said that first it was necessary to at least confirm that Mr. Sue had made a huge contribution to the development of national cuisine. But Sue, without even letting him finish, said that he was absolutely not interested in this. And Jerry was shocked. Did the guy really just refuse his offer? He shouted that he was ready to offer him another way, but Sue told him that he did not intend to talk to him through the door and asked him to wait. Then Rose approached Jerry and said that he can be rude sometimes and asked him to forgive him. And although the man said that everything was fine, in his head he thought that for today's humiliation he would make him pay a hundredfold. 
Then Emma approached Sue and asked him what the man wanted from him. Then the man replied that in addition to greeting, he used his skill and found out that Jerry was worried that he might soon take his place, so he was looking for ways to get rid of his reputation. Emma was about to punish the man for such a terrible act, but Sue stopped her. He said that he had his own plans. He said that he had already thought of everything, because he was faced with the task of becoming famous throughout the world, and this idiot came here and thereby gave him such a chance. Then he ordered Emma that today she would watch him, and as soon as she found out what exactly he was up to, she would immediately let him know. Sue soon returned to Jerry, changed his face for interrupting their conversation, and shook his hand. He then jokingly said that they were scheduled to call a plumber tomorrow because they had no water in the toilet and he couldn't even wash his hands. He then took a wet wipe and asked the man what he wanted to talk about and what he meant by going the other way. Jerry noted that this impudent man had taken the last wet napkin and now had nothing to wipe his hands with after shaking hands. However, he continued by saying that in three days a diplomatic mission from Japan is coming to them, and the best chef in Japan, Ethan, is also coming to them, and he wants to compete in the culinary business. Then Sue clarified because according to his data, the best chef in Japan was another person. Then Jerry answered him that three months ago he became ill and died, and Ethan was his student, and they say that he even surpassed his teacher. He asked if Sue was ready to compete with him, and the guy replied that he could do it, but with one condition. But Jerry was happy with this answer, because Sue had already agreed to his test, and it was already close to destroying his reputation. However, the young man said that he agreed to compete on the condition that the venue for the competition would be his restaurant. Jerry replied that they planned to broadcast their fight to the whole world live at the National Exhibition Center level, and if the competition was held here, then things might not go according to plan. Sue then said that in that case, he would not participate, but Jerry couldn't bite this opportunity, so he had to agree to hold the competition right here at Sue's restaurant. The young man asked if such conditions suited him, to which Jerry smiled and said that everything was fine. However, Sue continued by saying that if the competition were to be broadcast to the whole world, his current facility would be too small for the jury, journalists, cameramen, and others. He added that he already had a decision, and he would need a little financial help from Jerry. He handed him a paper that was a project to expand his establishment. Sue said that he has already chosen a place in the best hotel in the city, which only remains to be purchased, and the new haven of the king of the kitchen will have marble floors, amethyst chandeliers, and golden furniture, because everything must be flawless during broadcasts. Jerry did not expect this. He said that there was no such money in the budget of their organization. But the young man only replied that in that case he would not take part in the competition, and for Jerry this was too much, so he said that he could find the money. Sue said he was very touched by the generosity and determination, adding that he had negotiated with the contractors, and all he needed was seventy million so he could start work. Soon their conversation ended, and the chairman and his partners went back to their office. Rose wondered if Sue really didn't have his own money. Why would he ask Jerry for help? But the guy said that he didn't want this adventure to cost him too little. Sitting in his car, Jerry swore at Sue, because now he had to give him seventy million, it was a real robbery. Then he called the cook, who was going to take part in the competition, and said that everything was settled. All that remained for him was to win and not disgrace his country. All this time, Emma sat in the car with Jerry and watched everything he was talking about. Jerry grinned, saying that Sue wanted as much as 70 million, but the man knew how to recoup this investment later, but the main thing was that Ethan would defeat him. Meanwhile, the day came to an end, and Sue slept peacefully in his bed at home. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, Rose approached him, she stood and watched the guy sleep. She reached out to pat his cheek. However, the guy was awake all this time. He was on guard and immediately took out a knife, thinking that a robber had broken into his room. He laid the girl on the bed, threatening her with a knife, still not realizing that Rose was in front of him. However, after a couple of moments, he realized that it was not a robber at all and asked the girl what she was doing because she was supposed to sleep in the restaurant and not go to his house. Then the girl replied that the restaurant was too dark and she was scared, so Lucy allowed her to stay here. She was just looking for a free room, 
and Sue immediately attacked her with a knife. Suddenly, Lucy herself entered the room. She said that she had literally left Rose with him for a minute, and she was already sitting all in tears. Sue hastened to justify himself, saying that he had not done anything with the girl. Lucy immediately began beating him with a pillow, not believing that Rose herself came into his room in the middle of the night. However, soon everyone calmed down. A new day began. The news said that all the public's attention was focused on the opening of the updated haven of the King of Cuisine. The doors of the new restaurant are about to open, but today people are waiting for their opening not to enjoy dishes from the King of Cuisine, but to see his culinary battle against the best chef in Japan. Jerry, driving past the reporters, noted how sick of everything he was, because all the journalists called Sue the king of the kitchen. Then the man said goodbye to Ethan, wishing him good luck and saying that he would do everything to guarantee his victory. The journalists, seeing the Japanese chef, immediately turned their attention to him. The man was heading straight towards them, and the people standing next to him commented that he was the most handsome chef in the world. The reporters noted that Ethan had already arrived at the scene, but Sue was still nowhere to be seen, probably busy with final preparations before the important fight. However, Sue at this time was simply lying in bed, surrounded by two girls. Suddenly, Emma woke him up. She said that it was time for him to wake up. The guy himself was surprised because he completely forgot that today he had to compete with a Japanese chef. Emma, seeing that Sue spent the night surrounded by two girls, grinned, saying how quickly they agreed to this. However, Sue said that there was nothing between them and asked if she had learned anything interesting from Jerry. But the ghost girl was at a loss whether her master had forgotten everything. When she told him that today was the day of his fight with the Japanese chef, the guy was in shock. He completely forgot about it. Meanwhile, everything in the restaurant was already ready for the fight. There were only five minutes left before the start of the competition, but Sue never showed up. The jury whispered, not understanding what was happening. Did he really decide not to appear? This threatened a real scandal. Jerry just grinned, because if Sue was late, he would immediately announce his defeat, and the journalists would trash him. The host said that there was only a minute left, and if Sue still didn't show up, the jury would have to declare Ethan the winner. However, the assembled reporters noticed that Sue had already arrived. The guy, surrounded by his bodyguards, confidently headed to the place of the fight. Ethan just grinned as he looked at his opponent. The presenter immediately ran up to Sue and asked why he decided to appear only at the last minute. Was this really some form of psychological pressure on his opponent? But Sue decided to answer honestly. He simply said that he overslept and then apologized. However, journalists interpreted this differently. They said that with his frivolous attitude towards competition, he puts pressure on his opponent shows that he is so superior to him that he is even going to beat him while sleeping. Sue tried to explain that everything was actually wrong, but no one was listening to him. But Ethan was furious because he was humiliated in front of such a huge audience. Then Jerry asked the spectators and journalists to remain quiet. The competition was starting now, and they should not distract the respected chefs. And since Sue had finally arrived, Jerry could announce the start of the competition, then he asked the participants to ask their assistants to bring them food. Rose, Lucy, and Sue looked at each other frantically because they had not prepared anything. Sue only yawned in response to this, and the audience did not understand why even now he was in no hurry. Meanwhile, Ethan's assistant had already brought in the ingredients for his dish. Everyone was wondering what they would cook from today. Everyone froze in anticipation when the woman threw the screen off the tray. A wonderful picture opened before the audience. They realized that the basis of his dish would be chilled golden lacquerade. They also noted that this is a special type of lacedra, which can be caught no more than 100 times per season. Moreover, its length is 80 centimeters, which makes it the most elite product. The presenter added that Ethan prepared thoroughly for the competition, sparing no expense on ingredients of the highest quality, and then they wondered how the king of the kitchen would answer him, whether he would be able to amaze the audience with his approach to business. Then Sue went to Ethan's desk, apparently intending to tell him something. He carefully examined the fish that Ethan had brought. He said that judging by the length, weight, and freshness, such a fish cost him three million. At least he seriously invested in this event. Then he said that he still wouldn't need such a huge fish in its entirety and asked to cut off a piece for him. 
but Ethan resolutely refused him. The young man calmly turned away from him and left, saying that he shouldn't be so nervous. The presenter did not understand what Sue was trying to achieve. Did he really want to borrow some of Ethan's products, because this was unprecedented for culinary competitions, but perhaps it was just another psychological trick? Viewers noted that apparently the technique worked, because Ethan's face showed unconcealed irritation. Walking over to his desk, Sue called out to Rose and Lucy, asking them to go to the kitchen and see what they had in the refrigerator. Then Lucy said that there was no fresh food there, only what was left over from yesterday, but Rose said that it was still better than nothing. Soon, the girls went to the refrigerator and brought their boss everything they found there, several types of vegetables and one fish. Lucy wasn't sure if this would be enough and suggested going to the store, but Sue said that it would be enough. Then he asked the girls to take a place among the spectators. Looking at Sue's ingredients, Ethan just grinned. Was he really going to cook dishes from this? With these ingredients, there would be no chance against him. But Sue only replied that millions of people around the world eat something like this every day and isn't a chef's job to prepare food for people. The guests were delighted with the chef's response, saying that the king of the kitchen was striving to gain popularity among the masses. However, Ethan was sure that the support of the audience would not help him, because today he was going to show the whole world that Japanese culinary art has no equal. Soon the presenter announced the start of the competition. She noted that Ethan's knife felt sharper than any razor, cutting through the fish like butter as if it were boneless. Looking at Sue, she noted that he cut his fish with one swing of the knife. His mastery of cold objects was truly mesmerizing. The jury noted that neither participant was inferior to the other. Both were real geniuses. Jerry reflected that if the outcome of this competition was determined solely by their skills, he would be in serious trouble. After some time, Ethan's dish was ready. He presented the jury with sashimi and winter licorice according to his secret recipe. The spectators were shocked, apparently. After cutting, he managed to put the fish back together so that it looked as if it had not been cut at all. He cut the fish into thin shreds and preserved its original appearance, thereby preserving the original taste of the fish and its freshness, creating an amazing gastronomic experience. Having tried Ethan's dish, the jury noted that the fish simply melted in the mouth and felt incredibly fresh, and Jerry asked what the secret ingredient was used to preserve the taste. However, without waiting for an answer, all the jury rushed to give their points. The decision was unanimous. They awarded the maximum score. The presenter noted that in this case, Sue could only hope for a draw, but such an end to the competition would put an end to his reputation as the king of the kitchen. Ethan taunted Sue, saying that he destroyed him and it was completely easy for him. However, Sue advised him not to rush and wait until people appreciate his dish. He asked his waiters to hand over the food to the jury members. Then Lucy asked if everything was okay with the dish, and Sue confidently replied that she had nothing to worry about. He said that he had prepared homemade fish soup from carp. Soon the jury opened the plate and saw an incredibly beautiful dish in front of them. Then Sue asked them to try it. Ethan laughed, because for the competition of his life Sue prepared ordinary fish soup, it was absolutely pathetic, and he was even a little ashamed of it. Then Sue suggested that his opponent be silent for a while, because he was already pretty tired of him with his comments. The presenter noted that preparing such a simple homemade dish at a competition of this level could indeed become a key miscalculation. Meanwhile, the judges tried Sue's dish, but no one was in a hurry to comment. The presenter did not understand what was happening. Was the dish really so bad that no one wanted to evaluate it? Suddenly, one of the jury members burst into tears. He said that this soup was perfect, as if he had tasted the food of the gods. The presenter was shocked. No one could have predicted such an ending. Even the judges consider themselves unworthy to evaluate the dishes of the king of the kitchen. Thus, they express their agreement that Sue is the uncrowned king. However, the story did not end there. One of the jury members gave the dish nine points. It was Jerry. He said that the taste could be better, so the dish does not deserve the maximum score. Grinning, he said that the king would remain uncrowned. The presenter noted that this whole situation was very strange because being the chairman of the National Association of Culinary Specialists, everyone expected that Jerry would rather tip towards his compatriot, but it was the other way around. 
Then Jerry said that although he is the chairman of the National Culinary Association, he is first and foremost a cook, and the essence of the competition was to determine which of the two chefs was the strongest, and he was obliged to objectively evaluate the dish, so his assessment was absolutely honest and unbiased. Sue just clapped his hands, imitating the man, and said that he admired his high moral qualities. He said they couldn't be sure that they didn't know Ethan before and didn't set up his victory. Jerry just grinned, saying that this was just utter stupidity and that until today he had not even met Mr. Ethan. Sue then pulled out his phone to show Jerry the recording of him telling the Japanese chef that he had to destroy Sue. Jerry was incredibly surprised. How could this guy get this record? Soon this video was shown all over the news. In it, Jerry said that he needed to get rid of the king of the kitchen, then he would do him a huge favor. The presenter shouted that it was incredible, because the chairman of the National Association conspired with the enemy side, and even became involved in the murder of the former best chef in Japan. Ethan immediately screamed. He did not expect that his machinations would be so easily discovered, and the victory taken away right from under his nose. When he realized that he had no other choice, he attacked Sue with a knife, intending to kill him. The presenter wanted to stop the attacker because she had her back to him and could not see him. Ethan shouted that by destroying him, the guy had signed his own death warrant and already raised his hand to hit the guy with a knife. However, he didn't even have time to hit the guy before he dodged and grabbed his knife with two fingers. The presenter was in complete shock. She couldn't believe that Sue stopped the knife attack from behind with just two fingers. The next moment, the guy broke the knife in half with one movement of his hand. Ethan couldn't believe his eyes, because this knife was made of thousand-year-old meteorite iron, and he broke it with just his fingers. But before he could finish speaking, Sue immediately slapped him in the face, throwing the guy away from him. Everyone present was shocked, and Sue only looked at the attacker with contempt, saying that in this way he answered his question. Journalists began filming Ethan. They noted the terrible condition he was in from just one blow. Sue then went to the jury table, asking Jerry if he had anything left to say. Jerry just grinned and said that he was great for being so well prepared for this fake duel, but he shouldn't rejoice too early, because his connections and influence are great, and in a couple of days he will be back to his new job. He threatened that then he would seriously begin to settle scores with him, and even if Sue could stand up for himself, he would not be able to protect his girls 24 hours a day. He began to provoke the guy, saying that he could hit him, and then the journalists would record it on their cameras. The man said he got away with hitting Ethan, but if he hit him, he could say goodbye to his reputation forever. However, the reporters had no intention of filming it and simply turned off their cameras while watching what was happening, and Sue said that initially he did not intend to get his hands dirty about him. But now Jerry crossed the line and began to threaten him. Then Jerry hastened to apologize, saying that he didn't mean it and he shouldn't bother with the law. But it was too late. Sue swung his hand and immediately hit Jerry right in the face, causing him to fall from his chair. All the news was saying that the former chairman of the National Culinary Association on suspicion of murder had finally been brought to trial, and Sue, who had won Chef Ethan's cooking competition, was now officially recognized as the king of the kitchen. Meanwhile, evening came, Sue sat in his room, thinking that the video about the competition had already created a stir on the internet, so worldwide fame was just around the corner at this rate the task would be counted. Suddenly, Lucy entered his room and asked if he was awake. Then the girl said that they had come to generously reward the guy for his triumphant victory. At first, the guy was happy that his girlfriend had finally decided to take the initiative herself, but he wondered if she had just said, we. Rose followed her into the room. Soon morning came. Sue woke up surrounded by two girls. He did not believe what was happening thinking that he was all dreaming. He pinched his cheek, and then he realized that it was all real. Then he got out of bed and looked at the two lying girls, deciding that he was a real lucky guy. Lucy woke up after him. She asked him where he was going so early, to which Sue said that he would make breakfast, and also said that he did not understand why she did this. Lucy was a little indignant. She said that he deserved it, and so she decided to do it. When the guy went into the kitchen, the girl looked tenderly after him. She then leaned over to Rose and told her not to pretend to be asleep. Rose immediately covered her face with a blanket. She didn't understand how to behave when they were talking about such topics in her presence, 
She didn't even know how to look into his eyes. The girl felt like a third wheel. Then Lucy hugged her tenderly and told her not to worry, because she had already come to terms with the fact that Sue is too extraordinary a guy, many girls like him, and all Lucy could do before him was choose girls according to her taste earlier than he will do it. She smiled and said that from now on they can be considered sisters. Then Rose said that in her opinion, Secretary Sue also cares about him, and they need to come up with a plan if she suddenly wants to join them. While Lucy was thinking about not wanting this situation to get out of control, Sue was calmly preparing breakfast in the kitchen. Emma suddenly appeared behind him, and Sue asked why she had been so sour since the morning. Then the ghost girl screamed that all this was unfair because she made the biggest contribution to his victory, but he spent the night with Rose and Lucy, and not with her. Then Sue asked if she really had her sights set on him too. He told her to accept that they could never be together, and even if they liked each other, nothing would happen between them since they were from different worlds. Emma was offended. She did not expect that he considered her unworthy just because she was a ghost. The guy wanted to explain that this was not what he meant, but the girl had already started crying and flew away from the kitchen. The young man did not understand how to react to this. Not only was Emma a teenager, she was also a ghost. It was very difficult to be with her. However, suddenly a program appeared in front of him. She congratulated him on the completed task, and as a reward gave him a permanent skill, cooking Chinese dishes to perfection, and then Sue asked to extract a new personality. The system reported that the new personality will be a paranormal detective who, from birth, is different from ordinary people. He can hear the voices of the dead. Using this ability, he cracks unsolved cases like seeds and has already become a legend of the detective world. His return to the path of solving crimes does not bode well for the villains, and his assignment was to help the police solve three crimes within two weeks. Meanwhile, there was complete confusion in the city. Employees could not understand who was committing the crimes. The deputy head of the department told his colleagues that after a whole week of investigations into this case, they had made no progress, and this could not continue. They needed to brainstorm and carefully study every detail again in order to find a clue. One of the workers was perplexed at the crime scene. There was complete devastation. During the autopsy of the expert's body, they didn't find anything. There wasn't a single camera around but they had to look for clues. Another man said that they were at a dead end and he should contact the best master of this matter. A colleague asked him that their special group had not found anything in a week of work. Was anyone else really capable of doing this? Then the man asked if they had ever heard the legend about a detective who can hear the dead and the guy was completely shocked. Was he really talking about a paranormal detective? The men looked at each other. They did not believe that he really existed. Everyone thought that these were just rumors or a character from horror stories. However, the man said that many years ago he was lucky enough to meet him. Then he helped him successfully solve cases that turned out to be difficult at that time, and he was ready to swear that this was not fiction. Then the guy said that he believed him, but nevertheless, the detective had not been heard for so many years. Where to look for him? Then the man told them to leave this case to him, until recently, he also considered him missing, until he found out that all this time he had been living in their city and now leads a fairly decent life. Soon, the man and his boss, Matt, arrived at the building where Sue worked. It was a huge skyscraper, and Matt couldn't believe that the paranormal detective worked for the Ching International Company. When they wanted to go inside, a guard stopped them and asked who they wanted to see. The man said that they came from the investigation department and wanted to talk to President Sue. The security guard asked them to wait a little, and then Matt grabbed his partner Stephen by the hand and said that he was crazy. Would the president of such a corporation agree to meet with them? Moreover, the mayor himself makes an appointment with him for a whole six months in advance. Meanwhile, Sue sat in his office, surrounded by Lucy, Rose, and Sue, who poured him tea. Rose noted that Sue apparently also has designs on Sue. Then Lucy said that they need to act. They must not lose to her. The girls immediately approached the young man, asking if he wanted to relax a little. The guy blushed and said that he didn't seem tired, but he felt a lot of tension in the air. Lucy continued, was it possible for him not to be at all tired after being in the office for so long, and offered to massage his shoulders, and Rose wanted to massage his legs. 
Sue was perplexed, not understanding what was happening here, and said that she would rather leave them and asked to call her if she was needed. However, Grant suddenly burst into the office. He said that the police had come for their boss, and he had to be immediately taken out through the back door. Sue wondered what the police wanted from him. However, Grant quickly grabbed his hands, saying that he did not have time to explain. The guy was trying to stop him, because he was a law-abiding citizen. He had nothing to fear. Nevertheless, the bodyguard continued to drag his boss to the back door and only finally told the forces that the guests should rise and ask to place them in the guest room. Soon the men went up to the office, and Matt noted that here, most likely, they would only waste time. They should abandon this idea. He said that this man had not been known in the investigative world for many years, which meant that he wanted this side of him to remain a secret, and they went straight to his boss. Then Stephen said that they should calm down because soon the man himself would understand everything. The next moment, Sue entered the office with his secretary, Sue. He apologized for keeping the men waiting. Matt immediately rushed towards him to shake his hand. He said that there was nothing wrong with them waiting a little. Then the guy asked how he could help. However, Matt didn't know what to say. But then Stephen joined the conversation. He froze with his mouth open unable to believe his eyes that the detective had not changed at all after so many years. Matt didn't understand what was happening. Could Sue really be that detective? When everyone calmed down, Stephen explained that 13 years ago, a complex case he was investigating was solved solely thanks to the detective. His group would not have been able to catch the villain without his help. He said that since then, the detective had disappeared without a trace, and recently he saw a report on TV about the King of the Kitchen, who also turned out to be the president of an international company, and it was absolutely incredible. Sue added that he was also a fortune teller, but Sue decided not to focus on this, saying that he had too many hobbies and asked why the men still came to him. Then Matt said that they came to him because they themselves could not solve one case. He asked if Sue had heard from the triple murder or the so-called case 513, realizing that he was too young to be a tough detective and needed to be checked. Sue said that he had not heard anything about this case, and Stephen handed him the papers where all the materials were collected and asked the guy to familiarize himself with them. Matt said that on the evening of May 13th, a terrible event occurred in a suburban village. A family of three was killed and their house was robbed. A woman was gang-raped and beaten before her death, a man was stabbed 18 times and a five-year-old child was simply crushed. Sue could not believe his eyes. He had no idea how cruel people could be. Stephen said that they conducted a comprehensive investigation into the case, but the events took place in a remote village where there were no cameras on the night of the crime, and it was also raining, so it is possible that the traces of the house were washed away. He also added that they had four suspects, but basically the case was completely silent. They still could not budge, and he was very ashamed in front of the victims. Sue then asked if the men wanted him to help them with the investigation, and they said they would be very happy to do so. The guy said that he could help them, but first he would like to see the corpses. Soon the men arrived at the morgue, and Stephen asked if it was worth calling a forensic doctor to provide a report. But Sue only pulled back the blanket covering the bodies of the dead victims and said that this was not necessary. Matt was shocked, doesn't he really need a forensic doctor? Because he won't be able to understand anything without his conclusion. Will he really autopsy the corpse himself? However, Sue used his skill, the ability to hear the dead. He touched his fingers to the dead man's forehead to read his thoughts. Sue said that he would help him take revenge for his family's suffering, but he would have to tell him everything he knew. The men were perplexed. Had the young man really come here just to touch the corpse? Then Stephen asked if he wanted to touch the other victims, but Sue said that would be unnecessary. He said the deceased had already provided him with key information, and now he had to be taken to the crime scene. Matt couldn't believe his eyes. Was this all Sue was going to do? The young man heard the rage and pain of the dead man and swore to him that those four criminals would not escape punishment. Soon the men arrived at the house where the crime took place. Stephen said that the entire family was killed inside the house. The man was left lying at the door, and then the investigator asked Sue to enter the house, but he did not intend to do so. He said that he needed to look around here first. The men said that they carefully combed the area with vegetables, 
due to heavy rain, the soul prints were broken and unsuitable for analysis, and no foreign objects were found. However, the young man, as if succumbing to an inner impulse, climbed up the vegetable garden, ignoring Stephen's cries that it was pure dirt. Suddenly he stopped, picked up something from the ground, carefully wrapping the object with a napkin. It turned out to be a cigarette butt. Sue saw on it the brand of an expensive cigarette company, Matt was amazed. He knew that the deceased did not smoke at all, and this cigarette butt apparently belonged to one of the criminals. Sue handed the cigarette butt to Stephen, emphasizing that DNA could still be extracted from the filter and demanded that it be sent to the laboratory. When the men were alone, Matt asked Sue how he was able to find such important evidence, to which the guy replied that the deceased told him that before his death, he saw one of the villains drop a cigarette butt and then tried hard to press it deeper into the ground. Matt was amazed it turns out that this man really has mystical powers, when business was over, Sue went to the gym to train, but then he received a call. When he picked up the phone, Stephen told him that thanks to the cigarette butt, they were able to determine that the suspects were indeed murderers, and they were planned to be captured that evening. He invited Sue to participate, and he was not at all opposed. The guy also decided to take Emma with him. The girl thought that they were going to have fun, but Sue said that this was a serious matter, and he would need her help. Soon they arrived at the right place and were met by Stephen. He said that four criminals were hiding in that building. They wanted to ambush them, but the villains turned out to be more cunning and took a hostage. Sue advised them not to despair ahead of time, saying that he would think of something. The police shouted into their bullhorns for the criminals to drop their weapons and surrender. Matt, meanwhile, scolded the employees for their mistake, and at that moment Sue and Stephen approached him. The man shook the detective's hand, apologizing that they had lost their opportunity, and also said that these bastards were holding an eight-year-old girl hostage, so the police could not use force. Matt said they were on the fifth floor. Sue said that he would go up to them to negotiate and exchange himself for the girl. The men couldn't believe their ears. Did he really want to carry out a hostage exchange? Matt tried to dissuade him, saying that they had no right to involve him in such a dangerous adventure. But Sue did not listen to them. He silently walked past them, heading towards the building. Suddenly, he punched the wall and it cracked, shattering into rocks. Stephen was still in doubt because Sue is a famous person. He couldn't let anything happen to him. But Matt replied that precisely because of this, criminals would not see him as a threat. His fame would lull their vigilance. Meanwhile, Sue and the special forces were climbing the stairs, and the criminals were shouting, demanding that the car be driven to them. Otherwise, they would kill the girl. Then the guy went ahead of the special forces, asking them to leave this matter to him. He raised his hands and greeted the villains, thanking them for looking after the girl. The men were perplexed. Who else is this? Sue said that he is the president of Chin Company. The criminals couldn't believe their eyes. It was really that same Sue. However, one of the men shouted at him, not understanding why he came there. Then Sue said that the hostage was his relative and offered her five million to release her. However, the man was not going to let her go, saying that the police were outside, and they were not going to go to them even for 50 million, and then invited the guy to change places with the girl. Sue just smiled, accepting the deal. The criminals were perplexed. They could not believe that he had so easily agreed to become a hostage. When the girl was released, the man put a knife to Sue's throat. The guy chuckled, saying that it was much better to have a billionaire hostage than a little girl. Meanwhile, the baby had already run out of the room straight to her mother, still crying in fear. However, the criminal did not understand what this guy was up to. Then Sue said that it was better for them to have a conversation without unnecessary ears and asked Emma to close the door. The next moment, the door actually slammed shut. The criminal screamed. He didn't understand what game Sue was playing with them and promised to kill him right now. The young man, seeing how the man's hands were shaking, only began to egg him on. The next moment, he jumped off the sofa right from under the blade of the knife. A moment later, he struck the villain right in the face, forcing him to fly to the side. His companions immediately rushed toward Sue, intending to kill him. However, the guy easily dodged every blow from the villains. He intended to beat them, thus avenging the murdered family. Soon, everyone was already knocked out. Only one criminal remained. But Sue wasn't going to let him go so easily either. He dealt him a crushing blow to the head as revenge for taking a little girl hostage. 
Soon, when all the scoundrels were on the floor unable to fight, Sue only wiped his fists with his glove. The men did not understand who this Sue was and why he was so strong. Then he leaned over to one of the criminals, saying that he was simply a responsible citizen with a heightened sense of justice. But the other scoundrel shouted that he would not admit his guilt even under torture, and when one of them was released, there would be no trace left of Sue's company. The young man only looked contemptuously towards the plump man. He continued, saying that if he decides to kill them here and now, then he will not excuse himself and will sit down himself. But Sue only said that death would be too easy a punishment for them, and asked Emma to deal with these criminals. Soon he left the apartment. There were special forces outside the door. They were ready to break in, but Sue told them not to go in there yet. The criminals did not understand why he left. Was he really up to something? And then it was Emma's turn. She flew right over the men's heads, and they didn't even understand what that sound was. Then the girl flew up to one of them and blew on his shoulder, causing him to roar in fear. The special forces only looked in bewilderment at the door from behind which the screams were coming out. Soon the news reported that the sensational case 513 had finally been solved. The perpetrators had been detained and were in a terrible mental state. Matt replied that, in his opinion, the culprits were tormented by their conscience and they began to see nightmares in reality. Sue noted that if this version had not been told by the police chief, few would have believed it. Suddenly, Emma landed directly in Sue's lap, asking if she had done a good job. The guy replied that everything went just fine, and then the girl asked him for a reward. She smiled, saying that if he didn't reward her, she would never speak to him again. Then Sue, hoping that she would not suck the life out of him, kissed her tenderly. But Emma wanted more. She threw the guy with his back on the sofa and sat on top of him. Her face turned red. She said that she wanted Sue, but he didn't know what to do. He was even a little afraid that the girl would take her by force. She said that she also wanted what Sue's girlfriends got and began to take off his clothes. However, at that moment, someone called the guy, and he used this as a good excuse to stop the girl's advances. It was Sue, and the guy said she called at just the right time. But suddenly, a woman's voice from the phone screamed. The girl begged for President Sue to save her. The girl herself was just heading home after work. It was already late in the evening. Suddenly, she noticed a suspicious man in black clothes and a cap following her. She immediately turned into the park, hoping to escape from her pursuer, but he was not going to let her go. He followed right behind her through the deserted streets, closing the distance between them with every step. Suddenly, he took a rag soaked in a sleeping substance from his pocket and grabbed the girl tightly. He held the cloth to her nose, forcing her to inhale the substance. And then suddenly, a car stopped behind them and Sue and Grant got out. Then the guy took out a knife and put it to Sue's throat, who was already in a semi-fainting state. However, Sue in an instant closed the distance between him and the criminal, deftly snatching the knife from him and pointing it at the man. Soon the scoundrel was already tied up and taken to the basement, where Sue interrogated him. He asked why he wanted to deprive the girl of consciousness. The guy tried to laugh it off, saying that he was just broke and wanted to rob her. But Sue understood that he was lying and for lying, he mercilessly plunged a knife right into his leg, causing the criminal to scream. The guy was going to give the scoundrel one last chance to confess everything. And then the guy said that he wanted to knock her out and then abuse her. He also said that he had done this six times already, but asked for mercy. He promised that he would surrender to the police. Then Grant said that he had recently seen on the news that six corpses of women with torn clothes and bruises on their bodies were found around the city. All of them were raped before death, and apparently this guy was the culprit. Sue said that turning himself in would not bring back the six lives lost. The man was responsible for the suffering of six women, and Sue was going to exact the full amount from him for it. Turning around, the young man ordered to find six strong guys for the criminal and leave him with them. Sue then left the building and headed to his car. Sue was waiting for him there. She was still shocked by what had happened, but the guy rushed to reassure her that she was now safe. He understood that the girl was very scared and taking her to an empty apartment would be too cruel. Then Sue invited her to spend the night with him. Soon they arrived at the guy's home, where Lucy and Rose were already waiting for them. They were surprised that the young man had brought his secretary with him. Sue took the girl to the guest bedroom, saying that it would be safe for her here.
and he himself would be behind the wall if she needed anything. Then Sue threw herself into the arms of the young man, asking him to stay with her. When morning came, Sue walked out of the guest bedroom, stretching. Lucy stood around the corner, furiously waving her knives, trying to kill the annoying fly. Sue was perplexed. How did she even think of hunting flies with cutlasses? But as soon as he entered the kitchen, Rose immediately poured boiling water on him. She said she was cooking breakfast and needed to empty the pan of excess water. At that moment, Lucy approached him from behind. She quietly asked why Sue brought his secretary to their home, because he already had two girls. Apparently, the girls seriously intended to take revenge on the guy for such an outburst. Even though he said there was nothing between him and Sue, they didn't listen. When the fight was over, everyone got ready and went about their business. Lucy headed to the university, but while she was walking with her classmates, she saw something unexpected. A car stopped in front of her and Sue came out with a bouquet of flowers. However, the girl simply walked past him without saying anything to him. Sue sighed. Sometimes it was very difficult with this girl. Lucy thought to herself that she was not going to forgive him for the sake of some broom. Suddenly, the guy picked up the girl and carried her in his arms. The students looked after the couple with admiration. Lucy screamed for Sue to let her go, but he just silently carried her forward. Soon he brought the girl to the cafe, asking if she was still sulking, but Lucy just snorted. Then Sue continued to explain. He said that nothing really happened last night. However, Lucy did not want to hear anything. Grant, who watched all this, noted that even his tough boss had to bow down to the girl. Then he noticed that his partner was using a phone, but it was a different model, an older one. The boy replied that this was the phone of yesterday's maniac. He decided to check it before throwing it into the river. Grant immediately snatched his cell phone from him, saying that the police could track them using it, and then the boss would be in big trouble. Suddenly, the man's eyes were caught by something on the phone screen. Just a few moments later, Grant flew into the restaurant, interrupting the conversation between Sue and Lucy. He handed the boss the phone and said that something interesting was hidden. While Sue was looking at his phone, Grant told him that he had already sent people to comb the area. Apparently, the scoundrel left here as soon as he took the photo, and it was not possible to find him. On the phone screen was a photo of Lucy and Sue taken just a couple of minutes ago, and under it there was a caption that said that a new target had been found. Soon Sue and the girl left the establishment and headed home. The guy asked her to just walk forward without looking around. Grant, watching from the bushes, asked his partners if they had found anything, but no pursuers were found within 200 meters. Apparently the criminal had already escaped long ago. When everyone reached Sue's house, Grant informed the boss that today his best guys would personally ensure his safety. Sue realized that yesterday's maniac did not work alone, and the remaining five still did not know that one of them was no longer alive and sent a new target to the group. He grinned. These guys were really in trouble, and with their help, he would complete his task. Grant suggested sending a message to the group to test the waters there, but Sue said that so far only one of them had written. The rest were silent and it was better for him not to write anything either so as not to scare them off ahead of time. The bodyguard swore this maniac turned out to be so prudent that he even cleared the history of all correspondence. Sue then asked if his body could still be found, and the man replied that they put it in a cage and threw it into the river, but it could be fished out. The guy said that they needed to go to him. He wanted to talk with the maniac. Soon they arrived at the river and the men pulled out an iron cage from which algae was already hanging. The corpse smelled terribly of rot, but Sue didn't mind that much. He touched the hand of the deceased. His plan was to use the skill of speaking with the dead and look at his memories. Soon Sue saw fragments of his memories, in which some men in animal masks kidnapped and raped girls. Then he realized that the criminals, apparently, did not even know each other's identities. They met on the internet and knew each other only by nicknames, and when someone found a suitable victim, they sent her photo to a general chat. Now it became clear to Sue why no one wrote to the group. Everyone was waiting for him to answer. Then he wrote a message saying that he had beaten their next victim and that tomorrow they were going to visit her. The rest immediately responded. Some were scared because the partner had not been in touch for a long time, and the rest were in anticipation of the next victim. Grant offered to kill them immediately upon meeting, but Sue wanted them to stand trial and answer according to the law. He understood that he needed to solve two more cases and the beast was running towards the hunter.
The next day, the group gathered near Sue's cottage, the men carefully watching the girl's silhouette in the window. They wanted to make sure that they had come to the right place because their partner, the rat, was still missing. Suddenly, a man with a mouse mask appeared behind them. He told them to follow him. The criminals were impatient. They really wanted to have fun with the victim. Soon, the company had already entered the house. A man dressed in a rat costume was leading the others to the right place. They made their way through the corridors to the room where the girl was. Suddenly, pistols were pointed at the head of one of the group members. A moment later, the lights in the corridor turned on, and the criminals saw that they were surrounded by a crowd of armed guards. Grant, holding a cardboard silhouette of a girl in his hands, said that these guys clearly came to the wrong house for their pranks. Soon the criminals were taken to the basement, tied up and hung on ropes, and the men, realizing that they were in a hopeless situation, began to beg for mercy, saying that they only wanted to steal something valuable. They also noticed that there was no rat with them. Some suggested that it was he who turned them in. At that moment, the corpse of a red-haired man was dragged into the room, leaving behind a trail of blood. The men threw the body on the floor and next to it the rat mask. The criminals were shocked. They did not understand why their partner was beaten to such a state, but Grant told them that they would have to pay for their atrocities. Then the men began to wonder why their comrade was not moving. Grant kicked him, thereby indicating that the man was already dead. The criminals screamed, calling the man a murderer, but Grant said that they were the only murderers here. The man said that before his death, the rat confessed that he managed to take part in the murder of six women, so the rest of the criminals also deserved the same fate. He added that the fortune teller predicted to him that this year he should not kill more than five people, otherwise it would bring him bad luck. Therefore, he invited the criminals to choose who deserves death least of all, and he will spare him. Each of the men began to shout that he was the one worthy of freedom, and nevertheless, none of them wanted to die, so the men began to list the sins of their comrades. Out of anger, they swayed from side to side, trying to shut each other up. Grant looked at all this with contempt, noting what rare bastards he had come across. When the argument finally ended, he asked if anyone else wanted to add any details about their crimes. However, one of the criminals understood that Grant was not going to let anyone go, so he asked him to stop torturing them. The man responded that he is a law-abiding citizen. Murder is not his method. At this moment, Sue and Matt entered the room, and the company president asked if these scoundrels had talked enough about each other. Then Matt said that their words were enough to give them 800 death sentences. He ordered all suspects to be taken to the station. Once the situation was settled, Sue could rest peacefully with his girlfriend Lucy and tell her about how these criminals worked. At that moment, Lucy's mother came home, and the girl hurried to move away from the guy, not wanting to advertise their relationship. Mia said that she was going to cook fish for her daughter and Sue, but the guy said that he himself had come to invite everyone to eat at the restaurant together. But the woman had her own plans. She believed that there was nothing better than home-cooked food, because after the wedding, Sue would not take Lucy to a restaurant every time. The girl immediately answered her mother that she was still too young to get married. The mother replied that one day she would have to grow up, and then called her daughter into her kitchen to help her cook. But Lucy said that she would rather show Sue her room. Realizing that she would not get help from her daughter, Mia called her son. Meanwhile, Sue and Lucy came to her room, and the guy wondered why they were there because he had already seen her room. He was about to invite the girl to go and help her mother, when suddenly she threw him onto the bed, she said that if Sue continues to make her angry, she will punish him. When it was all over, the guy went downstairs where Louis was already waiting for him. He was unhappy that he and his sister were doing such indecent things while her relatives were sitting on the first floor. Sue hurried to change the topic by suggesting they watch TV. The news reported that the president of a large corporation, Albert, was released from the courtroom due to lack of evidence. Louis said that this bastard slept with his subordinate's wife, then forced him to commit suicide, and now the court has set him free. Albert was extremely pleased he gave interviews, saying that law and justice had triumphed. Suddenly, from somewhere in the crowd, an egg flew at him, smashing on his head. It was the mother of the same employee whom Albert forced to commit suicide, and she was furious when she learned the court's decision. While the young assistant was wiping Albert's face, the man said that the court had already acquitted him, so she shouldn't throw false accusations. 
He leaned over to the woman and said that he would pay her compensation for the loss of her breadwinner. After that, he walked towards his car, hugging his assistant, laughing contentedly. Louis was furious. Is there really nothing that can be done about such monsters? Sue just silently looked at the TV. Some kind of plan was clearly brewing in his head. However, the workday came, and Sue went to his office where Matt and police officer Thomas wanted to see him. Matt wanted to apologize to the young man because he helped them solve two major crimes, and the public doesn't even know about it. But Sue didn't see anything wrong with this, because he himself was ready to help exclusively on the condition of anonymity. Then Matt introduced him to the police chief, Officer Thomas. Sue asked if he came here because of Albert's matter. Thomas was surprised by the man's insight. Sue just chuckled. Albert committed a serious crime, but was released right in the courtroom, and Thomas must be seething with indignation, so he decided to come here for help. The man confirmed his guess, saying that he and his colleagues felt like idiots after such an unfair decision. As luck would have it, Sue wanted the same thing, so he asked the men to fill them in on the matter. Thomas said that the deceased's name was Joseph. He was 32 years old. Before his death, he worked at the Albert Corporation as a senior sales manager, and his wife's name was Leah. She was a beauty. About six months ago, Joseph began to often fly on business trips abroad on behalf of management. He believed that his superiors believed in him, since they trusted him with such important work. But one day his flight was rescheduled for another day. He returned home and accidentally discovered something terrible. For the last six months, his wife has been cheating on him with Albert, and he was sent on business trips just to get him out of the house. Yosef made a lot of noise in the office, wanting to achieve retribution, but since then no one has seen him, Everyone thought that Albert invited him to leave quietly and gave him a lot of money for the journey. The police didn't even know about this story until his body was found. Sue then realized that Albert was the prime suspect since he had both motive and opportunity. Thomas confirmed his words. However, before he could finish speaking, he received a call saying that Joseph's mother had been shot down to death. Sue thought that this bastard did not even spare that poor old lady. As it turned out, the driver escaped and his car was found in the river. Sue suddenly jumped up, calling Sue into the office. He asked her to book a room in the best hotel in the city where Albert lived. In two hours, he would have a meeting there. Thomas was perplexed, because this city was at least five hours away from here. However, Sue said that he was so angry that he could not bear it for so long. It was decided to go to the city by helicopter. Sue said that she had already called Albert's secretary and told him about the upcoming meeting. She doubted whether the man would actually want to visit her, but Sue was sure that he would not have the courage to refuse. Meanwhile, Albert was relaxing in his office. The secretary told him that the issue with the driver had been resolved. There were no leads that could lead to the boss. Then the man said that the girl had worked hard and she should be rewarded for that. She also said that they received a call from Ching's company asking for a meeting. Albert wondered why Sue suddenly decided to meet him. He asked the girl if they were connected by any matters other than purely commercial ones. The secretary confirmed his words and suggested that he ignore the meeting and instead do something more pleasant. However, these words angered Albert because their company would not be able to stay afloat for long. They would simply spit in Sue's face and refuse. The girl hastened to apologize for the stupidity she said. Albert thought about it because the business of the Ching International Corporation was a hundred times larger than him. Such people should not be refused a meeting. However, he still felt there was a catch. He didn't want to go, but he had to, so he decided to hope for the best. After a while, Sue, Sue, Matt, and Thomas were already waiting for Albert in the dining room. Unlike the others, Sue was confident that he would definitely come to meet him. The next moment, there was a knock on the door and the businessman came inside greeting the young man and saying that he had brought his best wine with him. Sue only said indifferently that he was not interested in alcohol. Then Albert replied that in that case he had another gift. He called someone and the next moment a girl entered the room. She was dressed in a very revealing costume and had bunny ears on her head. Albert said that she was very smart and affectionate, and he could give her to Sue as a tribute to him. The guy just grinned saying that this girl was very far from his secretary and asked Sue to demonstrate what a real good employee should look like. Then the girl stood up from the table so that everyone could have a good look at her. She looked amazing. Albert immediately became interested in her, starting to stare at her. 
The guest noted that Sue manages to look her best even in a business suit. When Albert realized that all his gifts were in the air, he invited Sue to drink tea. However, as soon as he handed over the teapot, the young man immediately covered his glass with his palm. Matt and Thomas were delighted with the way this young man humiliated his interlocutor. Albert didn't understand what Mr. Sue meant by this. The young man only replied that he would not risk drinking what the man poured for him. Otherwise, there was a chance that he would end up like Joseph's mother. Albert contorted his face, pretending that he didn't understand what he was talking about. Sue then stood up from the table, intending to explain his words differently. He grabbed the man by the shoulder, telling him that he might try to kill him, as he did today with the mother of his deceased subordinate. Sue took advantage of the moment and used his mind-reading skill on the man. Albert immediately moved away from the guy, saying that he could not throw around such accusations without evidence, even if he was the president of a large company. Sue chuckled, saying that such a reaction meant that the man felt threatened. But fortunately, it only took a moment for him to read his thoughts. He said that he has two options. Sue can use his power to put pressure on Albert's corporation and make him bankrupt within a month, and Albert himself can admit his crimes to the police, and the guy will let him go. The man didn't understand why Sue was talking about the police. Then Thomas entered into a conversation. He invited the man to look at his police ID. Albert laughed nervously, because he thought that they wanted to offer him cooperation, but he was simply deceived. At this moment, the woman in the bunny costume walked up to her boss and demanded that Sue apologize to him immediately, otherwise he would have to deal with their lawyers. The guy just looked at her with a murderous look, saying that she didn't dare tell him what to do. The girl immediately rushed to justify herself, saying that she didn't mean anything bad. Then Sue told her to close her mouth and stand quietly aside. Albert was very angry about this. He shouted at the man to choose his expressions when talking with his subordinates. Then Sue, without further ado, gave the man a strong slap in the face. Matt and Thomas wondered what this guy was doing. Sue turned to Albert, saying that he didn't know how to control himself, let alone his subordinates. The man shouted that Sue was now in his territory, and if he wanted, he could finish him off right here. Then Sue asked how he could control his subordinates if he slept with their wives in his office, and Albert was quite surprised at what he knew about the office. Sue said he knew about many things, including the fact that he forced Joseph to commit suicide by threatening to kill his mother and child. Then Thomas realized that this is why everything looked like a perfectly staged suicide, because Joseph was literally driven to this act by threats. Sue continued, saying that three years ago, Albert's thugs forced the family to sign a consent to the demolition of their house, after which the man took the compensation for himself. One could talk about his atrocities for hours. However, Albert did not give up. He argued that all this was slander because Sue had no evidence. Then the guy named a combination of numbers, 284821. Albert was shocked because it was the password to his personal safe. He then fell to his knees, acknowledging Sue's power and asking for his forgiveness. Thomas couldn't believe his eyes. Was Albert really begging him to forgive him on his knees? Albert said that he was ready to become Sue's personal dog and fulfill all his requests in exchange for forgiveness. But Sue said that he didn't need a dog. And what's more, this scoundrel didn't even measure up to a dog. When Albert heard this, he realized that things could not be resolved amicably and rushed at the guy with a knife. Matt and Thomas, watching everything that was happening, immediately rushed to help the young man. However, this was unnecessary, since Sue stopped the attacker with just one movement of his hand without even turning in his direction. Soon an ambulance arrived at the hotel to pick up Albert. He was so maimed that doctors thought he had been hit by a car. Meanwhile, Thomas thanked Sue, saying that he did not doubt his skills. He promised to conduct a thorough investigation to punish the offender. And the system hastened to congratulate the young man on a successfully completed task. His reward was the permanent skill of reading thoughts. While Sue was driving in the car, he thought that flying a helicopter was very exhausting, and now he could use a massage. He looked at Emma sitting next to her. She was engrossed in a mobile game. Then Grant offered his help to the boss. He was ready to give him a relaxing massage, but Sue refused, asking to take him home. Now it was time to bring out a new identity, and it was the king of mercenaries, the comrade of bullets and guns. Four years ago, his operation failed, 
His entire team was killed, and only three, including the king himself, survived, and now they wanted revenge, but could not find the enemy, and eventually went their separate ways. And now Sue's task was to find out the truth about the failed operation and avenge the death of his comrades. Sue was surprised by this development of events because, apparently, a real gang war awaited him. Suddenly, Grant noticed that two unknown cars were driving behind them. He turned to his partner, asking why someone was following them. It turned out that two cars were following them from the office itself. Suddenly, the people pursuing them opened fire on them. Sue was shocked. This was not at all what he expected from a normal trip home. Grant said that these were either ordinary robbers or they were targeting the president. Meanwhile, unknown persons continued to shoot at Sue's car. Then Grant raised the alarm, calling for reinforcements. Sue took Emma's phone away, telling her it was time to get to work. He said that instead of playing games, she could go to the cars behind them and play with real guns. The girl liked this idea and immediately went to carry out the assignment. Meanwhile, the man in the car ordered his partners to shoot more accurately. But suddenly, Emma was next to one of the shooters. She sweetly greeted the man, horrifying him. Scared as hell, the man drove to the side, crashing into a pole. The boss of the attackers, driving past his car, swore loudly that these slackers couldn't even handle the controls. He then realized that they could not be counted on and prepared an RPG, preparing to shoot at Sue's car. The guy began to gain memories of his new identity, guessing that these people were unhappy that he killed their father. The man was already aiming at the president's car, preparing to shoot. But suddenly the girl's face appeared in the sight. She made faces, not allowing the man to see the car. He was so scared that he accidentally shot somewhere to the side. As it turned out, the shot was extremely unsuccessful for them, since the rocket flew straight into their car. Emma, meanwhile, returned to Sue, who praised her for her good work. Soon everyone arrived at Sue's house. Matt said that he had already sent his men throughout the city to catch the criminals. He also said that the police would monitor Sue around the clock, but the guy said that this was unnecessary. Grant condescendingly replied that his guys were able to protect their boss themselves. The police should just stay outside and guard the house. Matt was surprised. Did this man really want to start a war in the city? Sue turned to Grant, telling him that he couldn't talk to Matt like that, and sent him away. He apologized to the man, saying that his staff would not dare to be rude to him anymore, and he could recall the police. It was not worth wasting their time. However, Matt was determined to stay until this whole story was over. Suddenly, someone rushed into the house, loudly shouting Sue's name. It was Lucy and Rose, their eyes filled with tears. They immediately rushed to the young man, saying that he scared them to death. Sue wanted to move away from the girls because the police were looking at them, but Lucy didn't care about them. Then Matt said he remembered the appointment and hurried out of the room. Lucy asked why Sue was attacked, but he himself still didn't know what to answer. Then the girls dragged Sue aside, saying that they would not let him go anywhere else. They brought him into the bedroom and immediately threw him on the bed. The girls began to undress, saying that they had discussed everything and came to the conclusion that there was only one way to keep Sue from leaving the house too much. Lucy and Rose were determined to keep him in bed, preventing him from leaving. Suddenly, they were distracted from their work by the ringing of the phone. Sue looked at the phone screen and was very surprised to see Sue's name there. Lucy didn't understand what was happening, and then the guy picked up the phone. He said that he urgently needed to answer the phone. But before he could finish speaking, he suddenly heard Sue's frightened voice. The guy hastened to say that if they want to have anything to do with them, then let them not touch the girl. Then the man, one of the kidnappers, replied that Sue had 20 minutes to arrive at the office. Sue screamed that the president should not dare to come. However, the girl kidnapper did not allow her to finish, covering her mouth with her hand. Sue immediately flew out of the room, leaving the girls alone. Grant rushed after him, but his boss told him to gather his brothers and protect Lucy and Rose. Then the man shouted that Sue should take someone with him, but Sue threatened him that they had better keep an eye on the girls. And if anything happened to them... Grant would pay for it with his head. Soon, Sue arrived at the office. He reached for the handle, but the door was closed, and the kidnappers were already waiting for him inside. The white-haired girl suddenly opened the doors and pointed the gun directly at Sue. However, the guy was no longer there. It was as if he had disappeared somewhere. The next moment, Sue jumped on the girl from the ceiling, and she did not have time to react quickly enough. 
The guy kicked her, pushing her away from him and causing her to fall. Her partner, a strong, gray-haired man, immediately pounced on him. However, Sue in one movement intercepted the attacker's fist and besieged him, twisting his arm behind his back. The woman, having come to her senses, immediately pointed a gun at the young man. But her partner stopped her, saying that they were giving up. The girl smirked and said that they thought Sue had lost his touch when he got rich, since he was now surrounded by bodyguards. Then the guy replied that he was a little out of habit, but was still in good enough shape to cope with the two of them. He asked what they were doing here, and Sue, meanwhile, had absolutely no idea what was happening. Then memories came to Sue's head of how he, along with this girl and man dressed in military uniform, were standing near the car, apparently. They were his past partners. He said that last time he made it quite clear to them that they should not see each other again. And Sue was still sitting tied up, then Sue walked up to her and gently wiped her face. He untied her, telling her she had nothing to fear, and she asked who the two were. The girl introduced herself. Her code name was Amanda. She was Sue's lover. Sue was quite surprised by this information, but the guy said that she should not listen to it. He carefully led the girl out of the office, saying that she could rest. Returning to his partners, he told them to tell them why they came here and promised to write them a check if it was about money. But the man, Austin, said they didn't come here for such nonsense. He said he had news about the man who betrayed them four years ago. The girl reported that not only had they lost comrades, but she herself had lost her ovaries due to serious injury, and she was determined to take revenge on those responsible. Then Sue decided to clarify whether their source was reliable. Austin was sure of this, but he understood that the young man was already accustomed to a measured, rich life and may not want to have anything to do with them. Sue asked when they were leaving, and Amanda was surprised. Did he really want to go with them? The guy said that four years ago his comrades also died, and he intended to repay blood for blood. The girl immediately joyfully rushed to Sue. She was happy that the young man remained the same as she remembered him. But Sue interrupted her, saying that they needed to get back to their task. However, Amanda stood her ground, looking at the young man. She really wanted to be alone somewhere with him. Then Austin decided to take the conversation into his own hands. He said that tomorrow they plan to perform, but first they need to complete the escort mission, which will be the first in the revival of their team Deathstroke. Moreover, the information about the traitor came precisely from the escort target. Sue was surprised. There were only three of them left, and someone still wanted to work with them. Amanda explained that the princess of the Middle Eastern Trading Company personally hired them, and one of the payments was information about the traitor. But she planned to talk about this tomorrow because now she wanted to do something else. Austin walked out the door so as not to disturb the guys. He saw Sue. She sat quietly at her desk, not daring to look up at her captor. Austin then decided it would be a good idea to apologize to her for all of this. Sue only timidly said that everything was fine. The next day, Sue and the team arrived at the hotel where the princess lived. He also said that yesterday he was attacked, and now there was a reward of $10 million on his head, and he wanted to find out who was behind it. Sue opened the hotel doors, and the picture that opened before him puzzled him. The corridor was full of armed guards. They looked suspiciously at the arriving guest. Amanda said the guests appeared to have the entire floor cordoned off. Soon the guys came to the girl's room and were about to open it, but suddenly they were stopped. He was a tall and strong man with a scar on his eye. Austin announced that he had brought a man whom his boss asked to find, but he replied that the stranger needed to be searched first. Sue objected, after all, he was a famous person. How could they search him? Then the man shouted that he didn't care who he was, even Satan himself. And then Amanda said that she was Satan, the leader of the Death Strike Squad and the King of Mercenaries. The man couldn't believe his ears. Was it really him? He thought that he should not fall on his face in front of everyone, because then how would he lead people? And then Sue asked Austin to knock on the door and get an explanation. The man said that Satan is the head of a team that has suffered a great loss, and although a lot of time has passed, he does not dare to communicate with him so arrogantly. Sue, hearing his words, turned in his direction and asked him to repeat what he had just said. Then the man pulled out a pistol and shouted that if the hillbilly was chosen as leader, then it is not surprising that the Death Strike squad died almost entirely because he deserved it. Before he could finish speaking, Sue took the gun away from him in one deft movement. After another moment, he left the man, 
causing him to fall to the floor in surprise. His partners pointed a gun at Sue and told him not to move, but the guy just looked at them menacingly. And his gaze made the men lower their weapons. The girl who originally came invited them inside. Sue then sneered, saying that these guys can't even keep track of their own weapons. In one motion, he disassembled the man's pistol and threw it right at his feet. The stunned guard looked at him, not daring to say anything. His subordinates were shocked. They could not believe that he instantly disassembled the pistol with one hand. Meanwhile, the squad went inside and Austin introduced Miss Kelly Sue, saying that this was their captain, Satan. The girl herself was sitting on the bed reading a book. It was a dark-haired young girl who said that she had heard a lot about Mr. Sue. When everyone was seated, the girl said that she relied on him. She added that she hoped that she would be completely safe under the protection of the mercenaries. Then the young man asked Miss Kelly if she knew who betrayed them four years ago. The girl answered in the affirmative, and when she reached her destination safe and sound, she would tell them everything. Kelly said that she heard that they were attacked by shooters yesterday, and she knows that one of them was from the Wild Wolves mercenary group. She added that this information could be considered a gift for their introduction. Amanda said that the Wild Wolves mercenary group was created two years ago, and they are said to have a rich patron, Kelly said that this patron is the Wilson family. During the investigation, something else interesting happened. It turned out that the famous king of assassins was the king of mercenaries, and Satan is the same person. Then Sue remembered whether it was really the same Wilson whom he met once on the liner. Austin and Amanda were surprised. They didn't expect their captain to know this man. Kelly then asked if this was enough information to cheer them up. Sue said that the power of the Eastern Trading Company is incredible, they can even shake off his last penny. However, the girl said that even despite her power, she still needs their protection. Otherwise, she simply will not be able to return. Then Sue asked who Miss Kelly's enemies were, because they could be people who would be too tough for even a Middle Eastern trading company. The girl said that her enemy was her older brother. Sue thought that most likely there was some kind of family drama involved. Kelly replied that perhaps her glow had pierced his dignity so much that he felt threatened, and now he might do something unsafe for her. Sue said that this was their first mission after returning, so the Deathstroke squad would do their best for her. When the girl said that she trusted herself to him, Sue thought that she was teasing him. Soon they boarded the plane that was supposed to take Miss Kelly to her destination. Emma wondered why she had to get up so early for the plane. While Sue was doing business, the girl yawned loudly, talking about how sleepy she was. Then Austin approached him and said that there were 20 minutes left until the jump site. He could not believe that he decided to get there through a parachute jump. However, Sue was very serious because nothing bad should happen to Kelly during the jump. It was his responsibility. Then Amanda said that Miss Kelly has been going to special training since childhood, and parachute jumping is nonsense for her. Suddenly, Emma felt something strange and turned around. She told Sue that someone was looking at him suspiciously, and the guy asked to describe this person. The girl said he had brown hair, a hooked nose, and a scar on his right eye. Apparently, this was the same security guard they encountered at the hotel. He was still unsure about Sue. Suddenly, Kelly approached the young man's table, holding a tray with two glasses of water. Then she asked who the guy was talking about. However, Sue decided to avoid answering, saying that this dress suits the girl very well, and it reflects her folk beauty. Then they knocked glasses and drank water, all of which was carefully watched by a young man with a scar. He was filled with hatred, but he decided not to say anything. They will soon enter the target airspace, and they need to prepare to jump. Then Sue said goodbye to the girl, saying that he would see her downstairs. After a while, everyone landed successfully, and Sue asked the team how Kelly was doing. The girl said that she landed successfully, and she was already leading her to the right place. Sue noted that they had landed right on the right spot, and now they had to wait for the convoy to pick up Kelly. However, there was no convoy, and the man with the scar said that there was no signal in the area, so he should go to where there was one and contact him. Turning to his assistants, he realized that they, too, were not sure that they had seen the convoy. At the moment when Kelly took off her skydiving suit, Amanda noticed something strange, a dot on her chest. Realizing that someone was aiming at her, the girl immediately rushed at Kelly, shielding herself from the shot. A moment later, everyone realized that an enemy had appeared in the area, and it was necessary to urgently shoot him. Sue looked at the place where the attacker could shoot from, 
but did not see anything there. Then he decided that the best solution would be to throw a grenade at this place and for them to retreat. The guys ran. Amanda tried to shield Kelly from the shots. Suddenly, the girl tripped over a branch and almost fell. She didn't understand how they could have been ambushed at their planned landing site if only a small circle of people knew about it. Then Sue came to the conclusion that there was a traitor among them. Kelly couldn't figure out who set them up. But at that moment, the same man with the scar, Jones, appeared in front of them. He pointed the weapon at Sue and ordered them to stand still and raise their hands. Kelly did not remain silent. She screamed because she trusted this man, and he betrayed her. Then Jones said that he had been chasing her like a dog for so many years, and in the end she never even looked him in the eyes or gave him a glass of water. Then he again targeted Sue, saying that he had not seen the great Satan for a long time, and now he would send him to the next world. However, at that moment Emma appeared in front of him, asking who he was going to send to the next world. The man was terrified when he saw a ghost in front of him and screamed. At that moment, Amanda took Kelly with her and directed her to the side to hide from possible shots. The next moment, Sue threw a hunting knife towards Jones. In one motion, it hit him square in the arm, causing the man to drop the weapon. A moment later, he kicked him in the face, causing the man to fly to the side. Then he asked how many people were there and how they were arranged. However, Jones was not going to answer. He said that if Sue is a man, then he should accept the fight and fight with him. In response to this, the guy pointed a gun at him asking how he dared challenge him to a fight. Jones realized that this guy was not to be trifled with. He knelt down and raised his hands, saying that he would tell him everything. He said that he had 300 people, as well as a base in a river valley in the west. But he didn't know anything else. Then Sue turned around and looked at Kelly, saying that this was her man, and only she could decide what to do with him. Without thinking twice, the girl shot Jones right in the head. She said that she hates traitors and everyone who betrays her must die. Sue noted that she was a determined girl, worthy of becoming the heiress of a large global corporation. Suddenly, Austin ran up to the guys. He said that there were mercenaries all over the area, and most likely they would not be able to get through. Then Sue decided that they should hide, since the forest they were in was quite dense. He turned to Miss Kelly, saying that her outfit was not exactly suitable for running away, and asked her to excuse her. The next moment, he cut off the hem of her dress to make it easier for her to run. Thus, it will not get tangled in excess fabric, and will not give them away when it falls. And although the girl was uncomfortable in such a short dress, she agreed. Then Sue left her in Amanda's hands. Austin went to investigate. So Sue called Emma and asked her to go and find the camp where Jones pointed. The young man also had a plan for further actions, which he decided not to voice for now. Night soon fell, and Jones's squad was approaching the guy's camp, looking for them in cars. The patrols had become more frequent, and by the looks of it, they were narrowing down the search area. It was only a matter of time before Sue and his team were discovered. Austin suggested that the boss run away while it was dark, because when it blooms, it will be more difficult for them to escape from here. But the young man told them not to worry, and he did not need to run anywhere. Kelly then said the traitor was a former senior member of an international security company in North Africa called Fernand Dellis. Amanda and Austin couldn't believe their ears. Could it really be Dellis? Then the girl said that he was removed from the leadership of the North African Security Center, and he harbored a grudge. He wanted to make the last push before retirement and surrendered the team's plans. They had been cooperating with him for a long time so he could predict their actions. Sue didn't understand why she was telling him this now, because they agreed on something else. Then Kelly sobbed and said that they wouldn't be able to leave with her. They had already done a lot for her, and now they should leave her and save themselves. She said she just wanted to send a message to her parents that she would no longer be able to see them and ask for their forgiveness. However, Sue wiped away her tears and told her not to worry because he promised to deliver her safely. The girl didn't understand whether they really didn't want to run away because she was causing them inconvenience. But Sue said that he was not going to run away. He was going to destroy his opponents. Austin thought that their boss had completely lost his mind and Amanda supported him, saying that there was no way they could cope with 300 people. At that moment, Emma flew up and said that everything was ready. Sue thanked her. Kelly asked who the young man was talking to 
but he did not answer. He only said that it was time for them to move out. Meanwhile, the action moves to the camp. The man, who apparently was the main one in this group, cursed. He did not understand how his people could not find a couple of unfortunate rats. The soldiers hastened to assure him that there were infrared sensors all around the perimeter and they would not be able to get out, and now they were definitely hiding somewhere. But after dawn, they would definitely find them. The boss shouted that the honor of destroying Satan with his own hands should be his. At this moment, a sniper from a watchtower was lazily observing the surrounding area. Suddenly, someone shot him straight in the head. It was Sue and Austin. They had already managed to penetrate enemy territory. Another man standing not far from the tower noticed the intruders and shouted at them, asking who they were. However, Sue quickly shot him, and before everyone realized what was happening, an explosion occurred. One of the soldiers ran to his boss, saying that it was Satan who was attacking the camp. The boss was shocked. Had he really gone crazy and personally come to his camp? Meanwhile, a real firefight was taking place. Austin and Sue took the entire team by surprise and shot everyone, but another batch of soldiers was already advancing towards them. However, without even leaving their tents, they stepped on a mine and immediately exploded. The boss did not understand how an explosion could happen behind him. Then one of the soldiers told him that the camp was mined, but the man still did not understand how this could happen right under their noses. Then he ordered the shooters to detain the attackers, and they aimed directly at the two men. But for some reason, the machine guns did not fire. Moreover, the remaining soldiers had no clips from their pockets. They simply had nothing to shoot with. At that moment, a bullet shot through the head of one of them. Apparently, it was a sniper. Amanda had them at gunpoint, so they had nowhere to hide. Kelly didn't understand why they weren't shooting. The girl only answered that she didn't know. Perhaps their boss was really a sorcerer. Meanwhile, the group's boss ordered his soldiers to remove the snipers, but they said that the barrel of their weapons was clogged with glue. Suddenly, the man saw a mine fly towards him. The next moment, his car and himself were blown up, and there was a huge explosion. With a bloody head, the man crawled forward, trying to leave the scene, but suddenly a man appeared in front of him. It was Sue, he pointed a weapon at him, asking where he was going. The man asked how he managed to organize such an operation, but Sue was not going to answer and simply shot the man. Meanwhile, at the headquarters of the Middle East Trading Company, Kelly's brother was going crazy. He was furious that an entire team of soldiers could not cope with his sister. Then he turned to his butler, saying that if he did not kill her, then he himself might not return alive. The man told his boss not to worry. He would not disappoint him. Meanwhile, the operation was completed, and Sue and his team calmly went to the right place. Kelly asked him how he managed to destroy the camp in advance. However, Sue said that he could only say three words to the girl. It was a phrase. This is classified information. Kelly chuckled at Sue's sense of humor. Amanda just sighed in bewilderment as she listened to their conversation. Then Austin said that they needed to get gas. He asked if they should go into town or leave the car and walk, and then the young man said that there was a biker town nearby. They could go there and get gas. Suddenly, Kelly bit him. The guy asked what she was doing, but the girl replied that this was his punishment for not wanting to share information with her. Soon, the company arrived in the city. Amanda noted that their opponents would not be idle and could attack them right in the city, so they needed to be on their guard. Sue said out loud that the biker was on his way to Thorley, and if they wanted to act, they would definitely do it now, so they had to get there earlier. Kelly wondered why they were still here, but Sue said that there was no need for them to hide, because if they wanted to fight, then they needed to give them a fight. However, they soon arrived at the gas station. A short, dark-skinned man was waiting for them there. He was impressed by the big guy who came to see them. Amanda and Austin weren't going to talk to him, so they told him to quickly fill them up. Then the man looked at the white-haired girl, noting that she was very beautiful, and if she agreed to drink with him, he would fill them for free. However, Sue hastened to stop him, saying that it was better not to stare at her like that, otherwise she might show him in the head. Then the man pulled out a pistol, saying that if anyone laid a finger on him, he would not leave here alive. He then noticed Kelly sitting next to the young man. He immediately reached out to touch her with his hands, noting how beautiful she was. At this moment, Sue hit him in the face, saying that he warned him not to let go. The man flew back to the gas station, saying that now he would kill them all. At that moment, a whole company of armed men approached the car, and the owner of the gas station ordered them to kill those sitting inside. 
However, Austin immediately pulled out a weapon, pointing it at the men, saying that he would if they dared to come closer. One of the men tried to calm him down because they were at a gas station and he didn't really want to die from the explosion. A dark-skinned man supported him, saying that if everything can be solved with a knife, then it is better to do without guns. Then the man trying to talk to him ordered him to shut up and take him to Tony. The man wondered if this guy really knew the boss. Meanwhile, the action moved to the casino. Kelly's brother sat on the couch, sipping a glass of wine, and watched what was happening. Suddenly, one of his subordinates ran up to him, looking very excited. He told him that Tom from the gas station brought people from the Dragon Kingdom and said that they wanted to talk to him. Tony screamed because he had said so many times that he hated the guys from the Dragon Kingdom. Couldn't his subordinates understand this? However, it was too late. Sue had already gone inside and heard the young man's words very well. Tony couldn't believe his eyes. Could it be Satan himself? The young man came up to him, put his arm around his neck, and asked why he looked like he had seen a ghost. The guards immediately rushed to meet their boss, intending to protect him. However, Tony quickly shut them down, saying that he did not order them to open their mouths, and Sue was also puzzled, saying that he really looked like a man who was up to something. Then the men bowed to the young people and hastened to apologize. Soon, Sue sat down on the sofa, and Tom poured him some wine, talking about how much he missed him, but the young man heard that he was talking about people from the Dragon Kingdom. Trying to justify himself, the man said that he actually meant that he loved them immensely and would follow them through thick and thin. Then Sue said that he just needed him to do him one favor. Meanwhile, the butler was already preparing for the operation. He sat in the car and ordered the others to hide and then enter the building from both sides. The soldiers obediently hid their vehicles and got out of them, preparing to storm the buildings. One of them said that their destination was in about half an hour, and when they got there, it would be impossible for them to leave because they would be shot at from both sides. Then the butler chuckled, saying that Miss Kelly should refrain from fighting for power. Suddenly a powerful explosion thundered near them. The men did not understand what was happening, and then everyone else was ordered to return to their cars. One of the soldiers ran up to the butler, reporting that the room had been mined. However, before he could reach his car, three bullets flew at him at once. The man immediately shouted into the radio that they were trapped and called for backup. However, no one could reach him, since those who appeared in the field of view immediately became a target for arrows. Sue and Kelly sat in the restaurant, watching what was happening. The girl asked if this was the work of their friends, because her brother's people were professional mercenaries, but this time they lost their vigilance. Then the guy said that these guys were not fighting according to the rules, but the main thing was still coming. Meanwhile, gunfire continued on the street. Fei Long tried to hold on, hoping for reinforcements that he hoped would arrive soon. The next moment it turned out that the cars of the Allied groups were close to him, and he even lit a cigarette for relief, saying that he remained outside the city, and now he could not be reached. However, before the cars had time to arrive, an explosion occurred again. The man wondered what was happening. Were they really mines? But as soon as the smoke cleared, everyone saw a tank approaching them. Sue said that in this country without power, you cannot even become a gangster. The girl did not understand how such forces could obey the young man, but he said that he intercepted people when the man accompanied the transport with them. And although all his people were killed, he left him alive and then secured his strong friendship. The vehicles immediately turned around, not wanting to participate in a fight with the tank. However, they were not going to let them go so easily, and then the car fired, knocking down the entire convoy with one blow. Soon, Fei Long was captured and tied up with a gun pointed at his head and told to sit quietly. It was said that the old man tried to hide in the sewers, but was intercepted there. Sue then asked if Kelly knew the man, and she said that it was her brother's butler, and she didn't expect him to personally lead the team to kill her. Sue then said that it looked like the man had lost. Fei Long turned to Kelly, begging him to forgive him. He was ready to tell about his master and everything he could. Then Sue's people handed him the device, saying that it would contain all the necessary information. The young man said that in that case, he didn't need Fei Long's confession, and now his people could do whatever they wanted with him. The men begged for mercy, but Sue took the gun, saying that he was a freak without any moral principles. Tony treated him too well, but he was not worthy of it. 
The next moment, she shot him in the head. Then Sue said that now no one would stop her from returning home. They were about to leave when suddenly someone stopped them. It was Tony. He said that he had weapons, people, and tanks. Sue was wondering what he meant by this. Then the young man replied that he had become much stronger compared to the time when Satan's group destroyed his people. Sue just grinned, not paying much attention to the young man's words. Then Tony pointed the gun at him, telling him to stop acting stupid. He said that he was successful in business, but since he appeared, he had been struggling to stay afloat, and now he also dared to meet him. Then Sue asked him if he knew why he left him alive, and immediately answered because he was an ordinary guy. Tony wondered how he dared speak to him in such a tone. However, at that moment, one of his subordinates said that a dot appeared on the man's face. Apparently his people were in the crosshairs of a sniper rifle. Sue said that it was not just a sniper rifle, it was an infrared howitzer with a blast radius of about 10 meters. Then the men began to rush about in fear. They could not believe that they were being targeted by a howitzer. Meanwhile, Amanda and Austin were watching everything from the roof, keeping their opponents at gunpoint. Tony still didn't believe Sue was telling the truth, but he told him that if he didn't trust him, he could just shoot him and see what happened to him. Then the young man decided to drop the weapon and said that he was just joking. In response to this, Sue told him that he could live, but in return he had to do something for him. Then the young man took out his phone camera and told the people standing in front of him to stand up straight and smile. Tony and his subordinates, dressed in women's swimsuits, posed shyly for the camera. When all the photos were taken, he gave the phone to Kelly, saying that if she had any problems, she could contact them, and if they refused, then she could leak their photos. The men, still dressed in women's clothing, looked at the couple in bewilderment. Soon the whole Sioux company, along with Amanda and Austin, got into the car and drove home. Amanda asked if their task was not to accompany Miss Kelly to Thorley. Why did they need to deal with her problems in the future? Then he replied that he just wanted to tease them a little. Austin said that most likely the young man simply liked Miss Kelly and wanted to protect her, and Amanda agreed with him. Soon they arrived at the headquarters of the Middle East World Trading Company, Thorley. Austin had a bad feeling, but Kelly said that they shouldn't worry because once she entered, she would be in her father's world, and there was no one there who would want to harm her. Sue could only hope so. Meanwhile, Tony was already on his knees in his father's office. He begged him not to deprive him of his inheritance, assuring that next time he would do much better than Kelly. However, his father Carl told him not to take him for an idiot because he knows very well what his son is doing. He said he wasn't worth his sister's fingernail and his actions disappointed him too much. Then he pointed a gun at his son, saying that he would not disinherit him, but instead deprive him of a dishonorable life. Meanwhile, Kelly and her company entered the building. She was met by a security guard who said that the boss asked her to rest first and they would see each other tomorrow. Then the girl said that she urgently needed to meet with him, but the man replied that if this concerns Mr. Tony, then this is no longer required. He said Tony died five minutes ago and Kelly couldn't believe what he was saying. Amanda then pointed Sue to something ahead. When he looked there, he saw the orderlies carrying a corpse out of the elevator with a pentagram tattooed on his arm. Kelly recognized him as her brother. He had the same tattoo. Then Sue realized that he had lost to his sister, and therefore he was no longer considered the heir. In companies of this size, everyone had long forgotten about human nature. Everyone believed that the loser must disappear. Otherwise, the boss would be in serious trouble. The group then decided that the best solution now would be to head out and meet Kelly's father tomorrow. The girl walked, wiping away her tears. She couldn't believe how they got to this point, and Sue tried to calm her down, saying that it was very difficult to get out of a rich family. However, the guards did not allow the company to leave, blocking their path. A bodyguard approached them from behind. He said that Miss Kelly could go, and his boss would like to see Satan. Austin said they were Miss Kelly's bodyguards and they didn't have to listen to him. However, Sue said that he would go to him right away, and he invited his team to escort Miss Kelly home. Soon the young man arrived at the boss's office. The man stood with his face turned to the window, and without even turning around, he said that Mr. Satan looked much younger than he thought. Then Sue joked, saying that he was already over 50 years old. However, the man did not appreciate the joke and simply asked the young man to sit down. Sue asked why he was called. 
Carl replied that he was surprised that Kelly was able to hire the king of mercenaries to accompany her, and because of his appearance, he had to kill his own son, so now he mourns him. Sue chuckled. Is the man really accusing him of killing his heir himself? However, Carl said that now the young man would not be able to leave. He would stay here and serve him for five years as compensation, and he would pay him so that he could revive the Death Strike Squad. Sue's face immediately became serious, saying that he didn't like being threatened. In response to this, the man only laughed. Then Sue looked at his hands and saw a bunch of red dots on them. He realized that he was in the sights of snipers, and if he made a sudden movement, he would be shot immediately. Then he asked Carl if he was afraid that he himself would be killed, and the man laughed, saying that his people had checked everything a long time ago, and there were no weapons on him. However, the next moment he noticed that his ashtray was flying right in front of him. Sue moved his hand, pretending that he was the one controlling the object, and said that Carl should understand that this world is full of things that he has not even heard of yet. In fact, Emma was behind this trick. She was the one who moved the ashtray. At this moment, Sue said that Carl was stubborn as a fool, snapped his fingers, and the object immediately split into many pieces. The young man said that he actually planned to keep a low profile, but he pointed the gun at him despite the fact that he was completely out of his depth. With her invisible hand, Emma also handed him a cigar and a lighter, after which Sue ordered Mr. Carl to sit down. The man did not understand how he was doing all this, and even sweated from fear, not understanding what to do in this situation. Sue noticed drops of sweat on the man's face and said that they should cool the room a little. At that moment, cold currents of wind appeared around Emma. The girl spun in the middle of the room, driving the wind faster and faster, and soon the room was practically covered with an ice crust. Carl fell to the floor, frightenedly clinging to the corner. He did not understand at all what was happening here. Then Sue approached him and asked, Is it really that such a powerful person cannot stand on his feet? The man knelt down, asking for forgiveness for his behavior. He said that he would do everything to atone for his guilt before Satan. He leaned down to kiss the young man's shoes and said that he would become his most loyal servant, but Sue said that the man did not have the necessary qualifications for this. At that moment, Kelly burst into the room. She was confused, not understanding what was happening here. Then she saw her father kissing Sue's feet, and the young man himself was also dumbfounded because he did not expect to see a girl here. Sue then joked and said that Mr. Carl was just looking for something on the floor. At this point, Carl noticed that Kelly liked Sue, and if he allowed them to be together, then his daughter would become pregnant with his child, and then this would open up many opportunities for him. After finishing this awkward scene, Sue said goodbye to the man and walked out the door. The father immediately ordered his daughter to accompany Mr. Sue, but the girl did not understand why on earth she should do this because she was the one who hired him. Why should she accompany him? However, Carl immediately kicked her out the door, saying that she should dress normally, invite Mr. Sue to dinner, and then persuade him to be intimate, no matter what the cost. Meanwhile, Amanda was already relaxing on the roof of the house. She said that Miss Kelly insisted that they stay here for two more days. Austin was lifting dumbbells at this time and decided to turn to his boss, asking if they should go after Dallas. However, the young man said that they did not need to rush. They first needed to get to the United States. At that moment, Kelly entered them. She was dressed in a luxurious white dress, and stepping over the threshold, she shyly invited the young man to dinner. Sue agreed, and soon they arrived at an expensive restaurant, where dishes were already waiting for them, and Kelly said that although they were not as nutritious as in the Dragon Kingdom, they were still very tasty. The young man noted that the steaks here are very tasty. He was about to drink wine from a glass when he suddenly heard a strange sound. Then he looked at Kelly. She looked quite tired. Sue asked her if something had happened to her, to which the girl awkwardly turned away from him and said that everything was fine. She let go of her gaze and timidly offered to meet again a little later. Sue didn't understand if she was leaving already, and the girl said that she needed to admit that he was a very attractive man. The young man grinned saying that he was very honored by her compliment, but he already had a girlfriend. Kelly said he misunderstood her because she didn't mean she wanted to marry him. She said that she would become the heir to the family business, so she was not destined to marry anyone. Otherwise, she would have to hand over the family property. 
However, she said that Sue could come to her and asked him not to be afraid. She had no intention of pestering him. At that moment, Emma appeared behind the young man. She was unhappy that the girl was asking to visit him. She considered her completely unworthy of this honor. Then Sue grinned, saying that she should consult her parents, and then threw the plate somewhere to the side. The dish hit her father Carl on the head who had been hiding in the bushes near their table all this time. He grinned, saying that even despite how well he hid, Sue managed to find him. Kelly didn't expect to see her father here, and the young man told the man that he could sit down and have dinner with him, but Carl said that he only wanted to give something to his daughter, and after that, he would leave immediately. When the girl approached him, he handed her condoms, saying that he had made a hole in them so that she would definitely get pregnant tonight. The girl was perplexed. This was not at all what she wanted, but her father told her not to miss her happiness, because if she liked him, then her father was ready to give him his property and make them a family. Soon the girl returned to Sue, apologized, saying that she did not know that he was following them, and then told the whole truth that in fact her father wanted her to marry him. Then Kelly burst into tears, saying that she was not good enough for the young man, but nevertheless she still liked him. At this time Sue walked up to her and hugged her, telling her not to cry. He offered to take her home because it was already getting cold outside. Meanwhile, Kelly's father was sitting in the car, chuckling, he thought that if his daughter became pregnant with Sue, then he would not be able to get rid of him. However, at that moment the young man himself approached the car and asked what he had brought this time, and the man was absolutely shocked that he had been discovered now. He said he needed to ask Carl two things. Meanwhile, the action moves to Wilson's International Financial Building. An expensive black car arrives at a high skyscraper, and its subordinates greet it with a bow. Inside the car is an obese middle-aged man, the new head of the Wilson family named Entwheels. He was shouting at his people because they failed in the task in the dragon country. He threatened to kill them if they did not get him the head of God in ten days. At that moment, his secretary approached him and invited him to cool down. The man said he wanted to do it right now in the car. But suddenly the car shook sharply, and he and his secretary flew forward. The man shouted at the driver, threatening to kill him if he dared to drive so badly again. However, the driver said that a man suddenly appeared in front and he did not have time to slow down. Entwheels shouted that he was some kind of psycho, and if he wanted to die then he should be beaten to hell because he had money to buy his life. The car didn't even have time to move when it was hit by another car, as if it came out of nowhere. Austin was driving and she was glad that she hit the target. Wilson shouted, How dare these idiots try to kill him! He talked about his best bulletproof car, resistant to tank shots. He threatened that his guards would come in three minutes and the attackers would be beaten to death. However, at that moment, the entire motorcade was shot down and a loud shot was heard. Amanda, sitting on the roof, used a grenade launcher and hit several cars. She reported that the Wilson building was blocked and now no one would come out. Wilson shouted that his men would arrive in one minute and kill all the attackers. However, the driver informed him that the path was blocked by fire and the guards were too badly damaged to take action, at which point Austin got out of his car. Wilson chuckled, saying there was no point in shooting him. At that moment, Austin began shooting at Wilson's car with a machine gun, but it really was bulletproof. The man showed him the middle finger, saying that it was useless to shoot him. Sue warned him again. He said he had 30 seconds left. He pulled out a gun and began shooting at Wilson's car. The man just grinned, saying that this gun would never break through his glass. Sue pointed the gun at the car and started shooting, but there were no scratches on the glass. Wilson laughed, teasing the young man. However, a moment later the glass cracked from another shot and cracks began to spread along the entire perimeter of the window. Wilson couldn't believe his eyes, but before he could do anything, the bullet had already penetrated his leg. Sue told him that he only had five seconds left. The man hurried to run out of the car. He understood that he had no choice but to run onto the roadway. He climbed over the railing, intending to run across the road. However, Austin realized that he had not noticed the truck, which was an inch away from him, and moments later the car hit him. Sue looked at the people remaining in the car, the secretary and driver Entwiles. They begged the young man not to kill them. Then he said that he would not kill them, but asked them to give the Wilson something from him. He said that no matter which one of them becomes the next head of the family, let them not hesitate to contact him, since God does not mind wiping the Wilsons off the face of the earth.
Then the head of the company announced that they should not cross this man's path and ordered it to be announced on the internet that the Wilsons would always serve the King of Killers. Meanwhile, Sue, along with Amanda and Austin, went to lunch. The girl said that they should have just demolished their building, but the young man replied that their goal was to gain authority and not just kill them. Amanda then asked if Sue and Miss Kelly followed security measures, to which Sue replied that they did not, since it would be known anyway. Amanda wondered if he really bought into Carl's trick, because if Miss Kelly got pregnant from him, he would be in big trouble. However, Sue said that she had nothing to worry about. At that moment, they called him. He asked if everything had been approved, and soon said that he was already leaving. The guy immediately got up from the table, saying that it was time for them to return. He explained that Carl had just told him that Fernandellis would be attending the company meeting tomorrow. Soon the company arrived in an unfamiliar place. Girls in very revealing clothes stood around. Amanda said that it was still a long way to their destination and asked why they were stopping here, but Sue told her not to worry. A crowd of girls immediately approached the young man. They called him to have fun with him and even promised to give him a 50% discount. However, he said that he had a girlfriend and hugged Amanda, pretending that they were together. Then he pointed to Austin and said that this man was young, lonely, and very rich. Leaving the man alone with a bunch of girls, he and Amanda went about their business. He said it was time for this big kid to finally relax. The pair soon arrived at the company's North African security headquarters at the Sunflower Estate, a place heavily guarded by armed men. At first, Sue and Amanda watched this place from afar, and the girl said that even from here she could see this scoundrel Dallas. she asked permission to shoot him in one shot. However, Sue said that this would not be enough for him. At that moment, Austin approached them, shouting that he had been deceived and left alone. Meanwhile, the girl said that the banquet had already begun and asked when they should leave. At this moment, Carl called Sue and said that all his instructions had been followed. The young man praised him for his good work. Then he said that they could go, Amanda asked what Carl should have done. However, before Sue could answer, security guards suddenly stopped them at the entrance. The young man said that they came to a party, but the guard replied that he had never seen them before. It was an internal company event, and outsiders were not allowed to be here. Then Sue said that apparently they did not recognize him. The second guard immediately hurried to greet the young man. When they were let through, one of the guards asked the other what kind of man he was, because he knew all the officers here, but he had never seen this. Then the man said that one day the death strike squad was destroyed, but three people survived. One of them is called Satan, and it was just him. Meanwhile, together with his company, they had already taken a glass of wine and were tracking down Dellis. Amanda noticed him in the company of girls and another man. At that moment, one of the guests was heading towards the girl, saying something to her on the way, but suddenly he ran into Sue and was ready to yell at him for not watching where he was going. But when the young man turned to him, the man was speechless. He immediately stood at attention, greeting Sir. The crowd couldn't believe it. They thought they were imagining it, but Sue said that he had finally returned. Then all the guests greeted the young man, and the man standing in the company of Dallas even hugged him. He said that since Satan had returned, he would immediately give him the best people so that he could assemble the Death Strike squad again, but Sue noticed that Della standing behind him did not seem exactly happy to see him. Then Della said that the guy was just a deserter who failed his mission and left the company, and he doesn't know why he even came here. Then Sue said that he came here to kill them. The men did not understand what he meant, but said that this joke was absolutely not funny. Then the young man said that four years ago, Death Strike Squad suffered serious losses due to an ambush set up by Dallas. However, the man replied that all this was complete nonsense because he is the head of the company, and in order to accuse him of this, it was necessary to provide evidence. The crowd began to whisper, because after the incident with the Death Strike Squad, the company went downhill, and this would not bring him any benefit, they thought that Satan had made a mistake. But Sue said he didn't need evidence to kill someone. Then the man screamed and said that they didn't advise him to run into trouble, even though Satan had made a significant contribution to the company, he couldn't just kill people. The guard was ordered to arrest the traitor and throw him out of here, but Sue understood that four years ago this man was lucky to escape, but today he intended to end his luck. 
The young man looked at the guards who arrived, saying that they would not dare to shoot at him, but the guys said that they were just carrying out their task. Then Sue said that since they still didn't understand what was happening, he would show them a real fireworks display. At that moment, the man, who had already brought grenade launchers to the meeting place, said that he understood his order and ordered him to open fire. At that moment, a bunch of rockets flew over the heads of the guests. They headed straight to the main building, and a moment later there was a deafening explosion. The men fell to the floor, shielding their heads from the explosions and begging for help. At that moment, one of the guards ran out to his boss, saying that something terrible was happening. The estate was surrounded and heavy weapons appeared from somewhere. They were fired at from helicopters. Sue then looked at the men with contempt and asked if they still needed any proof. Dellis and his partner did not understand where this guy got such strength. Then the gray-haired man shouted at him, saying that he should not think that he could intimidate his people, because justice in people's eyes would immediately disappear as soon as he fired a shot. However, Sue did not even listen to him and fired in his direction, hitting his ear with a bullet. He looked at the man contemptuously, holding a pistol in his hands. Dellis screamed, his ear bleeding from the wound. Then he knelt before going to sleep, begging him not to kill him, saying that all his misdeeds were due to the confusion in his head. He said that he would do whatever he wanted if he spared him, and all the guests were shocked. Did this bastard really have the courage to beg for mercy? The dissatisfied shouted that he should die. Dallas's partner asked Satan to calm down and give him time so that he could give him a clear answer. When the young man said that no answer would satisfy his dead brothers, the man shouted that he did not care who Sue belonged to now, because he was killing his people and did not put him in anything. So he ordered him to slowly leave and take from with all his minions. However, at that moment, Sue shot directly at Davis's head, and the man fell right at the feet of his partner. This made the man furious. He couldn't believe what this young man had just done. However, Sue completed his task. He learned the truth about the failed operation four years ago. He avenged the death of his comrades, and as a reward, he received the ability to drive. He said that his goal has been achieved and he leaves the rest to others. However, at that moment, the man stopped him. He said, didn't he think he had some explaining to do? Did he really want to leave just like that? However, Sue had no intention of explaining anything to him. The man then pointed a gun at him, saying that if he simply left, it would mean a declaration of war on their North African organization. Sue replied that it was not the African company that held the death blow, but the death blow that held them, and without it, his groups and their security company were simply nothing. The man then called Sue ungrateful. He fired, but could not hit the young man, as he skillfully dodged all his bullets, and the next moment he grabbed him by the arm. The man said that if he touched him, he would not live anyway, because a killer king had appeared and he would ask him to kill the young man. Then Sue leaned towards him to tell him a little secret, because he is Satan and also God. The man couldn't believe his ears, but Sue said that there was no point in lying to him, because if he didn't believe him, the Wilsons would really appreciate other aspects of his personality. Together with Amanda and Austin, they headed towards the exit. As soon as the group wanted to get into the car, someone called out to them. Sue looked towards the speakers and asked if they really wanted to take revenge on him for Davis. A whole army of fighters stood before him, and he said that he was afraid that this number of people would not be enough. Then the men said that they want the master to lead them to success. They want to follow him and ask him to take them into service. However, Sue said he was afraid it was no longer his responsibility. But the men stood their ground. They wanted to go as young men until their death. And then Amanda asked the guy to accept them. Then he said that he intended to stay in the country, and the state would simply destroy him for such a large number of international mercenaries. However, he told them that if they wanted to leave the North African Security Service, he could sponsor the creation of a new company where they could do the same. The men were incredibly happy about this offer and thanked their boss. So Sue sent Amanda and Austin to Carl to tell him that he had found the location and capital to start a new company. The girl was surprised. Is Sue really not going to go with them? Then he showed his phone screen to messages from Lucy, who was already indignant at how long her boyfriend had been away and Sue said that he had to go. Amanda noted that even the Invincible have their weaknesses. Two days later, Sue returned to his hometown and his home. 
He didn't want to enter through the main entrance because he wanted to make it a surprise, but all the windows in his house were tightly closed. Emma was offended, saying that she had always been faithful to Sue, but he had never cared about her like that or given her surprises, to which the guy replied that she already crawls under his blanket every day while he sleeps. The girl said that she was just hugging him. There was nothing special about it. But suddenly Sue found a window that was not so tightly closed, and he moved it as it turned out. It was the window to the bathroom. When he went inside, he realized that someone was now taking a shower and began to think who it could be, Lucy or Rose. However, suddenly on the street he heard the voices of his girls. They were catching fireflies. It turns out that they were both outside now, but then who is in the bathroom now? Suddenly the stranger opened the screen, and it turned out that it was Sue, his secretary. She immediately screamed, and the young man raised his hands in fear, saying that he did not have time to see anything. Meanwhile, the girls noticed that the window in the bathtub was open, and they went to check on her strength because she was still in the shower. Sue realized that if the girls saw him now, he would not be able to explain what he was doing here alone with his secretary. Then Sue pulled him towards her, intending to block him from the girl's eyes. Meanwhile, Lucy and Rose had already approached the window, asking if she was okay and why she opened the window. The girl looked out from behind the screen and replied that she was fine. She just wanted to let in some air. Then Lucy said that they would close the window so that no one could climb in. The girls noted that she was very careless since she opened the windows while she was on the first floor, but they soon left. Then Sue and Sue got out of the bath and the guy thanked the girl for covering for him. He asked how she ended up here in the first place. Sue said that while he was gone, Lucy and Rose were bored and invited her to join them, but now it was time for her to leave since the president returned home. Then the guy told her that she had misunderstood him. He was not going to kick her out. The girl was delighted. Didn't he really want her to leave? The guy understood that the atmosphere here was becoming more and more strange, so he decided that it would be better for him to just leave here. Then Sue leaned towards him and kissed him on the lips. After that, she immediately stood up and headed towards the exit, apologizing for her behavior. However, Sue stopped her by grabbing her hand. He said that she took the initiative, and if he remains indifferent to this, then can he even be considered a man? So Sue spent the night with him. They woke up in the same bed at first light. The guy thought about last night, he suddenly became horny, and now he needed to somehow explain this to Lucy and Rose. Sue asked him when he was going to confess everything to his girls. She said she didn't want to hurt them, but she really liked it and was ready to leave if they were against her company. The guy then told her not to be so emotional and promised to talk to them and asked her not to show that something was wrong before they woke up. Sue left the room. He thought that the girls were most likely sleeping so he was going to pretend that he had only returned home today. However, Lucy was already standing outside the door, looking very gloomy. She asked the guy threateningly why he left Sue's room. What a reasonable explanation that could be. Soon, Rose joined the conversation. She asked why he didn't come to her since he returned yesterday. They began to attack the guy, saying that he had excessive appetites. Then Sue apologized, saying that he got carried away, but this would not happen again. However, Lucy was very unhappy with this answer and loomed over the guy menacingly. She said that if he were an ordinary man, she would never have agreed to Rose joining them, but now she had only one request. She said that she wanted to be the main one of his girls, and that tonight he would come to her, and they would spend it just the two of them. Rose agreed that Sue would come to her the next day, but Lucy immediately dragged her to breakfast. When she opened the door, she came face to face with Sue, the girl blushed. She said that she was just passing by and didn't hear anything. Then Lucy said that she could call her sister. Looking at this, Sue was surprised. Did Lucy really accept Sue into her company so quickly? Then he thought that she wanted him to have many girls. However, as soon as he voiced this thought, a glass of water immediately flew into his face. The morning after spending the night with Lucy, Sue admired his girlfriend while she slept. Then he decided to find out about his new identity and asked the system to extract its program. The system said that his new identity was the king of hackers, and his task was to declare himself so that the world would know about him as the real king of hackers. For this, he had five days. Sue thought that the six previous personalities were already ready, but this time he needs to start all over again, declare himself to the whole world. But this only made it more interesting for him. 
When he woke up, he immediately sat down at the computer. Rose came in and said that she had prepared berry tea for him. She asked him what he was doing. Then the guy said that he was writing code, but it was not just code. He was going to show a real miracle. Meanwhile, the action moves to the largest streaming startup company star. In one of the conference rooms, there was a presentation of the social network, which stated that the number of active users had exceeded 10 million, and the site's home page could bring 500,000 customers daily. However, some problems occurred on the screen and the presentation disappeared. Soon, instead, an inscription appeared on the screen that the king of hackers had come and asked no one to switch. Everyone was watching this broadcast, even people traveling on buses. Some thought that the hacker king was just a fake, but everyone was wondering what would happen next. Sue then went live and welcomed everyone to his space where he would demonstrate his best hacking skills. He said that the demonstration would include minor number thefts, major security hacks of different countries, and for security purposes, everything would be anonymous. Girls and spectators noted that he had a very bewitching voice. However, some did not believe him. They believed that he was just an upstart who decided to show off his skills in the field of computer technology to everyone. They asked him to prove his skills and Sue was ready to fulfill their wish. He had just blocked 15 accounts, and now he was going to unblock them, and then people began to confirm that their accounts had indeed just been blocked. People in the apartment did not understand what was happening. No one could understand why the banner on the home page had changed. Then the local technical worker said that most likely there were technical problems and promised to return everything as it was. However, after a few moments, he realized that he did not have permission to change. Someone had taken it from him. After all, his company is being disgraced in front of everyone. It was necessary to urgently report this to the management department and block the one who was doing this. Meanwhile, in the management department, an employee, suspecting nothing, was having lunch right at his workplace. But when he heard that the system had been taken over by a guy calling himself the king of hackers, he said that he would check everything now. Meanwhile, Rose asked what Sue was waiting for, but he said that he was waiting for cannon fodder. He pointed to the girl on the screen. There were thousands of messages from people who wanted to know what would happen next, as well as a warning that they wanted to block Sue's account due to inappropriate content. He realized that it was the work of the moderators, and now it was his turn to block him. The man just grinned, saying that all these internet celebrities were crazy if they thought they could block him. However, a moment later, a message about blocking appeared on his screen. He did not suspect that this was even possible. Meanwhile, everyone at the company's office was indignant. Do site administrators really no longer have permission to the site itself? The secretary said that perhaps they were dealing with a very tough intruder. Then the man instructed all programmers to return administrator rights, because if this hacker decides to destroy their platform, they are finished. Meanwhile, Sue continued his broadcast, and people still did not understand how he was able to deceive the entire system so quickly. He said that he does not need any reward from his viewers, he does not need to send gifts, he will reveal any secrets for free. Technical workers went crazy, because users began to put forward their demands. They asked for the leaking of personal photos of stars, company contracts, and bank passwords. But if any of this came out publicly, then it would all be the end. Then the five tigers of entrepreneurship got to work. This site was completely created by them, and anyone who decides to hack it will have to deal with it. However, Sue understood that even though these people were masters, unfortunately, they could not do anything against him. When the boss approached one of them, he saw that the computer the man was working on had simply broken down. He said it's not a glitch. Apparently the hacker is remotely attacking their computers and hacking their system directly, and they can't do anything about it. Then the boss ordered to report this to the police. In the meantime, Sue said that the platform had been cleared, and viewers had been warned, and now it was time for him to get down to business, thinking about what people would be most interested in watching. Rose suggested that there must be some secrets at the national level, for example, some kind of action plan. Sue noted that this was a good idea and decided to wander around the country. Meanwhile, there was real chaos in the intelligence service. Employees ordered others to close the servers and disconnect from the network. However, it turned out that the door to the electrical room was locked. Someone had coded it. Workers looked at their computers and realized that this was the end. Hundreds of gigabytes of data were stolen from them. Meanwhile, Sue said goodbye to his viewers 
since he had already completed all the necessary plans for today, then Rose said that she did not even suspect that he was such a skilled hacker. Suddenly, the guy grabbed the girl's hand and pulled her towards him. He suggested that while he was free, they could do something more interesting. However, at that moment, he received a call distracting him from the girl. When he picked up the phone, the man on the other end said that he needed to come to the office urgently. Something important had happened. Soon, Sue arrived at his company office. His assistant told him that the 10th anniversary of the company's founding was coming up, and to celebrate, they invited the young star to perform for them. The singer's name was Jasper, and the contract with him had already been signed. However, he had just been told that he had cut his finger during filming and was hospitalized, so he invited Sue to the office to discuss if they could reschedule the celebration a couple of days. Sue was confused. Was he really hospitalized simply because he cut his finger? Then he showed a message that Jasper left on his social networks, in which he says that today during filming he injured himself, so he was left for examination. The guys looked at the phone in bewilderment. It seemed that the guy was sick with something incurable, but all that worried him was a scratch on his finger. Lee said that after the publication of this recording, he immediately contacted Jasper's agent, who told him that if they wanted the young man to perform with an injury, then an additional 20% would have to be added to the original fee for his performance. Sue grinned because he pays artists to work, not to dodge, and asked him to contact his agent and tell them to go to hell. He promised that he would find someone new, but Lee told him that if they just broke the contract with Star Entertainment's hottest artist, they would hold a grudge. However, Sue said that business is not friendship, it is only a matter of breaking the contract and replacing the person, and Star Company is not such a big problem. Lee then said that he would contact Jasper's agent, and Sue asked to bring her to his office to talk. Soon a middle-aged woman arrived at the office. It was Brittany, an agent of Star Entertainment. She was a little late, citing traffic jam. However, Lee said they should get down to business right away. The girl started with the topic of Jasper's performance being canceled due to his injury. However, Sue said that the woman misunderstood him, and after careful discussion, they came to the conclusion that Jasper's style was not quite suitable for their company, so they wanted to terminate his contract. The woman was perplexed. Are they really ready for this? She threatened Sue that there would be consequences for this decision. The young man only replied that they were not going to postpone their anniversary celebration because of the artist. Brittany then reminded them that Jasper was on good terms with their chairman. Sue thanked her for the reminder, but said that it would not affect his decision. The woman stood up, saying that in that case, Sue should have been asked to prepare the papers and deliver them. She was about to leave when the young man said that there was a misunderstanding between them. The woman thought to herself, how stubborn that guy was, wasn't he afraid of their company? She turned around, saying that she had no more time to talk about it, because she had business waiting for her. Sue continued, saying that the woman misunderstood him because they themselves announced the postponement of the performance, and although the Ching company did not demand compensation, the woman still blamed them for breaking contact. Was that fair? Then Brittany got angry, saying that she had learned a lot from this meeting. She said that the earth was round and they would definitely see each other somewhere else, and then left the office, loudly slamming the door. Lee said that she has a lot of influence in the star company, and the chairman of the company is on good terms with them, so they might have problems now. Then the guy said that if the chairman of Star Company, Travis, wants to criticize someone because of such a little thing, he will be at the same level for the rest of his life, and this time Sue does not intend to lose to anyone. Meanwhile, Brittany arrived at Jasper's room. The young man did not understand whether they were really breaking off contact, because in that case, he would have to return all the money. He wasn't going to just swallow the situation. He wanted to do something about it. The woman then suggested that he post a tweet, saying that it would tarnish the name of Ching's company and create a talking point for fans. The guy then kissed the woman tenderly, told her how gorgeous she was, and that he loved her very much. Brittany kissed him back, telling him they needed to take action first. However, Jasper said that he had already built up strength for the woman and quickly threw her onto the bed, pinning her with his body. Meanwhile, Sue flew into Sue's office and said that things were bad because the Star Company had posted a tweet again. 
The guy sitting in the company of Lucy and Rose noted that this time they were acting suspiciously, blaming his company, and it was disgusting. The girls were surprised, because as soon as this guy said a word, the fans also attacked the Ching company with accusations. Sue suggested that the president calm down and clarify everything, because if this continues, something terrible could happen. However, Sue said that they should not rush into this. If they want to play big, then he himself intends to play with them to the end. Then he decided to call someone. He introduced himself, saying that this was Sue from the Ching Company. The young man called Travis, the head of the Star Company. The man was sitting at the bar surrounded by girls. Then he asked why the guy was calling him. Sue then said that he was aware of what Jasper had done, so he didn't have to beat around the bush. He said that his artist had seriously damaged his reputation, and now it was time to rein him in. To this, Travis replied that he did not see a word against Sue's company in Jasper's tweet. Then the guy asked him if he was really planning something against him. Travis laughed, saying that such accusations require evidence. He said that these days, young people don't have time to grow up before they start talking a lot. He was sure that Sue can only ask for help, and if he needs it so much, then he, as a business veteran, will teach him a free lesson. Soon the conversation was over, and then Sue asked what Sue was going to do, but the guy just grinned, noting that Travis, being a businessman, was so fiercely protective of such a small artist, and it was strange. The guy started typing some code, obviously trying to find something that could explain the reason for such a fierce defense. Rose asked if he really wanted to hack Jasper and Brittany's phones and look for some confidential information there. He soon succeeded, and a very unusual picture opened before them in which Jasper and Brittany were doing something obscene. Everyone present was shocked they did not expect to see this. Moreover, Lucy noted that they had such a big age difference. How was this union even possible? However, Sue realized that Brittany's husband did not know her adventures, and this could be a catalyst. Meanwhile, Brittany's husband received a message on his phone. It said that Brittany had a surprise for him in Jasper's room. It said that he was much more capable than her husband, and if he didn't believe it, he could come and see for himself. The man immediately roared with rage, intending to immediately go to his wife and find out what was wrong. Lucy noted that this was a truly villainous act on Sue's part. However, the guy only said that he just lifted their spirits and helped them have a little fun. Soon, another curious picture opened up before the guys, completely answering the question of why Travis defended Jasper so fiercely. They found phone camera footage of the men kissing and then getting intimate. It turned out that Jasper also harassed several actresses. He continued to flirt with them even after explicit refusals, and Lucy was very outraged by this behavior. Then Sue asked what Sue was going to do. He said that such wonderful things should be on the internet, and he should share them with everyone and he could also attract the media who are on good terms with the company. So he asked Sue to immediately send reporters to Jasper's ward. Meanwhile, internet users were shocked when they saw the same video that exposed the artist's personal life. Meanwhile, Jasper himself was lying in his room hugging Brittany, saying that now Sue's company would have big problems, but they deserved it. Brittany immediately began to praise the young man, but this did not last long. Suddenly, the woman's husband burst into their room, with a bat in his hands and obvious rage on his face. The couple was shocked. Brittany didn't exactly expect to see her husband, Christian, here. The same man reached out to Justin, saying that he would kill him now. By that time, journalists had already arrived at his room and were filming everything that was happening. Christian shouted at his wife and her lover, not understanding how they could cuckold him. Meanwhile, Travis was still relaxing in the company of girls, when suddenly one of his subordinates approached him, saying that they had problems. He said that something terrible had happened, and he urgently needed to watch the news. When the man picked up the phone, he was shocked by what he saw. All the hot headlines were full of news that Jasper was in a loving relationship with Travis. He couldn't believe his eyes, screaming that someone was spreading rotten rumors about him. Then his subordinate said that the Ching Company's public relations department had just responded regarding the termination of the contract with Jasper. The public was unhappy and Travis did not know what to do, but at that moment he received a call. It was Sue. He said that he didn't expect so much news from him in such a short time since their last conversation. At this moment, Travis realized that Sue was to blame for everything, and he said that once he dealt with everything, he would not live. 
However, the guy said that this time he intends to speak directly. The man wondered why he did this to him over such a small thing. The young man said that people respect him, and he respects them ten times more, and he has already shown him enough respect. However, if people don't respect him, then he won't respect them. Travis wondered how this young guy could find out such things about him. Was he some kind of hacker? Sue said that times are changing, and this time a business newcomer will give him free advice. Travis realized that this would be the end of their conversation, but before he could say a word, Sue had already hung up. The man smashed his phone on the table out of anger. Meanwhile, night fell, and Emma informed the owner that the Star Company had sent a message that they were admitting tax evasion. They also write that they agree to the investigation, are ready to be punished, and will pay taxes first. However, she noted that they have no plans to apologize. Apparently, they suspect that the hacker who carried out the broadcast is an employee of the Ching Company. Otherwise, it would be impossible to explain why Star's internal systems were so easily hacked. She also said that discussions on this issue have flared up on the Internet. However, Sue replied that this was just a tactic by Star to survive. He said that he would personally deliver a big gift tomorrow and then headed to the shower. Then the girl flew towards him, hugged him from behind, saying that she also wanted it as a gift. Emma said that he had already given a gift to Lucy, Rose, and Sue, but left Emma without attention. Sue said that he was going to take a shower, but the girl said that she would go with him. She shouted for the owner to stop being shy and finally take off the towel. Meanwhile, the next day came, one of the director's subordinates, Edwin, approached him and said that he had news about the king of hackers. The man was surprised and looked at the boy with disbelief. Then he said that as a result of multi-factor investigation, they suspected a connection between Mr. Su from Ching Company and the King of Hackers. And without thinking twice, Edwin said that tomorrow morning they would head to Ching Company. This happened and soon the man met Su. He introduced himself, saying that he held the position of director, but for some reason this was still hidden from Su. Then the young man asked why the director paid him a visit. The man replied that he had come to talk about the King of Hackers. Sue said that he could ask him anything, and the man immediately decided to get down to business. He asked if the guy was the king of hackers. However, Sue pretended that he did not understand what he was talking about because he could not be such a person. Edwin said that they recently received information that Sue hired the king of hackers to get into their internal affairs. To this, the young man replied that there had recently been a conflict between the Ching and Star companies and he did not expect that they would put such a brand on him in order to put more pressure on him. However, Edwin did not understand if he was not the king of hackers and had nothing to do with him. Why did he even continue talking to him when he said that he wanted to talk about the king of hackers? Sue only replied that he agreed because the man looked like he wanted to talk to him no matter what. If he had refused and changed the subject, he would have thought in any case that Sue was spineless or was trying to hide something. He repeated that he was not the king of hackers and had nothing to do with him, thinking to himself that if he was found out, he would be in a lot of trouble, so instead it was better to just talk to the director to clear his doubts. Edwin noted that the guy did not repeat his rhetorical questions, did not look away, and his expression was quite honest. Then Sue, seeing doubt on his face, repeated once again that he had nothing to do with this. If the hacker really broke into Star's company, then Sue has no idea about his motives, Perhaps they are not helping him at all, and this is just a coincidence. Then Edwin apologized for offending the young man and said that now it was time for him to go. As Sue escorted the man out the door, Emma flew up to him, saying that she could imagine his face if he knew that the hacker king he was looking for was Sue. Suddenly, the girl approached the guy and kissed him on the cheek. At that moment, Sue came into the office. Emma cursed that this girl always barged in at the most inopportune moments, but Sue replied that they would have many more opportunities to be alone. The secretary asked if her boss was okay, but he just cleared his throat and said everything was fine. He asked her how things were going with the Star Company, and the girl replied that Travis was being criticized by everyone, and his actions were being discussed in national debates, so the fate of the Star Company was sealed. Sue understood that if the company fell then tens of thousands of people would be left without work, then he should just buy the company, because this would not only contribute to the prosperity of the recreation and cultural sector, but also reduce the burden associated with employment.
Meanwhile, people on the street were discussing a new tweet posted by Ching's company. Everyone noted that Mr. Su really cares about his employees, and they praised him as an admirable entrepreneur with a sense of social responsibility. Meanwhile, other companies were in real chaos. The managers understood that Su made such a statement, and it undermined the moral foundations, which is why the company completely abandons the conflict and in favor of the employees. Everyone understood that Star Company had brought itself to its death by offending Su, and the same could happen to others. So if other companies wanted to live long, then it was better for them not to mess with him. Meanwhile, Travis in his office was simply furious. He did not believe that the Ching Company wanted to buy him. Then his subordinate handed him the tablet, saying that he should take a look at it. When he saw the tweet, he swore, not understanding how the earth could bear such a shameless person, because it was because of him that the company found itself in such a situation, and now he is pretending to be a hero. Suddenly the man coughed and the secretary asked if he was okay. Then Travis said that he would never sell the company to this scoundrel, even if he had to declare bankruptcy today. At that moment the police came into the room. They said that the man was suspected of several criminal and administrative crimes, and they had evidence. The man was immediately handcuffed and taken away by the publications, while he thought that he now did not even have the opportunity to declare the company bankrupt. On the street, journalists asked him questions, but the man did not want to answer them. Meanwhile, Sue stood aside and watched as Travis was arrested. Then, when it was all over, he went back and called Lee and told him to complete the process of buying Star as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, people were wondering why the King of Hackers had not yet started broadcasting. Had he really been caught? They hoped that he would get in touch, but he was gone all day. Meanwhile, Edwin said that they will begin to act as soon as he goes on air. Meanwhile, Sue himself slept in bed with Emma. When he started to get out of bed, he woke up the girl and said that there was no longer any need to pretend to be asleep. Then Emma blushed, saying that she was embarrassed to talk to him now. However, she soon overcame her embarrassment and climbed on top of the guy, telling him that it was time for him to start streaming. Internet users were excited to see that the King of Hackers had finally come online. Sue thanked the Gifts for his support and said that before the start of the broadcast, he discovered something interesting in his personal messages, and now he was going to show it to everyone. One of the users said that the King of Hackers can only hack China's general defense systems, but can he break his beautiful country? And then Sue promised to demonstrate his skills to his international friend. Meanwhile, in the country of the person who left this message, there was real chaos. Their security system was attacked. They wanted to immediately stop copying data. But Sue dealt with everything faster than them. He said that he had already posted all the more or less important information on the forum and invited users to check it if they were interested. Users were shocked. Could he really get such confidential things? But the owners of the company were scared. They shouted for someone to immediately stop this hacker. Emma noted that in all her time communicating with Sue, this was the first time she had seen such an outrageous request. But the guy replied that when a challenge is thrown, there is no need to waste time. You just need to act. Suddenly, he received a message from Edwin. He said that on behalf of Hong Kong, he was inviting him to serve in his country. Sue was surprised. Did the director specifically find him for this? He said that when he came to his work, he pretended to catch him, thought about it a lot but he hid his identity. Then Emma asked what he would do now. The guy said he would politely refuse. After all, the best solution was to remain free and unrestricted. He soon sent his message, thanking Edwin for the offer, but said that he was forced to refuse. The man was perplexed whether this guy really wanted to be an ordinary streamer because there was nothing unusual in his broadcasts. Then his colleague said that the king of hackers blocked them and they would not be able to answer him. Edwin realized that he was not even giving him the opportunity to persuade him. Then he said that he should report what was happening and wait for an answer from above. International News said that the Internet God had once again shocked the whole world. Sue said not to be insulted with money because if he needs money, he can always take it from any bank in the world. People admired the stranger. They even wanted him to take them under his training. However, the young man said that if anyone needs the information he has, Everything will be in the public domain, while medicine and food are being sent to poor areas of the country as part of charity. 
Meanwhile, the system informed him of the completed task and rewarded him with divine hacking skills. Sue was very happy that he was able to complete his mission. Soon he said that all the information had been sent, thanked the viewers for their support, but then he added that today was his last broadcast. The audience was saddened by this because they did not want to say goodbye to the hacker. However, Sue said that he would donate all the money he received from viewers during the two broadcasts to charity, and if they were lucky, they could meet again one day. At this point, the stream was over. Then Emma immediately lay down on the table, saying that now that he had nothing left to do, they could continue what they started at night. However, the guy refused, saying that he needed a break. At that moment, Sue entered the office and said that something terrible had happened. Turning away from Emma, the guy asked if the secretary had any urgent papers. But Sue replied that the fact was that Rose's relatives had arrived here, and now they were quarreling downstairs. The girl said that there was no time to explain, and asked him to personally come down and take a look at what was going on there. When the guy came down, he immediately heard screams. The young man grabbed Rose by the hand, saying that she should immediately return with him, but the girl refused. Apparently, the man was her brother. Then he screamed, asking to show her this freak who stole his sister. Then Sue entered the room, and Rose's brother immediately changed his anger to mercy, greeting the man and saying that he was the eldest of the Rose family. He apologized for disturbing him, saying that his sister was just being a little mischievous. Sue extended his hand to him, saying that he was the very freak the guy was talking about. Then Rose's brother Zachary once again apologized for offending the young man and explained that his sister had grown up mischievous and not very obedient, and if she stayed here, she would only cause him trouble. Then Sue asked Rose to bring him some water, and she happily agreed, immediately bringing him a glass. Zachary was surprised, because for so much time living with his sister, she had never offered him a drink of water. Sue invited Zachary to sit on the sofa to make him more comfortable. Then the young man said that he needed to discuss something with her brother alone and asked her to go to another room, and the girl immediately left. Zachary wondered what happened to his sister since she had always been so naughty before. However, Sue hastened to say that he was not forcing anyone to do anything, and all this was the initiative of Rose herself. But the young man was still perplexed. He did not know that his sister could behave like this. Meanwhile, Rose ran into Sue and the secretary asked if Sue might be in trouble. However, Rose said that the young man is smart enough, and if the Ching company and her family have a good relationship, it will be more beneficial than harmful, so it's okay. Soon, Zachary and Sue went downstairs, and the guy said that he would soon fly away from here and asked him to behave well with Mr. Sue, and he, in turn, would hide her tricks from her father. The guy said goodbye to the president, saying that if he needed anything from their family, he could call them at any time. The next morning, Sue woke up in the company of Sue and Rose. He thought that today was another day for choosing a new identity, and then he called on the system to extract a new identity. The system informed him that his new identity was that of a villain. She said that in a world where there are protagonists and villains, Sue is the villain who will always be opposed, so his job was to find the protagonist, defeat him, and change the fate of the villain. Sue noted that being a prominent villain is interesting, and it will definitely add a bit of challenge to the task. However, he had a question. How could he find the so-called protagonist? Soon, a press conference of the Ching Company was held, at which Sue spoke. He was ready to answer questions that interested journalists. Then he gave the floor to one of them, and the man asked whether Sue planned to continue working on buying Star. Sue replied that the company would soon change its name to Ching Company, and then its main goal would be to create stars, since his business strives to create good movies and TV series that attract audiences and this would be a fundamental difference from what the company was before. The next journalist said that he had heard that Mr. Sue often had beautiful girls around him, and decided to ask what kind of relationship he was in with them. However, the young man replied that initially he asked not to ask questions not related to the Star Company. But the journalist insisted, suggesting that Mr. Sue was avoiding the issue because he was in an indecent relationship with these girls. However, Sue did not intend to tolerate this arrogant man and asked him to be taken out of the hall. The journalist was immediately grabbed by the arms and led away, despite all his screams and protests. Sue then apologized for the inconvenience and said that they could now continue with the conference. 
The journalist still had many questions about the Star Company, and the young man was happy to answer them. Meanwhile, the annoying journalist was thrown out of the building, and finally he said that he would return here. Grant then told him that he needed to leave his things behind before he left. Then he pulled the recorder out of the man's hand. After that, he threw the journalist aside, saying that now he can walk calmly. When the conference ended, Sue ordered Grant to find out why the same journalist had caused a stir. He wondered if he was looking for the main character while in the villain's identity, but so far he didn't have any leads. Then Sue said that if he had enemies who wanted to cause him problems, then their method with the journalist would quickly be revealed and the problem would be solved. Sue replied that regarding this provocation, he was inclined to think that it was a test on the part of the enemy. However, when talking about enemies, no one in particular came to his mind, after all. He was sincere with everyone, and one can say that he had no enemies at all, or maybe there were so many of them that it was completely impossible to remember them all. Grant suddenly returned to the office and told him that he had learned something new about the journalist. He handed him a tablet with information, saying that nevertheless they could not continue the investigation because they were being covered up. Then Sue asked if this business association really asked him to stop investigating, and then asked who their smoothie was. Grant said that this business association is very mysterious, and its head is even more so, few people know about him, but he has considerable power. He said that he can ask Anthony about this. A man should know a little about all this. When evening came, Sue came to Lucy's house. She was offended by him, because he had not spoken to her for a while. But the young man explained this by saying that he was busy buying the Star Company, and as soon as he finished, he immediately came to her. The young man went into the house where Anthony, Lucy's father, was already sitting. He asked why Sue came, and then he said that he came to ask him about something important. He asked if the man knew anything about the business association, and Anthony was immediately surprised. He was wondering why the young man was asking this, and when he said that he had a little problem, it made the man shocked. Did he really dare to offend the business association? However, the young man asked to calm down, saying that he had not offended them. Rather, on the contrary, it was they who caused Bedlam at his press conference. Anthony said that if it really was an association, then they would have problems. He also said that he first heard about it five years ago when they went to more than ten cities in the province, and many not outstanding businesses ended up being part of this association. In other words... For many years, this small town hid influential individuals and entrepreneurs, but Anthony advised not to dwell on this and said that later he could go to someone who could solve his problem. Sue asked if the man knew anyone from this association. Anthony replied with a smile that after so many years of work, he had many different connections. Soon, Sue and Anthony arrived at the house of the head of the Titian Association, who was also part of the business association that put a spoke in the young man's wheels. The man said that today was the birthday of Julia, the wife of Felix, the head of the company. He recently called him and said that they were coming, and now they needed to make a good impression and try to clear up the whole situation. Soon the door opened and a young man appeared in front of them. He asked if they knew each other. The man replied that now absolutely everyone knows the director of the Ching Company. The young man led them inside. Apparently his name was Keith, and Anthony asked what was taking him so long to open the door. The man explained that this is the son-in-law who will have to marry the second Miss Liu. He was abroad and recently returned. He was promised as the second Miss Liu, and he lives off their family's wealth, so he is not liked. So he asked Sue to ignore him. Soon the men entered the living room, where a sufficient number of people had already gathered, and suddenly Sue noticed a woman sitting next to Keith. He recognized her as his college teacher, Camille. Soon the Leo family came out to greet the guests. Anthony introduced his companion to them and said that this was the director of the Ching Company, Sue. The woman was surprised to learn that this was the same popular owner of the company that everyone knew about, even those who knew nothing about business. The young man only noted that the couple were very kind and also added that he had a small gift from him for the woman. Aunt Liu was embarrassed, saying that she was a little embarrassed. Then her daughter asked to open the gift and take a look, because everyone was interested in what Mr. Sue gave her. The young man scratched his head in embarrassment, saying that there was nothing special there, but since everyone wants to see what's inside, the woman can show him. 
When Auntie opened the box, she saw a beautiful jade bracelet inside. She immediately hugged him to her, thinking that Mr. Sue really showed promise, unlike that parasite Keith, and she would like him to become her son-in-law instead. Then she would even wake up with a smile on her face. Then everyone looked at Keith, saying that even Sue had brought a gift for Mom's birthday and asked if they had prepared anything. However, the young man did not answer and only continued to drink the drink from his glass. The woman looked at him with displeasure, but said that she did not expect a gift from him, adding that he had better quickly find a decent job and stop relying on them giving him shelter and food. She continued to set an example for Sue, saying that he had a graceful appearance, a reserved character, and an excellent education, making him an ideal son-in-law in her eyes. Then Sue wondered if this was the same main character he was looking for. The whole family was shocked because Keith continued to remain silent. The birthday girl's daughter replied that she did not think that the young man would give anything valuable, but he could give at least something to express sincere feelings. Sue looked at all this and thought only that he wished they would stop involving him in this. Then the head of the house, Mr. Liu, shouted for everyone to shut up. He said that there was no point in throwing a show in front of his uncle just because Keith didn't bring a gift. Then Keith finally asked why everyone thought he didn't bring anything. He stood up and presented his mother-in-law with a gift. It was a pendant. He said that it should be as good as the jade bracelet that Sue gave her. The young man remained calm, but inside he was thinking about why this guy turned to him because he himself did not touch him. He also thought that, judging by his history and demeanor, Keith's traits were very similar to the protagonist he was looking for. In this case, he will find an opportunity to look at Keith's memories to make sure of this. Liu's family wondered how a foreign worker had so much money to give such an expensive pendant, and then the woman's daughter suggested that it might just be a fake. The rest of the guests agreed with her. They also did not understand how Keith only found the money for real jade. Then the woman threw a box with a gift to her son-in-law, asking what he was up to. Keith deftly caught the box, saying that it was not a fake at all. His fiancée immediately besieged him, asking him to stop, but the guy continued to claim that the jewelry was real. Then Sue entered the conversation. He said that he knew a little about Jade and could resolve the dispute. Then he touched Keith's shoulder, asking if he would let him look at the pendant. At that moment, he read his memoirs, in which Keith asks his subordinate whether Sue really bought the Star Company and imprisoned his uncle. He said that to become famous in the entertainment industry, one must be willing to pay a high price for it. But Sue was different after he bought out the Star Company. He began to act like a righteous man and take everything for himself. He ruined his impeccable reputation. He sent a subordinate to contact Business News and asked them to send someone to his presentation. The unsuspecting Keith carefully removed his hand from his shoulder, saying that he hoped that Mr. Sue was not mistaken. He handed him the box, thinking at the time that he didn't expect Keith to be the president of the business association. And what was even more unexpected for him was that what happened at the last conference was also his doing. All this was because of his uncle Travis. Moreover, he was dealing with something related to illegal, criminal, immoral activities in the company star. Thus, considering all this, Sue's urge to complete the task completely disappeared. The guests were already waiting for an answer. They were wondering whether the ring was real or a fake. Then he pulled out the decoration and said that you can't bring a fake one to your aunt's birthday because it's wrong. Keith told him that he didn't even know what he was talking about and wondered how this idiot couldn't even tell the difference between a real jade pendant and a fake one. Then the guy said that if an ordinary person can break it, then how can he say that it is not a fake? But Keith continued to stand his ground, saying that this was real ancient jade. At this moment, Sue clenched the jewelry in his fist, and it cracked into pieces. The young man looked in surprise at the broken pendant, not understanding how this was even possible. Sue thought that it was true that an ordinary person could not break real jade, but he was the king of killers, and with his abilities, breaking ancient jade was not a problem at all. He said that if it had been a real piece of jewelry, he would never have broken it. Then Keith screamed, wishing the guy dead. At this moment, Aunt Lou slapped him. She said that he had completely disgraced her, and now he should pack his things and get out of here. Keith thought that he had underestimated his opponent, because he could break the jade ring with his hands. Seeing all this, Camilla began to cry, saying that Keith had really let her down. 
She ran out of the house and Sue followed her, intending to calm her down. Then Camilla's father shouted at Keith, telling him to immediately go get his wife. The man apologized to Anthony for having to look at this whole picture, but the man said that there was nothing wrong with it. Meanwhile, Sue caught up with his teacher and asked if she was okay. The girl cried, saying that Keith obviously doesn't have the opportunity, but he continues to pretend to be someone unknown, and the whole family makes fun of her because of this. At this time, Keith himself approached his wife and shouted at Sue, telling him to leave her alone. The young man explained that he was just comforting his teacher, but he was against it. He approached Camilla and said that it was indeed real Jade, and Sue broke it on purpose to laugh at him. Then Sue turned to Camilla, saying that he had been her student for two whole years. Could he really lie to her? The woman continued to cry, talking about how her husband had failed her, and even now he continues to lie despite his deception being exposed. Then she got up and walked away from him, despite all Keith's persuasion to stay. Sue took the man by the shoulder, saying that if he followed her now, she would become even more angry. However, the guy shook his hand off his shoulder, but for Sue this was enough, he learned that Keith was the illegitimate son of his father, Kevin. His father once went through a lot to find him, hoping that he would return to his family. However, Keith refused him in a very rude manner. Then Kevin told him that if he left home, he would no longer be his son. Sue was suddenly interrupted from his thoughts by a voice. Anthony approached him, saying that he saw what was going on today, so he didn't feel comfortable asking him, but he wanted him to find out about the details of the business association next time through meeting the Leo family. Then the young man agreed, and they decided that it was time for them to return home. At this time, Sue said that it was better for him to take a walk alone, and when he was quite a distance away from the man, he called his assistants and asked them to find out Kevin's phone number so that he could ask him to rein in his naughty son. Meanwhile, Keith did not give up trying to catch up with his wife. He said that the jade was real. He still had a fragment from the jewelry, and if she did not believe it, she could take it to an expert so that he could prove to her that it was indeed a real stone. However, Camilla said that the authenticity of the jade no longer matters. She wanted to give him a chance, but today's action made her very disappointed, and now she wants to divorce him. Keith couldn't believe his ears. Then Camilla continued, she said that he is an adult man, and yet he sits at home all day doing housework and does not even try to look for work. She said she doesn't expect him to be a huge success, but she just wishes her husband would be more ambitious. Then Keith gently touched her cheek, saying that he wouldn't spend the night at home today, but tomorrow he would show her something interesting. When he left his wife, he called his subordinate, saying that he wanted Ching Company to go bankrupt within three days. After all, if this Sue dared to behave so arrogantly towards him, he would show him what happens to his offenders. Meanwhile, Kevin was minding his own business and was distracted by a phone call. When he answered the phone, the man on the other end introduced himself as Sue, the head of the Ching Company. He asked if Keith was his son. Then the man shouted, saying that he was not his son, because a man who does not show respect to his family and makes them laugh throughout the city does not deserve to be called his son. However, Sue asked the man to calm down, because if his son did not listen to him, then he needed to be taught a lesson. Kevin asked if Sue had sharpened his teeth, because in this case he was making a huge mistake, because although he did not recognize him as his son, he would not conspire with others to harm him. Then Sue explained that the man misunderstood him. He just wants to save his family. Moreover, the experience of a fortune teller tells him that if he wants to deceive someone, then first he needs to say something interesting. He said that if it were him, so as not to involve the family in this, he would quickly announce to the public that he would renounce anything to do with Keith. After that, the young man hung up and quickly added Kevin to the blacklist, so that he would not have time to call him back. Emma asked why he did this, to which Sue replied that now Kevin would be both concerned and worried, and that was exactly what he wanted. He said that even if it weren't for Kevin's family, he could still defeat Keith, but it wouldn't be fun because he wants Kevin to finally experience despair. Soon, Sue received a call from his assistant saying that something was wrong. He said that several companies have just taken up arms against him at the same time. Some are demanding payment, while others are clinging to little things and threatening to stop cooperating. Many are buying their shares on the stock exchange. Sue realized that Kevin quickly came to his senses. Apparently, 
The power of this business association should not be underestimated. However, he hastened to reassure Lee and said that he did not need to panic and let everyone else do what they wanted. He added that in order for them not to rake in, they would have to give several times more. Apparently, Kevin did not want to fall on his face, so Sue decided to publish an anonymous leak, deciding that this time he would not do as he wanted. Soon his leak was published and comments began to gather under it. Emma noted that the post is quickly becoming popular. As expected, anything related to the King of Hackers quickly attracts attention. Sue then decided to delete all his posts so he would make the discussion even more lively. Users wondered if all the posts had been deleted. They didn't understand what the point was and why they needed to make these posts if he eventually deleted them anyway. Was it really a protest? Emma realized that by using the power of netizens, they could attract the attention of official organizations to the business association. They decided that they needed to push them to investigate their activities, and this was a brilliant decision on Sue's part. The young man relaxed, sitting in his chair, saying that in their country, unofficial organizations are very dangerous and are subject to severe repression by the authorities. He may not have as much power now as business associations as official organizations, but they certainly have enough. Emma noted that it was a great decision to use government power to destroy this association. Meanwhile, heated discussions were taking place in the meeting room of the police station. The employees did not understand where exactly this business association came from. Colleagues told their director Edwin that it was founded seven years ago. It includes the most famous enterprises of the city and nearby cities and provinces. He was also informed that President Keith was born into a wealthy family in the capital, once worked abroad as a mercenary, and now became the head of an overseas recruitment company. Out of anger, Edwin slammed his fist on the table, angry that Keith wants to create another such company and secretly run a large business. Is he really planning a rebellion? He ordered a thorough examination of all members of the business association. Any illegal actions by members of this company must be documented. The man thought about the fact that this time it doesn't matter whether the King of Hackers is part of the business association or not. What matters is what really interests her. He said that it was necessary to constantly monitor its members, and when they finished finding out information about them, all the problems with the hacker would also be settled. Meanwhile, Kevin was thinking that he really didn't expect Keith to be the president of the business association. His assistant said that today's incident would definitely attract the attention of official organizations and the association. Apparently, it would end, just like its master. Then Kevin shouted that Sue was right, and if he didn't want to get his family involved in this, then he needed to clear things up with Keith as quickly as possible. He began to think that if the authorities suspected that their family was secretly supporting Keith while settling matters with the business association, then they might have problems. Then he ordered his assistant to immediately go to the city. Meanwhile, morning came and Sue woke up in the same bed with Emma. Suddenly he received a call. It was Keith who said that if before 9 a.m. he came and knelt at the door of the Leo family's villa, begging him, then he would consider letting his Ching organization continue to exist. After that, he immediately hung up the phone, thinking that Ching Company had long been a leading enterprise in the city, and it seemed that this had blinded its owner so much that he was lost. Now, however, Keith was going to help him see things more clearly. Sue wondered how he could talk such nonsense since the morning, apparently. He really had problems with his head. The guy got out of bed, starting to get dressed, and Emma asked where he was going. Then the guy told her that he needed to go on business. Emma said that she would go with him, and then Sue told her to get ready. Soon, a huge pile of cars gathered near the Leo family's villa. The owner of the house did not understand what was happening here. Then Keith got out of the car. He was dressed in an expensive suit, which greatly surprised all members of his bride's family. Everyone was surprised how this guy managed to become such a big deal in such a short time. Apparently, he forced several business tycoons to give him a field of activity, Mr. Liu reflected that most of those who joined his side were members of a business association. Then Keith approached his wife Camilla and said that since she loved successful men, he would show her his true self. However, before he could finish speaking, another crashed into one of his cars. Sue came out next, saying that some people here lack education, since he parks right in the middle of the road. Keith just grinned, thinking that finally the one who would beg him for mercy had arrived. 
Sue then told someone to move the car off the road, and at that moment something unexpected happened. Dump trucks immediately arrived on the road and scooped up the cars like scrap metal. Keith said that Sue was completely crazy. How could he act so self-confident? The young man just grinned. Did this guy really think that he just found a couple of valuable pieces of paper and became invulnerable? Keith told him that he still didn't seem to understand who he was provoking. He said that he was the chairman of a business association, and all he had to do to destroy Sue was wave his hand. The Leo family members couldn't believe their ears. Then Camila realized that this was exactly what her husband meant when he said that he would show her something interesting. He turned to his relatives, thinking that they looked down on him. But now he will not pretend. He will show everyone that he is a big shot. He turned to Sue, saying that there were five minutes left until 9 a.m. and everything he said on the phone remained valid. He said that if he came by 9 and begged for his life, he would allow his company to continue to exist. Then Camilla asked him to be generous and not go that far, because Sue was her student. However, her mother stopped her, saying that a husband does not need a wife who tells him what to do, and told her to better remain silent. Then Keith threatened Sue, without seeing any reaction from him. He said that if he did not kneel, he would do everything to ensure that the Ching Company closed down. Then Sue offered his own version of the development of events. He said that Keith could come to him and kneel before him, and then he would share some information with him. The young man could not show it to his ears, but he understood that apparently Sue would not give up until he saw his own grave in front of him. The guy just grinned, saying that if he sees someone's grave, it will belong to Keith. The man could not believe that this guy was capable of such impudence. Soon a whole squad of police arrived at the scene. The Leo family didn't understand what was happening here. Then the police shouted that all members of the business association were surrounded. They told them not to try to resist and lie down on the ground. Otherwise, measures would be taken against them. Keith immediately realized that this was the work of Sue, to which the guy only smiled sweetly. He shouted to the police that he, the chairman of the Ching Company, was here, and they had the green light to go and arrest them right now. He said that he had cleared the road, and everything inside was also clean, and the members of the association had no possession weapons for yourself. Soon all those involved were arrested. They threatened that the police would have problems if they were not released immediately. Then Marcus, the director of the city's police department, approached the scene and, having heard all the words, promised that he would definitely look at all the outstanding abilities of the association members when they arrived at the station. The men also began to apologize, saying that this was just some kind of misunderstanding because they had always been law-abiding entrepreneurs. Then Marcus asked them to explain how they could explain the brutal demolition a couple of years ago that left several people injured. Suddenly, Keith joined the conversation. He asked what service they were from and demanded that the chief be brought to him. Then Marcus replied that they were from the city police, and Keith's case had been transferred to specialists. Soon, the man was charged with threatening national security and forced to drive through the area, all of which was watched by the Liu family. Sue praised Keith, saying that he put on a great show because committing such a large-scale crime could also be considered a success. The guy was beside himself with rage and immediately rushed at Sue, intending to beat him up. He pushed aside all the men who stood in front of him. Keith was about to swing his fist at the young man when someone suddenly dodged the attack. A moment later, a blow flew at Keith. It was Amanda. She said that if he wants to harm her boss, then first he needs to deal with her. The guards soon stopped the fight by pointing their guns and ordering him to put his hands up. Sue said that he is no longer afraid of death because he always has a bodyguard with him. Then Keith shouted that he was the heir of the family and no one would dare arrest him. However, the butler from his family who arrived at the scene said that such a person had no place in their family. He added that this man was lying because his master had long ago severed all ties with him. Then Keith fell to his knees and began to beg the butler to help him. He hoped that his father had sent him to save him from imprisonment. However, the man pulled his hand away and said that he did not deserve to have the same last name as them. Keith couldn't believe his ears. Was this really happening? He said that all his words were spoken solely out of anger. He begged the butler to return him to his family in order to personally apologize to his father, realizing that his family was the only hope, otherwise he would be finished. 
But the man only said that now the point is not whether he will return home or not, but that the gentleman himself cuts off all ties with him. He said that the family will never accept such an asshole who breaks the law and commits crimes. Soon, Keith was handcuffed, and Sue said that prison is not another planet, and henceforth advised the young man not to be so arrogant, otherwise it might end too badly. Keith, in response, also asked him to stop being so arrogant, because even though he lost power in China, his people abroad will not just leave it like that, they will definitely take revenge on him. Sue asked if he meant the Overseas Mercenary Company, and then added that they were destroyed by artillery half an hour ago. Keith couldn't believe his ears, but Sue handed him the phone, which contained all the evidence. The video showed how all of Keith's men were routed by the artillery attack. Then Sue decided to finally introduce himself, calling himself Satan, the king of mercenaries, and said that he was glad to meet him in this way. Keith wondered if he really was the legendary mercenary king. He understood that if Sue himself revealed his identity to him, then he is not afraid that he will report it to the authorities, and if he does this, he will only end up making you a laughing stock. He then admitted that Sue had won this time. At this point, the guy's task was completed. He also received a reward, the super ability to imitate. He wondered if such power allowed villains to annoy people, but it could also make him an easy target. At this moment, Aunt Lou turned to him. She said that they had been standing outside for a very long time and must have wanted to go inside and drink something warm. However, her husband stopped her, saying that she had already disgraced her home enough. He apologized for his wife and told Sue not to take her words to heart. However, in any case, the young man was forced to abandon the gatherings, saying that he had important things to do. Then the woman turned to her daughter, asking what she thought of Sue, because he was a talented, promising young man. Camilla only replied that she had not even gotten divorced yet. Moreover, Sue was her student and had a girlfriend. She said that she would not fight for a man with her student, which greatly upset her mother. The woman turned to Mr. Liu, saying that they would be a great couple, but the man said that with a mother like her, the girl would definitely not be happy. Meanwhile, Sue returned to his car, where Emma was already waiting for him. She said that everything was resolved before she had to intervene, and she wanted to have fun so much. Sue then said that they could not resist, because the police had already arrived at the scene. The girl pouted, saying that she just wanted to have some fun. Soon the guy received a call from Mr. Lee, who said that his boss had done a great job. The man added that companies that had previously made significant investments returned them and even doubled their shares, which meant that Ching's company would soon begin to lead. Sue congratulated him on his excellent work and said that he would try to announce the next tasks soon, but for now they should continue working. The guy thought that this was a fairly quick task, and there were still a few free days left before the new identity. He looked at Emma, thinking about how to spend his weekend. Sue realized that if he asked the girl for advice, she would offer him the only option. And he already knew what her idea meant. Meanwhile, an influential family had a dinner. One of the men was unhappy that all the businesses of the association had surprisingly become part of his company. The woman was outraged that he also took away Star's company without leaving them a crumb. However, another man urged them to calm down, saying that Ching was already a powerful company, and after they also took away the business association, they became even more powerful. Another man asked who could now decide to challenge the Ching because it would be suicide. His interlocutor explained that it is better for them to maintain good relations with Su than rival ones. And now that his company was in the lead, they had no other choice for their company to survive. Meanwhile, the weekend ended and Sue asked the program to extract a new identity. The system reported that the young man was now an alien defector. Thirty years ago, he rebelled against his marshal but failed, and after his defeat, he escaped and took refuge on Earth, hiding the fact that he was a starship pilot. Thirty years ago, there was an uprising on Planet R. The Jade Dragon Legion, to which the hero belonged, was one of the rebel factions. As a result, the uprising was suppressed, and the Marshal of the Jade Dragon Legion was executed, Sue hastily fled the planet and was subsequently put on the wanted list by the entire universe. Now that Planet R is once again engulfed in the flames of war as warlords vie for power, Sue's subordinates have located him at galactic coordinates and have called upon him to return and lead them in the ongoing struggle for ideals. Now the guy had to return to Planet R, 
put an end to the chaos of the Civil War and create a united nation, there was no time limit for this task. Sue noted that this was a truly explosive personality. Had he really become so terrible that even planet Earth itself couldn't stand him anymore?